so good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here, and welcome uh, to everyone who's, who's in person and those of us who are joining on the GSAP uh, YouTube channel. My name is Hiba Barker, and I'm, I'm an associate professor in the urban planning program here uh, and at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. I'm also the director of the Post Complex Cities Lab that has been putting some, uh, some of these events um, uh, together. Uh, First, I'm grateful for everyone who accepted our invitation on a relatively short notice uh, to share their experiences and knowledge and to be with, here, um, with us here today. Today's conference serves as a rapid response, basically, to the migrant crisis, crisis implications that is unfolding in New York City. It brings together a diverse array of academics, experts, activists, uh, urban stakeholders, act, uh, and individuals with personal experiences and knowledge to help us better understand the obstacles as well as the resources and the communities that are, are available for migrants arriving in New York City. The conference will particularly focus, because you know this is a big topic, but we're gonna particularly focus on the issues of the built environment and the experiences and rights of immigrants to shelter and housing uh, and, how, and claiming space in, in the city, the right to the city. Uh, coming together as scholars, activists, community organizers is also important, given how the right to shelter uh, that is New York is famous for the mandate is actually also under attack. The right to shelter in the context of New York City refers to the legal obligation of the city, and I think some of our uh, guests will speak to this today, in the context of New York City refers to the legal obligation of the city to provide temporary shelter for individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness. This concept is based on the understanding that access to shelter is a fundamental human right, especially in locations with harsh weather conditions like New York. Around 100, 118,000 uh, new immigrants have arrived in New York City, it's estimated, uh, since, since April 2022, which according to the city has strained its resources and caused crowding in homeless shelters that are already at capacity. Uh, and, folk, and many people eventually have been sleeping in the streets, only if you're gonna, for example, you can see close to, in Harlem, close to, close to uh, campus on 116 and Frederick Douglass, uh, the people who are, have, to be, have to live on the streets. Mayor Adams said the city has already spent around $1 billion to handle the migrant crisis and that the city does not have additional resources to handle the income influx of people that are forced to compete with the unhoused population for beds in homeless shelters. It is a crisis in quotation, in parentheses, for many reasons. One of them is the lack of support from the federal government that says it doesn't have enough resources to help the unhoused in general, whether homeless populations or immigrants fleeing hardships in other, in, from their countries. However, and I have to say that the federal government has allocated $858 billion to spend on the military and defense for 2023 alone to fund wars, wars in the Middle East, Latin America, and the African continent and elsewhere in the world. Of course, we cannot talk about this without the background that we're, we're, there's something that's happening in the world. So as we watch uh, thousands of immigrants and asylum seekers sleeping on the streets of New York City looking for shelter, we are also watching on our screens 5,000 miles away from us, 2.5 million people in Gaza, 70% of them are refugees on their own land and have been under attack by Israel, funded by our federal tax money, which managed to allocate $14.3 billion in emergency funds, uh, plus the 3.8 annual million of dollars that goes to uh, the Israel defense, which have helped create millions of refugees at the other end of the world in what many scholars are describing as a genocide as, as a response to the October 7th uh, cruel attacks. So 1.5 million who are already refugees are on the move again, looking for a safe space from shelters and bombs. And we have thousands and thousands here also looking for safe space and shelter away from uh, violence. So while we're talking about New York City, these conversations are important global conversations as the United, State, uh, United Nations estimates that there are about 118 million people forcibly displaced uh, in the world right now. Our day will be divided into three panels. We will start with a panel on the urban history of immigrant, the immigration crisis in New York City. We're followed by lunch. Panel two will focus on the formal and informal systems of support and care that immigrants depend on to make life in the city. On the last panel, we will focus on the housing question and the right to shelter. All panels will be moderated by the very capable masters and doctor students from the urban planning program and the Institute for the Study of Human Rights here at Columbia. At noon, we'll, around afternoon, I guess, uh, a bit afternoon, we, uh, we will break for lunch. During the lunch break here, the post-conflict city lab is co-hosting a second teach-in on what is settler colonialism, where speakers trace the entanglements between indigenous dispossession, regimes of US surveillance technologies, and Israelis' designs and use of drones connecting to siege to Gaza 
to the globalized warfare. It's happening in the same building on the, on the fifth floor when our uh, lunch break is happening here. I want to thank the many sponsors that have made this uh, event on the migrant uh, crisis possible today. I want to thank the, uh, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center for the Humanities, Institute for the Study of Human Rights, Institute of Latin American Studies, Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, and the Post-Conflict Cities Lab. I also want to thank my colleague Hugo Serimento for helping co-organize this event, and thanks to Kendra Sykes, Stefan Bodicard uh, from GSAP Events, and Chris Day from AV to, that ha who are helping with this setup, and for everyone who is involved in some way. Uh, this event would not have been possible without the dream team of students, amazing team. I've been with the pleasure and privilege to work with, with for the past month. Thank you in alphabetical order to Maria Amaya Morfin, Atsede Asaigan, Edalia Gonzalez, Joe Hanikens, Claire Kinan Kurgan, Naya Deng, Maya Kmal, Elizabeth Milagores Alvarez, Daniela Pelcheres Ogas, Mauricio Rada Orellana, Pedro, Pedro Ramos, Saumil Sangavi, Samantha Sauna Sarabia, Mandy Taylor, and Ki Sangi. Special thanks to my amazing research assistant, Maryam Mahmoud, and thank you, Maryam, for juggling with me all these events that we're putting together. I hope you enjoy your day with us. Please grab um, a coffee if you need more outside, and we'll start with our first panel that's uh, uh, moderated by Ki Sang and Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to um, ask each of our panelists um, in panel one on the urban history of er immigrant crises in New York City um, to introduce themselves. Um, yeah. I'll start. Hi, I'm Nara Milanish. I'm a historian at Barnard just across the street. Um, I focus on Latin American history. I'm actually not a historian of migration. I always feel like I have to say that. Um, I uh, became interested in these topics. In, I mean, I have a longstanding interest, but um, in 2016, I had the opportunity to spend a week in the largest ICE detention facility in the country in South Texas. Um, and I subsequently went back many times, including with students. Um, and out of that experience grew an oral history project with Central American migrants. Um, I've also been involved in some of the local uh, organizing activities um, in New York City regarding um, uh, the recent uh, migrant newcomers, and, uh, but my focus is really on Latin America, so I'm deferring here to my colleagues in U.S. history, um, and I guess I don't have to pass the microphone. Hi, Ron. I'm A.K. Sandoval Strauss. I'm the director of Latina and Latino Studies at Penn State University, uh, but also Columbia College class of 1992, so thank you for uh, coming and having me back here. Uh, I'm a historian of uh, Latinos in the United States, of immigration, uh, and the author of a book that I'll be saying more about, um, the subtitle of which tells the whole story, but I'll leave that for the talk and turn it over to Dr. Flores. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Flores. Uh, I've just gotten over laryngitis, so I'm a little bit um, quiet, uh, but I'm an associate professor of history at SUNY Stony Brook. I teach uh, modern America, labor history, immigration, and food history. Hi everyone, my name is Nermeen Arastu. I am an associate professor at the CUNY School of Law, where I co-direct the Immigrant and Non-Citizen Rights Clinic. Um, there, together with my students, we represent immigrants in all postures of the system, affirmatively applying for asylum, trying to come through our southern border, those detained, those in deportation proceedings, as some examples. We represent people from all over the world. Our express focus in our clinic is really to focus on the most marginalized of the most marginalized. So most recently, we focused on the experience of black migrants who are coming through the southern border. Um, youth in Long Island who are subject to pretextual gang allegations, um, Muslim immigrants and those who are perceived to be Muslim who are subject to post 9-11 civil liberties issues, and we are just wrapping up a long project looking at the experiences of disabled immigrants and their due process rights. Um, and I've been there about 10 years and I'm really excited to be on this very cross-disciplinary panel. Hi. Hi. Uh, good. Uh, morning, my name is Cynthia Santos. I am from Mexico. I am an adjunct faculty at CUNY, uh, journalism school, but I work uh, in the intersection of migration, art, and community organizing. Thank you. Um, just a quick note, as some of our speakers have already alluded to, um, 
we will be using different vocabularies and we understand and recognize that there are several different populations and different experiences being um, represented today. Um, for the two of us, Elizabeth and I, will mostly be um, using the term migrant as an umbrella term to refer to all these different types of um, newcomers into the city, but we do want to recognize that there are different experiences, uh, different reasons for coming to the city, um, that there are uh, people for whom this is not the first time they are moving or being displaced, uh, so we just want to um, put that out there, and without further ado, Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I'll skip all of that stuff so that we can not uh, spend too much time. This is a conference on uh, migrant newcomers to New York City, but I actually want to start talking um, about the U.S.-Mexico border because the border is 2,000 miles away from where we are sitting in this room, but it runs through the downtown, you know, heart of Manhattan, where many thousands of people, of course, are living, and of course it runs through Queens and the Bronx and Brooklyn, et cetera. Um, we have uh, migrant newcomers it, it's dispersed all over the city. Um, <clears throat> So I want to start with the, with the border because um, we have the best statistics and best information about the border. And we, as far as I know, and I would be interested to know if other people in the conference uh, know otherwise, um, as far as I can tell, there are very bad statistics for what is happening in New York City right now, who is here, who is coming, how many people, et cetera. Uh, so I think the best we can do is uh, at least to start at the southern border. So in recent years, um, we have heard this story of migrants uh, crossing the border, which seems to recur periodically in the papers, right? Takes over the headlines, crisis, surge. In fact, this conference is directed at interrogating that whole framing, right? And then all of a sudden it disappears again. Then we don't hear about it for months, and then one day it reappears, right? Um, it is frankly extraordinarily difficult, even for people who are really interested in these topics and know a lot about them, it's really difficult to follow what's going on month to month, even week to week, right? Um, and so I think it's really helpful to view patterns of who is crossing the border in a longer term historical perspective. History gives us a framework really to contextualize the present. And I think that's especially useful for an issue like this that seems to be in constant flux. So I want to start with a graph that does just that. And I'm so not a social scientist, but it's kind of fun to every once in a while show a graph. Here is a graph that shows us US Border Patrol apprehensions, which is to say people who are having encounters with Border Patrol from 1947 to almost the present, OK? So we get in a longer term perspective these blue bars that show us how many people are cro essentially crossing the border, right? So if we look at, we have been hearing about a border crisis since about, let's say, in the most recent cycle, since about 2014, right? Um, here we can see the la this last decade in relation to this much longer history, right? It's this little tail end. Well, if we look at the, that last decade, um, we can see that, in fact, the volume of people crossing the border is smaller by, and I am, again, not a social scientist, but I would say orders of magnitude um, from an earlier period in, say, the 80s, 90s, even early 2000s, right? So this is the graph I want to start with, and I, and I like to often start with this graph to contextualize the last 10 years. And with this graph in mind, I want to argue that the story of migration in the past 10 years is not a story of how many. It is a story about who. Who is arriving? And the who has changed in ways that lends itself, I think, to this whole framing of crisis. Now, you will notice, I should also say, that there is clearly an uptick um, in the last year. And if we had a bar for 2022, it would likewise be high. Um, and I am happy to talk about, I'll, I'll mention it very briefly, um, and I'm happy to talk about it in the Q&A, um, sort of the post-pandemic story. And I, will, and I will talk about it uh, very briefly at the end. But I want to talk about instead how instead of how many, which is always the framing of this issue, I want to talk about the who. So what do I mean by who? Well, we might assume this is the US-Mexico border, so isn't it primarily Mexicans, uh, Mexican nationals that are crossing? And historically, that would be a correct assumption. Um, but this has changed relatively recently. In the last decade or so, so the numbers of people crossing who are Mexican uh, citizens has decreased. 
Um, in fact, in 2019, the numbers of Mexicans leaving the United States um, exceeded those seeking to enter. Um, at the same time, over the last decade, we have witnessed an increase in the proportion of Central Americans who are arriving, and specifically Central Americans from three countries, the so-called Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. So we get a shift from Mexico to Central America. And second, we have a shift in terms of the demographic profile of who is coming. Historically, it was adult men who, um, primarily young labor migrants, who were crossing the border seeking work. In recent years, we've seen an increase in the numbers of families and children, right? Many of whom are seeking asylum. That word that we, or that phrase, asylum seekers, that we're constantly hearing now, like where did that come from? That's where it's coming from, right? So we have this different profile of people who are coming under a dis distinct legal guise, right? We're trying to. There's also a gender element to this shift. Um, women and girls account for a larger share of crossers today than they did historically. So to summarize, the story of the past 10 years is not a story of some unprecedented surge in numbers. It's a story about this shift from young adult Mexican men labor migrants to Central American families and children who are asylum seekers. Here's a graph. This is only the second one I'm going to show that shows us the uptick in unaccompanied children um, and children with families. So this doesn't, I could show you graphs of how many families, which would be slightly different, but it would show this, essentially this, uh, this similar um, pattern, which is that it starts low and then starts to, we have a surge in 2014, which is when we started hearing about children at the border, and there have been um, various spikes since then. Um, so these are the families that we have heard so much about in the news. Um, I'm not going to talk about why they're coming. Um, uh, let's see. I want to suggest that, and I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, I want to suggest that, um, that this explains the crisis framing, that we have certain ideas about who is supposed to be migrating and who migrants are, um, and it's not supposed to be children. Um, we have ideas that it that is adult men, presumably, this, the kind of paradigmatic migrant, and that that is feeding into a lot of um, the framing of crisis. Um, children create and families create a crisis, quote unquote, um, because they create legal complications for those who would like to detain and deport them. Children, for various reasons that I won't go into, are harder to detain and deport um, than adults. Central American children are even harder to detain and deport. So they create a crisis in that regard. They also, I think, create a political crisis in that um, children um, are weaponized, in essence, um, in some ways by both sides of this debate, um, uh, uh, because there is nothing more powerful than a suffering child, right? If you can mobilize a suffering, suffering child to your um, ideological position, um, you have a very powerful discursive tool at your, at your disposal. So I think part of the, the, the crisis of, uh, the framing of crisis is, is this. It is the framing of, or it is the fact of who is coming um, and the fact that these are uh, children and that lends itself to, um, to this framing. So I will talk more about that in, in Q&A, thank you. All right, so we're here to offer some historical perspective on migration to New York City, and since I've written this book on this subject with this subtitle, uh, I clearly have some thoughts on the issue. Um, Barrio America is a national study, but one that starts uh, on a quiet street in a Dallas neighborhood called Oak Cliff, uh, in a modest yellow wood frame house that is the headquarters of the Federación de Clubes Zacatecanos del Norte de Texas, the North Texas Federation of Zacatecan Clubs. Now, the first thing you'd notice entering uh, would be this display. Between the flags of Mexico and the United States, um, there's the official seal of the Mexican state of Zacatecas, uh, based on the original coat of arms bestowed by Philip II of Spain in 1588. The display is the creation of the Federation's founder and president, Manuel Rodel Rodriguez. And I began with this clubhouse and this migrante, I'll be using the Spanish term, uh, because they exemplify and help create a series of durable connections between the United States and Latin America uh, that constitute a transnational urban system, is what I've called it, uh, one that transforms cities and towns on both sides of the US-Mexico border. 
And more broadly, Rodela is just one of dozens of Latin American migrantes that my team and I interviewed between 2010 and 2016. Most importantly for our purposes, the broad historical context, uh, he is one of about 25 million migrantes uh, who moved to or were born in the United States uh, in the past 50 years, migrantes or their families. And they arrived just when they were needed most, at a time when American cities were in deep distress because they were losing people, shedding jobs, facing fiscal crises and rising crime, uh, and really facing the sense that perhaps the era of the big American city had simply come and gone. I argued that if migrantes like Mr. Rodela uh, had not come, then a lot more American cities um, would look like the parts of Detroit, Michigan, Gary, Indiana, or Youngstown, Ohio, that have become the tragic poster children of urban decay, right? Whose abandoned homes, shuttered factories, ghostly office buildings, and empty schools have become, uh, you know, the sort of symbols of, of urban decay uh, in books of ruins photography. There are entire books published just of images like this. I want to take a moment to emphasize that the work of urban revitalization involved immigrants from around the world. I focused on Latines because I speak Spanish. I do not know Cantonese or Arabic or Hindi or Korean or Yoruba. I wish I did, but again, this is simply a statement of the immigrantes that I have studied uh, who are about half of all immigrants. The other half come from, again, the entire rest of the world. This is an international effort. So let's begin by remembering what the urban crisis was, because in this era in particular, it's kind of easy to lose sight of it. Um, the urban crisis was a period of about 30 years when cities were in deep trouble. From the 1960s to the 1990s, early 1990s, the signs of distress were all around. People would go to work in the morning and see panoramic views of abandoned neighborhoods. Then they'd come home, turn on the TV, and see news reports with one story after another uh, about violent crimes in their city. And indeed, crime was the most high-profile symptom of the urban crisis. Uh, various metrics, homicides doubled, property crimes tripled, assaults more than quadrupled. Uh, just to give you one example from this city, and I remember it well because I lived here at the time. Uh, in 1991, at the peak of the uh, uh, crime wave, uh, there were 2,245 homicides in New York. If you do the math, that's about six every single day. Other cities had similarly horrible uh, statistics. Meanwhile, cities were losing residents. Detroit loses 35% of its residents. Cleveland, 37%. Lots of industrial cities say goodbye to about, on balance, a third of the people living there. The industrialization and suburbanization meant that jobs were being taken out. So for example, uh, Chicago lost about half of the manufacturing jobs that it had in 1948 by about 1980. Right? So it was a, a really difficult time. Besides the mere uh, statistical So these were movies that I saw when I was a kid, so they mean a lot to me, but they're also very illustrative. <laughs> there was a sense of a grim, pleasant, a present, and a bleak future for urban America. Uh, if you think of classic New York City movies like The Warriors, which depicted a city dominated by street gangs, 100,000 members strong, the poster said, who formed the armies of the night. Right? The 1981 film, Fort Apache, the Bronx, where I was born, but it had no real resemblance to the Bronx I knew, it described the borough as, quote, a place where even the cops fear to tread, unquote, if only. Um, but it was the 1981 movie, Escape from New York, that I think offered the most creative prognosis for the urban crisis. Now, the movie took place in the future, right? 1997. The island of Manhattan has been evacuated of its civilian population and converted into a maximum security prison. Inside, there are no prison guards, no law or, or order, only gang warfare and a struggle to survive. And every inmate had a life sentence. And before they were sent in, they were offered the last minute choice. They could either move to Manhattan or voluntarily commit suicide. So <laughs> underlying all of these movies uh, and many others from the era, right, RoboCop, uh, after the fall of New York, there are lots of these, uh, Dirty Harry, all five of those, it was the widespread sense that, again, big cities might be doomed, but essentially that is quite simply not what happened. Instead, crime rates plunged in this city by about 85 to 90%. Uh, last year, there were 433 homicides in New York. Before the pandemic, it was 318. In a city that grew from seven and a third to almost nine million people, again, massive drop in crime. Uh, nationwide, one criminologist estimated that today there are about a hundred and something thousand people walking around who would have been murdered had the crime rate stayed where it was in about 1991 or 1992. So broadly speaking, um, let me just give you the statistical part of this. Apologies, but just to give you a sense that, again, I based this on Chicago 
and uh, Dallas, but it works pretty much nationwide. Um, these are two tables from my book that basically um, show that Latinos and other immigrant stock populations like Asian Americans have repopulated cities hollowed out mainly by white flight. Right? So you can see uh, at the very bottom the number of white Anglos through 2010 is smaller than it was in 1970. All that slack is taken up by migrants and their kids. It was not primarily the creative class or yuppies who were behind the revitalization of urban America. Um, so I just had these for two cities, but thankfully when the book came out, the New York Times uh, wrote up the subject and their incredible data guy, Kwok Trung Gui, uh, did 10 more of them, right? So you can get a sense, um, here let's, the legend is here. So Latinos are the orange other, I would have used a rather different uh, phrasing, I think that's mostly Asian, uh, African and other migrants, um, are really sort of taking up, again, that slack left over. Um, in the Sun Belt, the biggest cities, Los Angeles, Houston, Dallas, and Phoenix, would be shrinking or stagnant, if not for immigrant stock populations. Similar dynamics in older industrial cities. Um, if you look at Milwaukee and Philadelphia, there are people who really, or cities that really need more immigrants to stabilize their populations. New York, Boston, Oakland would also be shrinking, if not for immigrant heavy demographics. So let me conclude um, by saying that. Anybody who goes around saying that immigrants or migrants are going to be, you know, the destruction of the city is frankly a liar, a lunatic, a political opportunist, or perhaps all three. The problem is really the concatenation of laws that have concentrated particular immigrant flows into this one place, and this one place is the most expensive city in the entire Western Hemisphere. Um, but really what we need is more housing and nationwide, and of course Migrante should be our answer to how to get it. According to the Department of Labor, um, we have a tremendous labor shortage. We are short about 2.2 million construction workers. Let's just say we know exactly where to get them. They're ready to be here. So if there's a crisis of migration, uh, it's that we need more of them. Thank you so much. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm just going to stay here and I'll just take five minutes. Um, so, again, I'm a Latinx historian, labor historian, um, and a social historian who works on food labor in particular. Um, my first book was about farm workers, citizen farm workers, guest workers, legally contracted guest workers, and undocumented farm workers in the U.S. Um, the book I'm working on now is uh, a book about the history of Latinx food workers from World War II to COVID. Um, specifically focusing on the Northeast. Um, so New York, obviously, a really big center um, of that region. So I'm just going to say a couple of things about the book and then why it makes sense that worlds of food should be talked about when we talk about the migrant quote crisis right now. Um, so my book is basically about this contradiction we have in the nation. We are a nation that enthusiastically embraces Latin American and Latinx food ways and food cultures, but we have a much more fraught relationship with actual Latin American and Latinx people. Um, and questions and debates and violence um, that erupts over questions of belonging, I don't think, um, uncoincidentally, happens in worlds of food. Um, and so uh, this is a nation that loves to enjoy cuisines and the diversity of food cultures that comes with migration. Um, but it certainly can coexist, and we see this all the time, in uh, xenophobia. The same, very same eaters who can enjoy um, this diversity of cuisine that's brought by immigrants can still hold this you know, form of cognitive dissonance that they want these immigrants to be gone, or they want them to come the quote right way when the structures in place don't allow that right way to happen. Um, quickly, in a timely manner, if at all. So my book is, you know, what is it exactly about food realms that allows people to feel like they can consume, that they can extract, that they can digest um, Latinx food ways, but not give anything to Latinx people in terms of citizenship, uh, privileges, rights, however, the, you know, that spectrum of rights that people are being deprived of now um, and accusing them of being criminal elements, polluters or diluters of American culture. 
Um, so my book is about foodscapes and the ways in which food labor, because this is often where we see people who are in precarious economic, socioeconomic positions entering the United States economy is often in worlds of food. Um, but these foodscapes are often meant to be less visible to us, even if we're trying to be the most ethical and mindful eater. Um, foodscapes and worlds of food are obscured from us in many different ways, either made much less visible or completely invisible to us. So this is everything from farms and barns to processing factories to the backs of kitchens to um, warehouses for all this prepackaged food service boxes that we get delivered to our doorsteps to food delivery, the delivery says themselves. Um, are operating in a space and in a realm that's often um, shielded from us. And that's by design. That's very intentional. Um, so my book argues that historically, the pattern that we have gotten into um, started in the 1940s. It's around that World War II period that the nation de develops this tandem appetite for Latinx food and Latinx food labor and they become mutually constitutive of one another, this obsession um, that the United States developed over time. The reason why we get so used to both is that we are participating in guest worker programs that are importing labor from Latin America and the Caribbean um, on a constant basis, constantly renewed by Congress. These guest worker programs, the Bracero program, the Migration Division program with Puerto Rico, the H-2 visa program, which is basically the Brasero program reincarnated for um, the present day. And along with those guest worker programs, because they are so limited and because they are costly, the parallel stream of undocumented migration that also comes with guest worker programs in the United States is that. Um, and so worlds of food have included undocumented labor, asylum seekers, people of um, precarious migration status or citizenship status um, for decades in US history. Um, and so this is a phenomenon still happening today. So while consumers might demand and fetishize certain items, certain food ways, certain trendy food experiences, um, this is happening at the same time that these people are being unseen in various ways. Um, there's both a hyper visibility to the themselves and the beings and the attractive things that make New York a culinary capital of the US and the world, but then there's so much invisibility that is taking place in terms of um, these people being able to be given um, living wages, working rights, basic um, nourishment, because ironically, food workers, not just migrants, but also citizens, experience high levels of food insecurity as they work to nourish us. Um, they go so profoundly unnourished themselves. Um, but I don't, in the book, I don't want to paint um, food workers as just passive victims. There are so many moments in which food workers, from citizen to guest worker, to undocumented, to asylum seeking, um, migrants make political moves to make themselves heard and seen and treated better in this country. Um, there are the things we might think of right away, which are union strikes and protests and rallies, um, but there's also moments of gastro-political demonstration. Um, there are moments in which Latinx and Latin American people ask for better food for themselves while they are working. They withhold food from others in order to make a political statement. Um, they become food entrepreneurs themselves when other workscapes do not serve them in the ways that they hope they will. Um, so while describing these political moves, what I'm trying to show is that, of course, these people should not just be seen as labor and laborers um, for the United States. They are fuller human beings. They have desires for themselves. They have, are, are making efforts to nourish themselves and one another. Um, and so I think both are important, both to explore the deprivation and then also the nourishment that is taking place in these communities. But uh, the crisis, quote unquote, that we are seeing right now, a lot of these people are actually, we see them blending into worlds of food already in the subway cars, the selling of candy, gum, little things. Um, we see them trying to um, get work in delivery, food delivery, so creating fake accounts in deliver delivery apps that are getting sold to them by other people. 
in order to start delivering food to us, some seamless Uber Eats, Caviar, all of these apps. Um, and so this is, you know, kind of a sphere in which we historically have profited over um, or off of undocumented labor in all sorts of um, precariats. And right now, in this moment, there is a continuity here that we are still taking advantage of people in worlds of food, um, but that they themselves are knowing that they have to um, blend in in that way in order to both be um, able to work until they're wait waiting for their work permits. So I'll end there. Thank you. So thank you so much again for inviting me to this panel. I want to share with you some photographs that I have been taking through different projects about migration. The first one that we are looking is uh, a photo that I took not so far from here. Uh, is this family in 2017 that was living in Sanctuary in uh, Episcopal Church in Washington Heights. And for me, um, it's really important to create ways to explain migration through art, to photography. Right now I am doing more embroidery. Um, so um, uh, during the Trump administration, I, as you know, a lot of families went into sanctuary across the New York City, but also across the country. So I have the opportunity not just to document their lives, the daily life in some of these churches, but also to go to um, the border and to to dig in the archives, uh, to dig into the history, because for me it's not just what is happening right now, it's like we have to go back to the history and see what was happening in 1980 when Reagan was president in this country, what was happening in Central America, why these people is coming here, it's not because we want to, it's not because this country is beautiful or give us the opportunity to war, it's because in 1980 was a war in Central America, mostly in Nicaragua, in Guatemala, in El Salvador. So we saw in during that times, I was kind of born during this time, but our parents saw like a huge wave of migration. Uh, uh, a lot of indigenous community. One of the questions of, of this panel was about raising or speaking about indigenous community and we are looking in through legal clinics I see is more notorious. A lot of uh, people, native people from and Afro indigenous people from Central America is coming to this country, but that happened since the Programa Bracero, but now it's more visible. So I put this, this um, uh, photo of this uh, propaganda to, to remind us, like, like we, we have to go back to history because history can explain us what is happening nowadays. And, and during this time, during Stone administration, I start also working through sanctuary project, through my sanctuary project, through uh, um, about uh, collecting stories. Uh, a lot of my work is participatory, so I do photography in a participatory way, but also I collect drawing and testimonies, writing testimonies from the people that I am working with. So this is Daria who draw uh, her own experience being on detention center and crossing the border. And she was, I remember that I went with my partner that is a Lutheran minister to the abode house here, not so far in the Bronx. And these children were uh, without her mother from three months. Uh, and we helped them to reunite with them. So um, we were really close. I was really close with them, not just because I was documenting their lives, it's because also I was trying to help them in many ways uh, to settle and to go to, to, to Seattle to reunite with their Salvadoran families, but also they are uh, indigenous, they are uh, Nahuas Pipiles from El Salvador. So I put this collage uh, to show you, um, uh, they asked me to take them to the Estatua de la Libertad. So. Um, something that I feel that is important to speak about migration is the tension and new waves or new ideas that uh, the, the eyes or, or all this complex has been creative, creatively to, to, to take prisons, prisoners uh, outside of prisons, but they still make money uh, of them. And this is a photo that I took also Jignes Ahuti. He was in Santory in Merida, Connecticut in 2000, from 2017 to 2019. Uh, he's Muslim and he was part of this uh, Muslim community in, two, in, in, in 11, September 11, 9-11. Uh, who go into the to the uh, list of Muslims? Um, so, um, I, if you see the the uncle monitor has Ruben, 
And even though it was broken, he was all the time afraid. And, and one of the, the, the things that I want to share with you about people living in sanctuary, Muslim living in sanctuary were more afraid that Latinx community because there are Muslims and all the stereotypes of categorization that this country has been creating of them. And during this time also I went to the border to, to see how was the migration, you know, coming to, to, to this country. And I found not just women's, because it's all the time speaking about women's who cross the border with their children, also a lot of men's crossing with their child and waiting to settle in this country and sending money to their wives to come in a more safer way. So this is a Holy Cross Retreat Center uh, close by to El Paso, but this is in New Mexico in Las Cruces. And they have this uh, retreat center and they are Franciscans and they have a, a huge shelter that offer their doors and open the doors daily to, to rescue basically migrants who come out to the detention center in South Texas. They pick them in buses and they bring them into this uh, center and they provide them not just food and shelter, but also they help them to, to, to go uh, or to reunite with their own families. So this is photos from that time. And this is a, a, um, a collage that I made with a child that crossed the border by themselves and if you see, is a Quiche language testimony. Uh, for me, this is a project that I have about, it, it, that is called the Codice de la Migración, the Migration Codex, and I am taking the idea of Codex from the Prehispanic times in Mexico to, to recreate the stories about indigenous migration. So if you can see the collage, the collage says everything, you know, you can see the, the mascara, the Maya mask, and the, also the cactus, but also the border patrol. Uh, this is another collage that I made taking oh, the inspiration for the stories that I have been collecting in detention centers not so far from here. You're crossing the Hudson, uh, you know, that is like four uh, jails that serves as a detention center. Uh, three of them are state federal um, prisons and one is a detention center. Uh, and this is part of the testimony that I have been collecting of, of the experience of these people. I love this one because also put how he came, like from Guatemala, Lucas, he drive to La Frontera, and he went to Bergen County Jail for four months, and then he went to Federal Plaza. And this is like, um, I, have, I have a lot of drawings that I extract for archival um, um, testimonies in, in Arizona states, and you can see, uh, this is in 1980, so the, the similitudes nowadays, and you put the children now, I have been working through a, um, in, a, in, a, um, in a program, educational program that we call Sanctuary School in a church that provides legal clinic every Thursday. And I am part of this uh, school program. And we have been working with children and we haven't seen, now they are, most of them are not Salvadorians, are Venezuelan, Afro-Colombians, a lot of uh, Peruvians, a lot of Equatorians, Quiche, uh, uh, but all, a lot of Afro uh, communities. So it's like, uh, I, th I know that I have to finish, but this also is like from 1919 and a lot of um, indigenous from Guatemala were coming to the, to the border, and this is like um, like a message that one of the activists from that times, Lori, um, gave me to scan and to use for my uh, sanctuary project. And and you can read uh, somebody is giving to her the, the thanks for all the work that she was doing in South Valley, Texas, but also in Arizona. And also I feel that it's really important to look out the media, how the media language has been changing. Now, you know, after they will call in us aliens all the time, and now it's more migrants, they treat us with a little bit more of dignity. And no, we are, we are no aliens at all. And this is part of the archival material that I have that I feel that is so beautiful. Uh, he, Guadalupe, came with a family that during this time was really famous because their own story in Nicaragua. And this is part of the work that I have been doing recently, uh, documenting uh, the cultural expression of indigenous communities, mostly Mexican in New York City. This is again, uh, an indigenous woman. Uh, she crossed the border when she was 14, and she um, uh, grew in her own language, also Quiche. It's a, a huge Quiche community, mostly based in Fort Hamilton, uh, Brooklyn. and. 
I want to show you also like during the pandemic, I was part of the mutual aid program and a lot of the people who were helping were migrants, helping migrants, not just like privileged people uh, who, who have works, uh, you know, like in their homes. So this is Josefina, she's from Guerrero. You know, a lot of the deliveries are from Guerrero, Mexico, Mixtecos, Nahuas. So I took a photo of her. She write also her own testimony and why she was um, helping or, or joining this uh, program, uh, mutual aid program. And I want to finish with this word that I am doing now that is called Sanctuary School, and that I am part of it, and we provide uh, artists, uh, tools, and education for children that accompany every Thursday to the uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church to their parents to fill their asylum uh, applications. I've, I don't know if this one, this is a video. So yesterday we did this, but I don't know if we can put the video. I feel that. I think that is not going to be played. But um, we discovered that these children, the Garifonas, the Hondurans, they play the, the tambores. So they start playing with us and it was amazing. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to go last actually and tie together some of the points that have been, excellent points that have been made already today. Um, so yes. This lecture is about the so-called crisis of immigration in New York City, but it's important to start by noting that the systems and sites that we're all speaking about, taken from stolen lands, unceded territories, are products of settler colonialism that have displaced and continue to displace through systematic displacement, extermination, assimilation, deportation, criminalization, cultural appropriations, relegating folks to the margins of society, as we saw in some of these drawings and collages, over incarceration, all systems of state erasure and rebranding, right? Systems that we are seeing live streamed again from across the world. So it's not surprising then that this rebranding and this erasure is then enforced on immigrant bodies. We enforced it on the indigenous bodies, we're enforcing it on immigrant bodies. It's been a common refrain, right? In US history, new immigrants arrive at our shores, often trafficked here or as a result of our own interventions abroad as just discussed. They're first vilified, then maybe invisibilized, maybe hesitatingly tolerated and perhaps generations later, depending on their proximity to perceived whiteness, later maybe they're venerated or appropriated for their contributions as examples of the all-American success story. So I really wanna start by making those through lines. How did we treat indigenous populations? How do we treat immigrants? And then how is this relevant today to bodies deemed foreign who may or may not be immigrants still, even thinking about what's happening on this campus? Right? How are the tools that controlled native populations, then controlled immigrant populations, tools that come from the militarization of our border, like surveillance tools, how are they then used to control bodies deemed foreign, even on this campus? So think about that. All right, so I'm gonna go through some of these enduring myths, um, scarcity, disease, crime, and terror. And quickly, because I know we don't have that much time. All right, so let's start with the myth of scarcity, right? Immigrants have long been blamed from the earliest days of their arrival right here on Ellis Island as a drain on public benefits. They are taking jobs from US workers. They are draining higher education spaces, exacerbating housing. None of this is new. This has all been there forever. Examples. All right, we have Tyler County, Texas, the superintendent there who wanted to charge $1,000 where children didn't have a status so they could go and get a public education. Went all the way to the Supreme Court, 1975, we have this major case which gives children the right to public education despite of their immigration status. But this case shows this common theme of people concerned about the drain that immigrant children bring when they come to the United States and then enacting state legislation policies, federal policies as well, to limit the rights of those populations. All right, and then this is from the Atlantic in June 1896. This was when there were largely European immigrants coming, but that same concept. How do we protect wages, the American standard of living, the quality of American citizenship from degradation, 
through tumultuous access of vast throngs. Look at the language here. Waves of immigrants, right? Throngs of immigrants. Um, from the ignorant and brutalized peasantry from Eastern and Southern Europe. So this is in the Atlantic from June 1896. Again, these themes are not new. This could be from 2022 from our mayor, literally. The same type of language. If you look at it, you have hundreds of articles using the same kind of language. All right, so what I would argue, and I think what all the panelists are saying, are these are really manufactured roadblocks, right? Why is there this perceived idea of scarcity? Well, there are federal policies that deny work authorization to certain and most new immigrants, right? So I'm also coming from a trip to the southern border in May where I met many immigrants who had just come through Ciudad Juarez into El Paso. The first thing they asked me in that Red Cross shelter how can we get work authorization? We want to work. We want to support ourselves. We don't want to be on welfare. We don't want to be in public housing. We want to support ourselves and our family. We're here to work. But there are policies, federal policies, policy decisions that prevent immigrants from getting work authorization. Then they're forced into doing unauthorized work. There's a system there, right, then of workplace exploitation. Um, there's public charge inadmissibility laws. There's requirements for financial sponsorship. Informal systems of fear and isolation that drive undocumented immigrants into underground systems. All federal policy decisions we are making that then we use against these same populations in the name of scarcity. Okay. And then, I mean, this is very similar to what my previous panelists talked about, is a little snapshot on this point into New York, right? Refugees in upstate New York. The federal government determines where refugee resettlement occurs. Um, about 6% of refugees admitted to the US since 2000 were resettled in New York State. Um, about 90% of them were resettled in upstate New York. Um, we're right behind California, Arizona. Cynic said the same thing they'd always said, right? On those previous slides. Oh, this is, how are these small towns going to absorb these numbers, right? What are they going to do? There's not going to be enough jobs, right? All of this cynicism lingered, right? And what are we going to do? And these are communities of Bengalis, Bhutanese, Bosnians, Burmese, Guyanese, Afghans, Jamaicans, Vietnamese, Syrians, Iraqis, Somalians, Asians, like a whole huge range, South and Central Americans. And what happened there was similar to what my previous panelists talked about is, well, they contributed to the GDP. Housing values went up. In Utica, New York, for every 1,000 immigrants who moved into the city, housing prices went up by $116 per square foot. They filled both low-skilled and higher-skilled jobs, creating over and saving manufacturing jobs in these cities. So again, fully a myth, and there are plenty of jobs in the United States, right? Okay. So then there's the myth of disease, right? We don't have to go too far back into the COVID pandemic to see how this myth played out um, and led to anti-Asian violence in our city, right? So this idea, and especially in New York, thinking about tenement houses, and, and again, this is urban planning, the kinds of housing conditions immigrants were relegated into. The fact that we had quarantine and immigrant detention centers, this is the Marine Hospital in Staten Island, and of course we have the Ellis Island, the nation's first immigrant detention center and quarantine center. This idea that immigrant bodies are inherently carriers of disease. You see that right again, migrants bust from the border. It's not just a humanitarian crisis, it's a public health crisis. Okay, so this is just repeating itself as it always has been. All right, but, what the reality is, is again, it's a theme. Our federal policies create these conditions of disease. So in fact, ICE detention centers, like the ones we just saw in the collage, Bergen County, the ones in New York and New Jersey, they have long been sites of disease. There is report after report about TB, like my clients get TB all the time in these detention facilities. We saw during COVID, the pandemic again, how much these were sites of COVID spread. Um, lack of attention to existing physical and mental health issues. So the ICE detention framework itself as a creator of disease. Our own border policies and restrictions, again, creating disease. So you were talking about remain in Mexico and these ideas of these tent cities that because of our federal policies, individuals were forced to remain on the Mexico side of the US border for six months, one year, two years, awaiting their immigration hearings in the United States. That was the remain in Mexico policy. 
These became some of the largest tent cities, refugee shelters in the world, right at our southern border, which of course became sites of disease. And then of course I want to flag the disabling experience of migration itself. Again, a federal policy. When you think of the barbed wires that our states are putting up, how are we creating conditions, disabling conditions? How are we leading to PTSD by forcing people through these conditions to come here? And then I'm gonna wrap up with the myths of, and let's put them together, criminality and terror, right? Whether it was the Irish drunkard, the Italian mafia man, um, the Chinese worker who violated ordinances, the Arab terrorists, this has been as an age old tale in the United States as well. And I just wanna flag a few things here and a few really important points and I know my time is up, so I'm gonna end here, is look, Regulation has always been driven in part by an image of immigration, immigrant criminality, an image itself that's driven by racism, which I think a lot of these myths are driven by racism. But thinking about some of these tools that use, are used to criminalize immigrants, especially surveillance in New York City, for example, thinking about the school to ICE pipeline in Long Island, where school resource officers are then connecting undocumented children to ICE for deportation. And then thinking a lot about border policing, I want you to just like really take away this point that these tools that are used to police immigrants are then used on our populations as well. So specifically DNA surveil surveillance, facial recognition softwares, social media surveillance, and that through line that I'll leave us with is like thinking about the funding that Governor Hochul just got billions of dollars really to put into surveillance on campuses. So thinking about where that technology has come from and where it's being used before, and now again, how it's being brought to native populations that may or may not be immigrants anymore. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to take a second to acknowledge the amazingly brilliant work that you are all doing. Um, round of applause for our speakers, right? Um, I want to start by asking you guys, uh, I guess like contextualize for us like from like your many uh, perspective disciplines, why are people currently migrating to the city um, and why is it being framed as a crisis or like an unprecedented thing that the city just doesn't understand? I mean, I think, I mean, people have always migrated to the city, so nothing of that is new. I think there is definitely, so I mean, I can just go back to the border. I mean, there were a, a huge period of time where our border was essentially closed. So again, my theme is our federal policies have led to where we are. So under, during the COVID period, and even before that in the Trump administration, first there were these policies that forced people to remain in Mexico. Then COVID happens, and then using antiquated public health laws, Title 42, there's basically a stop at the border. There is no asylum at our southern border, even right now under the Biden administration. So what's happening is there's periods where some of these policies are maybe lifted for a minute or there's some kind of stay and there's incredible amounts of complex litigation on all of these policies where suddenly people are seeing an entry point and coming. So you're going to see large people come at once where at Mo that before there was like a constant trickle of people which see is perceived to overwhelm systems. Again, these are all perceptions and we are creating systems that, ca that cause for this. Um, yeah, I can add more if other panelists want to. So, oh, hello, yes, does it work? Yes, okay, I can't hear it at all. Um, uh, oh, so many things to say. Um, one thing that I just want to uh, maybe point out that I, I didn't have time to talk about is that the, the what precisely this question of what happens after the pandemic um, and who is coming and how it changes. Um, I, I talked a lot about, and many of us talked about Mexicans and Central Americans, but in the last 18 months, which I suspect is the thing of greatest interest perhaps to the, the subsequent panels, what we've really seen is a, 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 a remarkable diversification of the nationalities of people who are arriving. Um, so that where once upon a time we had primarily Mexicans and Central Americans coming over the border, um, we have this explosion of of uh, diverse nationalities, Venezuelans, Cubans, Ukrainians, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Haitians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that part of the story of New York, it might be that, 
um, and, and this is purely speculative, um, but for folks who are coming, for example, Venezuelans that don't have a long history, um, you know, large Venezuelan communities, a, a deep history of um, migration in the US, many of the folks that are coming are um, don't have social networks, right? Whereas we saw the, the long history of Central American migration, for example, um, when I worked in a detention center, almost every single person who came through that detention center had a cousin or a friend or an aunt or a parent that they were gonna be reunited with. And that is not, in my experience with the Venezuelans that I have interacted with over the past 18 months, that is not the, the case for them. So I think part of this is about um, historically migrant communities receive one another um, and uh, rely on uh, networks of support and solidarity. Um, and a lot of the folks coming now lack that because they lack the deep history. I mean, history gives us knowledge and it also gives people support, right? Um, and so I think that explains part of um, the challenge that, of, of this moment, in addition to, of course, the, the policies, uh, the noxious policies that deny people the ability to work, et cetera. Um, it's also that people are not intending for New York to be their first destination. They've been undocumented in other places in Latin America and their move up, but they're just being moved over here by other people, um, treated like pawns basically. So they're undocumented to like the third, fourth power um, because they've tried to go through something already in um, another country in South America or then in Central America or then in Mexico and then in the Southwest and then um, moved up here to the Northeast. And just to answer the, the crisis question, it's obviously politically beneficial to some people to imagine that there's a crisis. Um, it is purely a hype job. It, they may be trying to get more money out of the federal government, which is a reasonable thing to ask. They might be trying to persuade people to vote for their party, might be trying to persuade people to feel fear of others. But as an immigration historian, the continuities are what is really most notable, right? So. Right about now, there are 13% foreign-born people in the United States. In 1910, there were 14% foreign-born people in the United States. Now, that was a previous peak of the foreign-born, but we have been here before uh, and not just once. By the same token, uh, since we're talking about New York City, 36% uh, of all New Yorkers were born elsewhere. In 1910, that number was 41%. So there are a whole bunch of statistics, if you look at them, they're amazingly consistent, whether it's what, you know, percentage growth in the US population has been the same for about 70 years, roughly 1% a year. And so just the, the entire concept of, oh, it's a crisis is fundamentally, truly and unmistakably just wrong, except insofar as, right, as you pointed out, we have policies that are self-defeating that create problems where there shouldn't be any. Something that I think is important to add is like the people is coming um, in a forced migration. They just, they don't just migrate because they want to and we know it. And it's because also this extractive neoliberal system, if you see the condition of Venezuelans right now or the Haiti people, but also African, a lot of people from uh, Middle East, uh, from Uzbekistan and also still from Central America and from the Garifuna community is because the condition that this country has been created uh, outside are terrible. Sending guns to Mexico, for example, and creating the drug war and a lot of territories is really impossible to live for, for people. So they escape, basically. I will say that they just not migrate. They escape. They don't have another option. Um, so they cross different countries, as you were saying. Uh, some Venezuelans, they first go to went to Ecuador or Argentina or Peru or Colombia, and they see the opportunity to migrate in community, like in caravans. Now they ha it's a new phenomenon that they saw that uh, migrating by themselves is really dangerous because they have to cross different countries and some of them, they have to um, uh, be careful with the gangs and in Mexico with the narco traffic. So, and as you were saying, a lot of people has benefit profits in this crisis that is not just a migration crisis in the city, it's a health crisis, it's a housing crisis, it's a violent crisis. And when the people ask me about this, it's like, what did you expect if this country, if this city doesn't do anything for their own citizens? You know, how many people is in the streets right now? 
dealing with with mental health, dealing with a lot of things, you know, like, so I am not surprised that the, 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 the city doesn't have this infrastructure economically and in different kind of levels. Maybe I'll just say um, one thing, which is that I feel like so often conversations um, about this, the question of migration um, dwell on US policy and US law. And it is the case that we have a pretty much unlimited um, power in this country to inflict harm on newcomers. But we actually have relatively little ability to control um, who comes uh, and, and sort of global migratory flows. So I want to um, really put out there that people don't show up at a border. People don't show up in Penn Station. People don't show up on the subway uh, from, from Venezuela or Cameroon, um, you know, magically. They come because, you know, for reasons, right? Um, and those reasons are complex and why they come from Cameroon is different than why they come from Venezuela or Nicaragua. Um, but that is so uh, infrequently part of our, our conversation, and it absolutely um, must be part of the conversation. We need to deprovincialize the conversation about migration in the U.S., both by recognizing why people come and also by recognizing that New York City is, um, as several panelists have said, merely the endpoint of a long history of, you know, experience of displacement. Um, Many folks arriving now have been refugees in multiple countries before they ever got here. Um, and so we, we like to think of, um, you know, the U.S. is somehow exceptional. We're the ones dealing with a, a border and a, and a crisis and that. I mean, and the fact is, you know, many more Venezuelans are in Colombia today than they are in the U.S. Um, so this is, uh, and, and to speak about the hemisphere, and we could speak of this as a global um, issue of forced migration. So I think deprovincializing the conversation in the U.S. and recognizing the hemispheric and global networks and ram Ramifications um, and resonances is really uh, critical. Um, just as a plug for the rest of the day, we've talked a lot about kind of informal networks of mutual care um, and aid. We, that's our second panel. Um, the right to shelter is something that is. Um, getting a lot of attention in the media, and it's part of why New York is often framed as like where migrants should want to go by other political actors. Right to Shelter is the third panel, so I hope if you're able to stick around to hear um, our fantastic um, panelists on that. Um, I guess the second question um, that we would like to ask is if there is anything about the history of immigration to New York City that people often misunderstand. I know we talked a lot about kind of the short-sightedness of the current discourse um, about the kind of invisibilization of, the, of our complicity in creating these conditions that are so unstable, so unsafe for people to want to escape, want to move, and then being forcibly literally shipped here um, to New York City, not as their first destination, but as their second, third, fourth destination. Um, and if there is any misunderstanding, um, how that misunderstanding, whether by the public or whether by decision makers, um, how that impacts this current wave of uh, migration. I can start with that. Just um, as Andrew was saying earlier, this story is a lot more about continuity than it is about disruption or um, a different pattern. Um, so Colombia actually played a part in a moment of crisis in the 1940s and 1950s when air travel became easier between the island of Puerto Rico and the mainland. Um, and the Puerto Rico Commissioner of Labor actually hired some researchers from Colombia um, to prove because it was being said in newspapers and in public discourse that Puerto Ricans uh, were a problem in the city because they were coming in such numbers. Um, even though they were citizens, they were foreign right, and racialized in this way that they were seen as outsiders. Um, and these researchers at Columbia produced a report saying um, that these people really are not a threat. They are not um, criminal. They are actually contributing to the economy. They have, um, you know, an education. They're coming um, and sort of disrupting what people's ideas of what this crisis was. Um, I think New York has also been at the center in other northeastern cities, regions all over the U.S. during the Cold War when we absorbed asylum seekers from Cuba, from Vietnam, like people were... Um, distributed, received, absorbed. Um, so these waves that happen over time that are framed as crises, 
the absorptions happen. Um, they just take time. And the way that, the, like Cynthia was saying before, um, the way that the media talks about um, migrants too affects so much. So when Trump says they are poisoning the blood of the nation, when they are cannibalizing the United States, when he wants to go back to Eisenhower era Operation Wetback to um, start these mass deportations, it's so much about language with the, which then feeds into people's ideas of what's a crisis and what is simply continuity. I mean, like an example of that very recently is just how the tone towards Ukrainian asylum seekers or migrants as opposed to others, right? So the New York City was able to integrate thousands of Ukrainian refugees. Um, there was a very different tone um, in a matter of weeks um, because, and a lot of that goes back to a policy choice that the federal government made to streamline these processes that we talked about, get people work authorization, resettle them, support them in different ways. So I mean, like, how, why are we creating those policies for one group of people and then for other groups of people people spending an incredible, inordinate amount of our federal budget on detention, surveillance, border militarization, instead of repurposing that money towards some of the needs that we talked about today towards our infrastructure. Yeah, I wanted to go sort of two levels deep with a couple of really basic uh, sort of mythologies of immigration. Um, the one that I'm sure you all know about is the whole, well, my ancestors came here legally and the people now are illegal. Response number one, which I'm pretty sure you also know, is that there were lots of laws prohibiting immigration starting in about 1882 if you were Chinese, 1917, 21, and 24 if you were from Southern Europe, um, and the entire time if you were from Africa. So number one, illegalizing certain kinds of migration is what changes that. The second level of that, and this, this I'm drawing on uh, the work of a historian at Berkeley named Hide Takahirota, he went back and found that actually of a lot of the immigrants who were legal because immigration for Europeans was more or less unregulated until the 20th century, lots of them did fall afoul of local rules on being a public charge, and they were not deported, right? So I think answer number one should be, well, the, there was no regulation. Number two is actually a lot of your ancestors, the Irish especially, right, the Italians, um, people from uh, the Pale of Settlement, a lot of those people were technically illegal, but United States municipalities and states just by and large did not deport them by choice. So that dichotomy, A, doesn't work, and, and B, also doesn't work. The other, and this sort of comes from a very sometimes different part of the political spectrum um, is that, you know, we do have uh, that, that all-American success story about the old immigration. And it is largely true, right? There's an enormous amount of exploitation, enormous amount of, of, of mistreatment, but by and large, social mobility uh, among uh, old European immigrants was remarkable. What is even more remarkable is that, and here I'm sort of standing for a, a book called Streets of Gold by uh, Leah Bustan uh, and Ram Upramitsky that came out a couple of years ago. They're both economists, but they actually are good at it, uh, which I don't say lightly. Um, and they used like some really clever computer modeling. And you know, when this book first came out, I was like, oh, I'm sure they got that wrong. And two paragraphs later, oh, they got that right. Ah, but did they think of this? Yeah, damn it, they thought of that too. Mm -hmm. They have the goods to show that the levels of mobility of present day immigrants are virtually the same as of immigrants in the 19th century and the early 20th century. So even our legitimate concerns about exploitation, about people being pushed into the um, sort of uh, black market of labor, those are real. And if we were smart, we would immediately uh, regularize the status of 10 million people. I've got a piece in the New York, uh, sorry, in the Washington Post arguing exactly that. But even given the level of exploitation, the economic progress of modern day immigrants is amazingly good by comparison. I was thinking like as an artist, I always have questions and uh, how I am going to create projects more creatively uh, to confront all of these categories of ideas. And I was thinking in how colonialism has been creating a lot of vocabulary 
against us, against um, brown bodies, uh, queer bodies, um, immigrant bodies, indigenous bodies. So a lot of the words that we use, like illegal, alien, mojado, are really like despective, are uh, oppressed uh, language. So I think that we should uh, retake or, um, or uh, remain in these kind of words in order to change the misunderstanding about migration. And also, art can help you. So I feel like art can help you to, to, um, to confront these ideas, because media, as I was saying, has a huge impact on, on creating this. Uh, um, and also, um, the, the images that we are looking about migration, migrants, you know, we always see them in a vulnerable position. We always see them like poor people, people who can put us in dangerous, people who has diseases, so we have like to start like changing this um, uh, vocabulary, but also representation in media. And can I add one more point? It was just also like narratives and like the good immigrant, bad immigrant narrative, because I think one thing that we're trying to all be mindful of is like, yes, we as advocates, like obviously we're talking about the myths and like the criminalization, but right, statistics touting immigrant contributions are helpful and valid and real, but how do we keep our mind, how are we mindful of entrenched systems of ableism that prevent disabled immigrants, for example, from contributing, other societal barriers that many immigrants face? So how are we like undercounting actually the contributions or potential contributions of immigrants when we look at our statistics about immigrant contributions? Similarly, our statistics touting the lack of criminality. Statistics I put forth too, immigrant communities have less crime, for example, we say that, right? But how do we also say and acknowledge both in court, in front of an adjudicator and in our advocacy that, you know, obviously the criminal system is intertwined with racism, that a lot of the stops are race-based. So if my client even has a misdemeanor arrest, are they now a bad immigrant? No, they lived in a neighborhood that was over-policed. So how do we kind of reconcile all of this and be mindful of not creating that this is the good immigrant, this is the bad immigrant, even in our advocacy? Thank you, guys. Um, the next question has to do with the management of how the city uh, uh, restrains the mobility um, of uh, these recent arrivals, and um, particularly in regards to public housing um, and uh, public space. Um, so I was wondering if you guys could comment a little bit about that. Or generally, like how the city has governed this issue like as as a municipality as opposed to at perhaps higher levels of governance um, I definitely um, would be interested to hear what the other panels um, are gonna say about these issues but I would just say you know sort of rounding back to one of the themes of my presentation about um, families um, I, I think that is a, a critical piece of this whole um, conversation um, I think politically I mean, I wouldn't put anything past the Adams administration, but I think politically it's probably easier um, to have um, young African men sleeping on the street, right? The optics of that versus families and children, right, sleeping on the street. So there are ways in which children and families create a political problem in scare quotes um, for those who would like to, you know, um, not have to support them. Um, as it happens, something like 50% of, of, of um, folks crossing the border now are coming in families, and in New York, I just read the statistic is 72 percent. So I think that, and and I, you know, I leave it to the housing folks um, to tell us what that means. But I think that's just a really critical piece of the whole conversation, um, both logistically. Obviously, children and families have particular needs that, um, you know, young people on their own maybe don't have. Um, but it also creates, um, I think, political challenges for Adams, again, because um, how, how will New Yorkers respond to the optics of children sleeping on the sleep versus adults? Um, and I think that that's part of, I think that really plays into the whole framing of, of crisis that we're hearing from his administration and elsewhere. 
Um, the city has also, by leaving people out in the open, so to speak, have created the very informal economies that they then criminalize. Um, so street vending, um, informal vending of, of food and selling of food, um, that then they profit off of simply because there's no work permits for those people coming in a timely manner, but historically the city has never given enough permits um, for people, citizen, migrant, everything in between, um, to be able to, to vend and to sell and to create food legally in this city. Um, when you leave people out in the open, you also leave them vulnerable to hate crimes, violence, robbery, uh, labor trafficking, um, all sorts of things can result from this um, lack of true shelter. Um, that the, the right to shelter law on paper looks like this is the place to be, but the city historically and currently is not providing that true protection. Um, that shelter seems to imply as a word. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, at this point, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. Um, we should have someone passing around a mic, um, this mic perhaps. Um, so if you have a question, please just let it be known. Hi, uh, thank you all for your uh, presentations. My question is also related to municipal governance and specifically what ways in which New York City or any other global city can better align their policies and practices with insti like world institutional level attempts like the Global Compact on Migration to ad better address these issues and the influxes of migrants that may or may not actually be calling, causing crises. I mean, I can, I can speak to that one a little bit. Um, I, I should say that um, the very odd stuff that comes out of the mouth of the mayor of New York City should not be taken as representative of municipalities dealing um, with this issue. Um, generally speaking, the places in the United States at least, and I will limit my comments to this country because I don't want to go over broad, um, the places where most immigrants are, are the places that are politically most favorable to migration, right? So the, the resistance to to newcomers is mostly coming from counties where there are none of them or only very few of them. So those who sort of know migrantes from anywhere in the world tend to very much like them. So if we think back to sanctuary movements um, in, in the 1980s, if we think about sort of sanctuary policies presently, um, the act of saying we're not going to not just encourage, we're not going to permit local law enforcement to do immigration enforcement uh, is really important because it sort of at least potentially removes one level of fear of that like, well, you're going to go out to work and then you're going to be gone the next day and your family is not going to be able to see you. Um, any policy which allows through local ordinance um, workers to have safe places to find um, people who want to hire them often, you know, ideally without inquiring as to their immigration status, is really important, right? Because as, you know, other panelists have said, these are people who unmistakably very much want to work and who have extremely high levels of labor force participation, um, but making it easy for them to have physical spaces, um, again, to find people who want to hire them. You know, there, there are a number of, of but, and then finally, obviously, representatives from cities, right? We have members of, of, of the House and, and I mean, the Senate is statewide, but to really just militate for a general amnesty. Because frankly, one of the best examples we have is in 1986, the, the Immigration Reform and Control Act had a couple of very foolish provisions and one terrific one, which is that it, it allowed almost three million people to regularize their status. And when they did, their wages went up 15% over five years, more like 20 over 10 years. They began to buy durable goods because if you are an undocumented person, you're not gonna necessarily buy a washing machine because if you have to leave, you can't take it with you. Once people had that security, 
at the economic level, right, they began to invest in businesses, they began to invest in real estate, but at the sort of more human level, they could go and talk to their kids' teachers at school without worrying that that was going to be a site where they go and get grabbed. They could go and, like, go attend, um, you know, community colleges and get the kind of training that they needed to do more remunerative kinds of work because they weren't afraid that a local institution was going to check on their status and therefore turn them over. So just to refuse to participate in federal level enforcement is really, really important. Yeah, I just wanted to underscore that importance of like disconnecting those like local law enforcement, federal law enforcement partnerships um, and just kind of like highlight what's happening in Texas now with the passage of new legislation that just passed the Senate yesterday, I believe, and it's about to go to the governor's desk where essentially local Texas law enforcement, even like campus police and school resource officers can enforce a new state law which criminalizes the crossing of a border, an undocumented, cro in illegal crossing of a border into Texas. So now that's a state crime that state actors can enforce. So what does that mean for this environment that you're asking about, right? And like we're trying to go in that exact opposite direction with disconnecting that kind of enforcement of federal um, laws. And here they're making it a state law. Um, and then to the economic policies, which also, of course, that create enabling environments that can provide stability and predictability. I just wanted to flag like licensing and professional degrees. Like it's this is a hot issue right here in our state. Like undocumented law students, can they practice law? How, there was a lot of advocacy done at the state level to allow for them to be barred to practice law, for example, in New York. And some of my clients are social workers in their home country, the states they live and don't allow them to practice social work with a license because licensure professional degrees are coupled with this idea of status. So looking like lo into local, and those are usually controlled by state entities. So thinking about that kind of thing and encouraging those people who do have these professional degrees from their home country to be able to match and do that work here, which is much needed work as well, especially in healthcare professions and caretaking professions in the United States right now. So uh, I know some of you, so thank you for all the work. I know you've been doing a lot of work on the ground and beyond. Um, you know, there is this naivete that kind of uh, justifies the terror that is sown by the state. Uh, by, and, and I often hear that with people who are organizing under, you know, around immigrant rights, but they keep saying that the system is broken. The system is broken. And I keep, you know, kind of confronting that and saying, no, the system is not working. There is uh, intentionality of the system to work this way. And as long as we keep justifying that the system is broken and that that happened accidentally, you know, uh, we are uh, not being responsible and I think uh, really uh, deserving the people that we are supposed to be advocating for and working for. So uh, the, this increasing idea that we, you know, we can, the state can wash its hands. Uh, uh, from any responsibility. Uh, it's insidious and it, 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 it's increasingly um, evil in many ways. Uh, so I just want to say that, and that takes us to the phenomenon of crime migration, which is used in many of our circles when we organize, which is the intersection and the coupling of you know, immigration with criminalization. Uh, the mobility of human bodies increasingly being criminalized. Uh, and that's why I think I, I thank some of you, some of you have spoken, about, I think all of you have spoken about that. Uh, but this new phenomenon also that we have, you know, we haven't had an amnesty or any kind of immigration reform for the last almost 40 years. Uh, 
And people like in my church, you know, I am from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. We do a bunch of stuff with asylum seekers. But now I am having trouble with the people that have been here for 40 years, have become grandparents, and they said, what about us? Nothing has happened. You know, we keep being pushed away into the shadows. What's happening, you know, to us? The, the government has neglected us, not only neglected us, but used and exploit. So, you know, how do we deal with that phenomenon in our hands? Yeah, it's amazing now when DACA youth are now parents and grandparents right now. Um, it's really shocking. Um, I think a lot of it is like people, like you said, are very intentionally creating chaos in the immigration enforcement and detention regime. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, it's built in to the way that people are held because so many corporations are profiting off of people in limbo. Um, and that is happening in all different ways. Um, so the people who get contracts to be these shelters for migrants, the people who make the cots, the people who serve the food, the people who um, make all the materials um, that go into keeping people on hold um, is really just insidious. Um, and so taking that apart is just such a big thing. And when people say the system is broken, they're not even thinking about that um, whole other realm of it happening. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add to this point. I mean, yeah, like every one of these things is a federal policy choice. It's not a broken system. It is the system. Every one of those myths, criminality, disease, everything we talked about, scarcity, those are choices to create that environment, right? And then especially with immigration, and I mean, I want to say, I'm a law professor, I want to say, oh, ref immigration reform, right? Like, I think about this now. How do I teach this to students? What are we doing? Wh where's our Supreme Court? Okay, so immigration reform. Okay, so that's, is that really realistic? And where is that going to go? If anything, we're going in the opposite direction where there's an explosion of criminalizing immigration status now on the state level, like I just talked about in Texas, and of course on the federal level. So then lawyers have said, okay, what about access to counsel, right? There's no access to counsel in immigration court. It's one of the most technical, difficult areas of law likened with tax law. But when an immigrant goes through the system, where the end result could be death by deportation, like for many people, you have no right to counsel. You are on your own, you are pro se, unless you can find in New York, there's nonprofit network of organizations to represent you, or you hire counsel, given the financial realities that a lot of us discuss that are built for you and that you're forced into. Maybe you don't even have work authorization yet, and you're supposed to hire an asylum attorney for $10,000 to get yourself through that system. So is access to counsel really the I don't know. So then, I mean, like where we're going is really thinking about the strength of organizing. How do you think about abolition? How do you make these really important points about how this is all framed and foundational, like as capitalism? Who benefits from an ICE detention center in New York, New Jersey? Looking at the stories of abolition coming out of New York and New Jersey right now are pretty incredible. The closure of multiple, if at all, New Jersey detention centers that those efforts in New York, and then the reality is that many of these detention centers shut down, and what happened to those individuals, they were transferred to shelters in even states further away, further from their systems of care, further from any council they might have found. So how do we like make these connections nationwide? So I mean, for me, as the law professor, I'm thinking more about organizing more than like legal reform, sadly. There's a really good point, I think, Gloria, you had made about this cognitive dissonance. And for me, there's a question about policy versus politics. Because I think we're talking a lot about policy change. But on my social media, I simultaneously get, through whatever algorithm, videos of people going to Queens and really enjoying all the, quote, ethnic food, you know, and how that's an asset to New York. But at the same time, I'm getting videos of how expensive New York City is for tourists because we don't have hotel rooms, and of residents griping that we're paying $300 per family to have a hotel room. I mean, some of that's because of Airbnb pushing certain narratives as well. But that there is kind of this long-term image of migrants, new residents to the city are providing this kind of really great benefit. That is part of the DNA of the city. Yet somehow, we can never get through 
to those, I think, the, the facts that long term, they actually provide economic opportunity, benefit, culture, life to the city. How do we think about this role of politics and messaging? Because clearly, facts don't matter to the average person, right? How much of this is, and, I'm, and apologies for being a little crass about this, we're navel-gazing in a way talking about politics when this is being fought in the court of public opinion. You know, they're seeing certain images and our, our facts aren't getting through. How should we maybe think about it, particularly through a historic lens? We've gone through this, every generation has had this conversation. And somehow, not that the arc has always bent towards justice, but for some, we found some type of stasis where they are now living and thriving. How do we think about that through this longer civilizational question, generational question, the urban history question? To me, and this is exactly a pertinent to the facts don't matter observation, it's even stranger than that because facts that should comfort people, they don't want to hear those, right? They, they, so when somebody is terrified about you know, the great replacement or white genocide or whatever, and you're like, hey, um, we've had these fears before, they're unfounded, here are a whole bunch of trends, uh, the crime numbers head in the right direction when immigrants show up. If it were the case, as you said, that facts mattered, they'd be like, even the most rabid anti-immigrant person would think, oh, well, what a relief, right? So like if you, if you had a scary symptom and went to your doctor, and you know, she examines you and says, hey, good news, you're fine. Normally you'd be like, great, I'm, I'm so happy. Uh, these are the kind of people that are told that their fears are unfounded, but they really love to fear the other. I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't know how to deal with that, but somewhere in the disciplines of like anthropological approaches to folklore and group threat theory, th the answer has to be there. I, I think the other thing that I want to emphasize is we want to be sure that we, we don't aggregate public opinion in a way that conceals, again, where people are in favor of generally liberalized immigration policy and where they're not, right? So people might gripe in New York City, but this is not the problem. All of our members of Congress are out there, you know, would, would, would favor a much more liberalized immigration regime. Last thing, to sort of to, to, to try to address your question, remember also that Part of the reason we have not had immigration reform is not that people are in a majority necessarily against it. It is straight up manipulation of the system. In 2013, a very, by today's standards, generous immigration law passed the Senate with more than 70 votes. It would have passed the House, but John Boehner deliberately kept it off the floor because he knew that it would pass, right? That should have happened. So I think we, we, we want to be sure we don't walk around imagining that like a majority of the people are against immigration reform. It, it, I do not think that's the case from existing polling. Um, that often it is specifically the abuse of parliamentary procedure to prevent us from even having a vote on that. Hi, um, first of all, thank you all for your contributions to this panel um, and the work that you do more broadly. I'm wondering, like, a obvious consistent theme of this conversation is about how, like, there are very intentional structural policies in place um, to make this issue more difficult to address. And I'm, like, especially within, like, the sort of more formal political space, and in terms of like for people in this room who are here because they are interested and want to engage with this issue, like in terms of like the conversation about how we organize and how like how the system is so broken looking for places, or not the system is so broken, but like the system intentionally creates, you know, what we're all talking about. How can we like in your experience, have you engaged with like organizations or like social impact programs like here in New York that you think do really exemplary work or like things that we could also get involved in that you could care to highlight maybe to us? Because sometimes hearing about how difficult it is to navigate the system is like, okay, so where do we look to mobilize? Who can we sort of look to as like leaders in this space? I think that's a great question.
wife who's got kids and that family. Um, there are, um, we're gonna actually have a panel in a couple of weeks right after a break of students who are doing work in, uh, from across the university that are doing work in the city um, on this issue. Um, and they're gonna share some of their experiences. Um, you know, is that kind of getting involved in a local mutual aid, um, you know, organization of which there are several in New York that are doing astonishing work, um, advocacy organizations, activists, networks, um, or is this gonna change all of these things that we talked about? Are they gonna, are they gonna rewrite narratives and fix laws and um, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I don't know, um, I don't know, but I don't know what else to do. Um, and I think that those, um, you know, those kind of activities are extraordinarily valuable and they're at least a place to start. Um, Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to join in and and I'll let you do Juan Carlos's introduction as the a person who we should definitely connect to. But from my end, um, I, I just think, so I think thinking about like, first of all, get your direction from the most impacted people is where I would start. So it's like, where, who are the community-based organizations in like, who are authentically representing impacted communities and what are they asking for? So for some of these communities, maybe it's not been some of the things we've talked about in this panel, but it's really, I need an ID. So can you do advocacy so I can get an ID, so I can get on you know, Amtrak or go to the library, you know, those kinds of things. Um, there is like, and then you can also think about it as issue area. So for immigration, it's intertwined in almost like every aspect of life in New York City. So there's like a workers' rights angle, there's a housing angle, there's a healthcare access angle, there's a due process angle, there's a mental health, you know, like everything you can think of, there's a connection. So I would also think about like your own expertise and interest and like whatever you're trying to go into, how does that then connect with immigrant communities? And then you find that organization doing that work and kind of using that as an in as well. So there's like a, you know, but really, I feel like if you take your direction from the most impacted of people, that'll like always be a guide in terms of where to do this work in a helpful way and how. I feel I join um, uh, an organization, a community center, but also uh, for so many years I was volunteer in a legal clinic, uh, helping people fill their asylum application. And in that process, I met a lot of uh, unaccompanied children. So one of the things that I have been doing since that time is being a sponsor, legal guardian, and that Thing, I feel impact a lot of uh, an adolescent uh, children that have come to the United States. And nowadays I have many um, uh, sons or daughters that I say that have their residence, their green card, and they are going to become citizens soon. So this is like a, a thing that a lot of citizens we can do uh, using our privilege as a citizen and has a huge impact in other people. Actually, can I flag one more thing on that question too? It's just like also thinking about, so there's like direct services, you know, thinking about like, do I wanna help an individual, right? And there's the, that kind of intervention. And then there's of course like the policy level changes too. So that's another way to kind of think about and direct your attention. Um, I just wanna thank our panelists again um, so much for <laughs> such a wonderful conversation. For this panel, we're going to be talking about formal and informal systems of support and care, and we wanted the panelists to kind of introduce themselves and give us a brief intro into what they do as well. Um, so if you wanna... uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Devlin. I'm an assistant professor of city planning and community development at Temple University, uh, and I most of my work is around urban informality here in the global north. Uh, focusing specifically on the issue of informal street vending uh, here in New York City, mostly trying to expand the research to Philly as well. Hi, my name is Deb Berkman. 
Um, I am the supervising attorney of the Shelter Advocacy Initiative um, and the Public Assistance and SNAP, which is Food Stamps Program, at New York Legal Assistance Group, which is a free legal services provider. Um, I'm also an adjunct law professor at Brooklyn Law School, and I teach uh, different classes and topics, mostly relating to poverty law, civil rights, that type of thing. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Murad Alauda. I'm the director of the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, this mic is interesting. Uh, and we are the oldest and largest immigrant rights org in the US with over 200 members across the state of New York. Um, and excited to be in this space with you all. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sophie Bakuyate. I'm the, the membership and services manager at African Communities Together. African Communities Together, it's an African organization, and I can say proudly that we African who work for Africans. Um, and so we have three, three chapters. New York is the first one. We have one in DC, in DC, Maryland, Virginia, and another one in Philadelphia. And we're hoping open, of course, more chapter. But we also have uh, a network, you know, um, organization who we can connect, you know, leaders and other organization. Um, yeah, we call that LF. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today for this panel and on formal and informal systems of, of support and care. Uh, we're going to be following a similar structure to the panel than, than the first panel. Uh, after these brief introductions, uh, we are asking you to tell us more about your work, about your experience. Uh, for that, we will have around seven minutes for each one of you. And after that, we will go with some questions that we have prepared to, to engage with the discussion. So please. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Hiba and Hugo, for uh, organizing this and, and all of the students who've done, uh, I'm sure, a lot of work uh, coordinating everything into our um, student um, discussions. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, so I'm, it's interesting, I'm, I think I'm the only full-time academic on this particular panel. And as such, I feel I'm probably the least useful to tell you what's going on on the ground and the work that's being done, um, though I'm really looking forward to hearing from my co-panelists uh, uh, about their work. And so, what I think, what I, the way I felt I would be most useful uh, in the, on this panel is to talk a little bit more broadly uh, about the current moment, um, think, trying to put it in some theoretical context related to the field of planning. Um, and discuss some conceptual approaches to migration, informality, and planning that I've found helpful in my own work with street vendors in New York City, um, and that I think have relevance to the current moment of migration here uh, in New York. And I, I, in listening to the first panel, I wanted to also lay out that much of what I'm gonna be talking about, the framework to be thinking about this is this notion of in the meantime, right? While we wait for a potential maybe better future, a future where our government responds ethically, humanely, uh, and openly to migrants, a future where um, borders aren't um, what they are today. We, there is work still to be done, right? And so what my work and, and the way that I wanna be thinking about this is how do we work in this moment and this situation of limbo uncertainty with the idea, stated idea, that it is not accepting this as acceptable, right? Knowing that this is still um, something that needs to change. And I wanna start by proposing that we think critically and intentionally about the generous face nature of the condition of uncertainty this condition of limbo and how it's both a source of anxiety and stress, but can also open possibilities for the formation of informal structures of livelihood. And that this condition of limbo and uncertainty is of course produced by a number of factors, not least of which is the political and legal bureaucratic mess that characterizes the formal space um, of the US immigration issue. And you know, the formal systems of, of immigration in this country um, intentionally are not, sorry, sometimes I start to get loud <laughs> when I talk.
tongue. Intentionally or not, um, uh, are, are broken or perhaps working as they were meant to be, um, but working in a way that has created uh, a, a lot of problems and a lot of stress for migrants. So in Washington, there's little to no hope of new legislation uh, coming from Congress. We have a president who's unwilling uh, to make any bold moves uh, regarding the situation when uh, he has the power to do things um, and won't. Uh, we have a federal bureaucracy and court system that is um, unprepared, un, un, under-resourced to respond to this issue. And, um, you know, we have a local government that just wants this to go away, um, an administration. I shouldn't say all of the people in the local government, but an administration that wants this problem to go away, in my mind. So my work argues that whenever we see problems of governance that are too complex to sort of solve or resolve, the space of informality opens up to help uh, state actors and other actors manage the issue. And this informal space is one where a number of people, state actors, nonprofits, activists, urban residents, work to find ad hoc solutions, workarounds, good enough for now fixes. And the condition of informality has a double-sided nature to it because while uncertainty has rightly been identified as by a number of scholars as a condition that enables marginalization, a condition that creates pliant-dependent subjects governed through anxiety and without the guarantees of the rights granted by the liberal state, it can also be a space of creativity and opportunity, and I'd like to focus on that aspect uh, here in, in what I'm talking about today. Uh, and I think it's evident in what we see uh, in, around the city as migrants themselves have proved resourceful, innovative, resilient. Um, the state of limbo that they've been placed in by the formal bureaucracy has not been a state of stasis um, or paralysis. Migrants have found ways to create informal infrastructures of livelihood and support. Uh, this despite constant low-level harassment by enforcement agencies, particularly the NYPD, uh, who do everything from hounding candy sellers in the subway to confiscating e-bikes and scooters. Um, even the most recent that I've seen in my neighborhood, putting up police barricades around the spaces in which delivery uh, drivers try to just stop their, park their bikes, eat lunch, um, speak with each other. And so also I want to go on. Uh, before I go on, I want to also say, state something extremely clearly that uh, it is important not to romanticize these practices uh, to, or to see them as simple, ready-made solutions that absolve the state and the broader society from any responsibility of support and care. The state, the federal government, the state government, local government, they are the locus of material resources and funding that have a clear role to play, and we still need to hold them to account um, uh, to provide those, those funds. But at the same time, recognizing these informal practices as valid problem-solving methods in and of themselves, recognizing them as, dare I say, planning from the bottom up, is a critical component of any sort of empathetic, inclusive response to the current migration moment. And here, I'd like to draw on uh, the work of a, a number of, of people from outside the United States. And you know, as I've, as I've been, been living in this city, um, and living in a neighborhood health kitchen where uh, we have a high concentration of hotels where migrants are, are, are staying and living and trying to work, particularly delivery workers. Um, I, I've, tr I've thought about it and I've been reading a lot of, uh, particularly scholars like Mona Fawaz, uh, someone who, who writes about and studies um, and works with uh, and in refugee and migrant spaces in Beirut. And a number of scholars who have worked in these spaces, I think, including Mona and, and Hiba, um, have a number of lessons for us, and I want to just quickly uh, go to hit on two. First, and this is actually something we've been talking about, right, that um, it's just not a crisis, right? This is a crisis. The word crisis used to describe migration is a misnomer in the sense that a crisis is seen as a bounded event, right? Um, and this is obviously reflected in the fact that we have um, quotes around the word crisis even in our, in our program here, right? Um, the current wave of migrants are entering the city. It's a crisis in the sense that it's not new, right? Um, that uh, more of an, it's in more of an application, amplification or pre-existing challenges and problems. So the current wave of migrants enter a city in which newcomers have long struggled to find safe, affordable housing, decent work, and have had to fight for the access to public space and resources. Even before this current wave began in 2020, roughly half a million undocumented immigrants called New York home. Uh, and had struggled in these informal spaces uh, of undocumented living. And that's a conservative estimate. So that's a city of undocumented people bigger than the entire population of Atlanta or Oakland or Minneapolis. So there's a continuation and amplification of the challenge, but it's not a new one. And the good news here is that New York City is a city with existing informal infrastructure built by past immigrants, infrastructure that is being used and expanded by current migrants, not without tensions. Um, but a city full of informal ad hoc strategies to manage uncertainty and maintain an infrastructure of hope. All right, and uh, 
the, the second lesson basically being and that we have much to learn from these informal infrastructures and that planning, planners uh, need to strengthen informal infrastructure that already exists um, while working to uh, mitigate the um, negative externalities. So I'll, I'll close by, by just saying this, and this is my last page, so I know I have to wrap up, um, that this requires a new kind of planning or a different kind of planning rationality. Right, for those working in the global north particularly. Planning and public administration are still technocratic fields that have deal in long horizons, posit the possibility of a rational progression to a fully articulated goal or end state. But how do we plan when terms, uh, long-term resolutions and ideal end states seem so far out of reach? Uh, for these answers, I propose we turn to the rationalities of migration itself. While migration undertaken in pursuit of an ideal end day-to-day, -day, uh, ideal ends, it's day-to-day, -day, it's about keeping avenues open. Um, Martina Tazioli, in her writing about Europe, migration in Europe, speaks of a governance approach that she calls choking without killing. And it's an approach where state officials lean into the informal bureaucratic practices that produce cramping and disruption that slowly dismantle migrant infrastructures of survival. The goal is to extinguish the flickering flame of hope that drives so many migrants to cross jungles and deserts, travel along railroads and roadways, cross borders, climb fences, scale both physical and metaphorical walls. And this quiet, unsaid policy of choking without killing is unfortunately an increasingly apt description of our current mayor's um, administration's approach in New York. We want them to go away, to give up. But it doesn't have to be, and we don't have to sit by quietly. I'd argue that the role as planners and advocates and individuals within bureaucracy is to help maintain that flame of hope to work with migrants and support the ad hoc, informal, the good enough for now methods that even if they don't solve the problem in a conclusive way, keep the possibility of a better tomorrow open and keep the flame burning. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> and I am so honored to be here and be on this panel um, among all of these experts. Um, so again, I'm Deb Berkman. I, um, I want to, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience and how I got to work with this uh, group of new immigrants. But I want to start by talking about framing and the language we use. Because everyone calls this group of new immigrants migrants. But I had always understood migrants to be people who were coming and then going. And from all of the clients that I've worked with, that's not the case. All of the clients I've worked with have an immigration sort of experience that is identical to every other immigration experience. They, they left somewhere to where they could not live to come here for a better life and to stay here permanently. So I, I really think when we're using the word migrants, it, it, it's really just sort of we're taking on the government's verbiage. And you know, I think that was sort of an intentional uh, naming in order to other this group. Like th these are not different immigrants. These are the same immigrants that have always been coming and immigrants are what makes our city great. So th this is not a new situation and I, I don't think it should be framed as such. So I, I work at the New York Legal Assistance Group and um, part of what I do in my job is that I work with people experiencing homelessness and particularly people experiencing street homelessness. And um, I run a project called the Shelter Advocacy Initiative. Um, and so I sit at different feeding sites that people go to. And around April of 2022, last year, I. I almost overnight started getting um, all of these new clients coming to my legal table. And they were asking me about public assistance for which they were eligible, they are eligible for benefits. So again, when we hear that our, our clients are undocumented, this is, at least in my uh, experience, very often not true. So they were eligible for public benefits. Um, they were trying to enter the shelter system and they had come to New York, not on buses from Texas, some had come on buses, but most of them had come on planes in the very beginning. And, um, and they were put on planes by social service organizations, uh, private, like nonprofits in Texas, um, and they, because they wanted to be here. And almost overnight, and you know, as soon as they got here, they started, you know, as probably many, many people do when they get to the this, to this city in this country, they, they had great hurdles that they had to face. But at, almost overnight, more and more people started coming to my table and asking me, how can I apply for public benefits and how can I get out of shelter? 
And um, soon I, I heard uh, Mayor Adams uh, telling about uh, the fact that Texas and the Texas government had sent buses of people to New York, but that was actually not my experience at the time. That did end, end up happening eventually, but um, it, it's hard to know when or how that happened, but that did end up happening. But in the beginning, um, in this city, we have a right to shelter in New York City, which means that everyone who needs shelter is supposed to get shelter. And so in the beginning, um, the families, and I was working with a lot of families in the very beginning, they came and they would apply for shelter like anyone else who was experiencing homelessness would apply for shelter. So they would they would go to the, the office and they would fill out applications about where they had lived and then they would be placed in sort of the current like dominating New York City shelter system. Um, but you know, from the get-go, they were having, they were facing opposition because um, they weren't uh, being spoken to in the languages that they spoke. They didn't understand what was going on. Many people were having to wait in the shelter intake office for days. So there was a lot going on there. But but in the beginning, New York was really trying to integrate this sort of newest wave of immigrants into our existing system. And that happened for a while, and, and they weren't treated exactly equally, but in the, in the very beginning, New York, it, it appeared more like New York was trying to integrate people. Um, but more and more people kept coming. Now, it wouldn't really matter in New York if more people who came who were experiencing homelessness, if people who were in the shelter system already were, being, were able to transition out of the shelter system. Shelter's supposed to be a way stop on the way to a more permanent housing situation. But that wasn't happening and that hasn't been happening in the New York shelter, shelter system for a long time. A lot of people stayed in the shelter system for way too long instead of being able to transition to permanent housing. So the system got fuller and fuller. And so what happened is the mayor devised that um, instead of, uh, absorb, oh, I have two minutes left. Instead of absorbing people into our current shelter system, he was gonna create this other shelter system that was only for new immigrants um, that had less services than our sort of general shelter system. And that is going. that was time limited, basically. And so we have the current situation of this other shelter system where adults are allowed to stay in their placement for 30 days and then they have to leave and potentially get another placement. And families are currently being told that they can stay there for 60 days, and then they'll have to either leave or get another placement. Now, and a lot's going on with that, and I can talk about it later, um, but what I really wanna highlight is the differences in treatment that this group of new immigrants is getting, as opposed to immigrants who got here in January of 2020. Um, it's really this new group of immigrants that, that's been sort of set apart. A minute. I'll take it. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Murad Wauda again. I'm with the New York Immigration Coalition. Um, I kind of want to take a, a couple of steps back, right? I think it's when we're looking at a problem, we tend to just look at what the issue is at the moment, how do we fix it, as opposed to thinking about what the root cause is. Um, and it's not going to be a shocker to many people here, but white supremacy. Um, that continues to be the root of all evils and everything that we're dealing with. And it shows up in every institution, every level of government. Uh, it happens on this campus often. And, you know, we have to each challenge ourselves of how we're responding to that. And when we see a community of folks and uh, folks being targeted for whatever their beliefs are, how are you responding, right? So it's easy sometimes to disassociate ourselves from the, the impact it has on us or what our impact can be and challenging some of uh, the notions that we are witnessing, right? Um, so this is your call to action. And when you see, uh, I curse a lot and I don't know if I'm allowed to here. So I'll pause every time I'm about to. When you see crazy things happening and it just doesn't make very much sense, um, I think that that, you, we need to be really critical in the way in which we're absorbing information. So I ask you all to be critical. I ask you all to challenge your administration here. I ask you to challenge the people in power to make sure that justice isn't just for some of us, but for all of us. Um, so with that being said, I think that when we're talking about um, the recent increase in folks coming to the city, it's not really an increase. People have historically come to New York, right? Uh, New York has welcomed immigrants refugees, 
migrants, asylum seekers for centuries. Um, that is what has built the city. Regardless of what people want to say, that is the truth. You can research it and figure it out yourself. Every single impact of the city has had an uh, imprint by the immigrant, new wave of immigrant communities, from our roads, to our bridges, to our skyscrapers, to everything here. From the social and economic fabric of who we are as a city and a state has been impacted by immigrants. Um, unless you are indigenous to these lands, you are also an immigrant. I know that sometimes people have like a hard time comprehending that. Um, but this nation was not a white nation. And that also goes back to the first thing I said. Um, so for us, we also have to look at the differences in what is leading people to leave. No one leaves their home because they feel safe. Would you leave your home if you felt safe? I'm looking around, I don't see anyone saying yes. So I think we have to really think about why are these conditions being created? And then when you dig a little bit deeper, you end up seeing that the United States has a huge hand in that. So we are creating the conditions that are forcing people to leave, and then we are conditionalizing humanity and who we see as someone who is deserving of being seen as a nation. So one thing that the US quickly did, which is the right thing to do after the conflict in uh, Ukraine um, happened was they created the Ukrainian uh, Response Initiative, which we also created one for New York, um, in supporting uh, folks who wanted to come to the United States. We urged the federal government to create TPS, temporary, temporary protected status for those who are here, allow people to come into this country on humanitarian parole. They did that, um, and they gave folks one to two years of humanitarian parole upon entry. Um, and it's because there was a conflict back home, right? So people fled for their lives. Um, we quickly also urged the administration to do the same for the newcomers who were coming to New York. Um, and we were sort of met with silence in the beginning. It was very odd in the way in which this, this administration um, responds to issues when they are impacting black and brown people. Um, but it seems like they just turn a blind eye to it. So months, Later, um, the administration launched a couple different programs um, trying to get people to avoid going to the southern border. So one of those programs is the parole for Venezuelans, Cubans, uh, Nicaraguans, and Haitians, but you have to actually have someone who is going to sponsor you to come in. It's not complicated, but it is complicated because we're putting a financial, uh, you know, check mark if you are not going, you need someone who's gonna sponsor you to come in kind of thing. Um, and then they also created the CBP One app, which um, you know is not very well known, but that's how they're making people check in at the southern border now um, at ports of entry is through that app. So if you don't have an appointment, in rare cases will they, will they see you without an appointment. But once, if you do get in with that, you also get one to two years of parole. Why is parole important? Because it also gives people the opportunity to work upon, uh, not upon immediately, they have to apply for it, but it allows them to immediately apply for an EAD. So now we're going to, I got three minutes. Um, but, you know, if we look at, like, let's just look at Venezuela, right? And we think, why did this happen to Venezuela? Like, what happened that about 7 million Venezuelans left Venezuela? The vast majority have stayed in surrounding countries, but some have migrated up north. Um, and it's the Rubio sanctions that devastated the country. And this is why when we talk about sanctions, um, I think sometimes people are like, well, we need to hurt countries that are doing bad things in our definition of what we randomly think is bad. Um, and I'm not defending any dictatorship or anyone, but I'm saying, what ended up happening in Venezuela was that the people who were impacted the most by the sanctions were the actual people of Venezuela. So there was no other option for many of these people but to leave. Um, and if you look at other populations, right, a big population, I know uh, my sister is gonna talk about it most definitely and deliver it with better justice than I can, is our African and black migrants and immigrants who've been coming here, right? Um, and we see how every level of government treats uh, black immigrants in this country, from the federal government down to the state, down to the city, where it was okay for the city to be like, eh, leave them in the street for three or four days. We're gonna like deal with it when we deal with it. Um, 
And these are folks who literally have fled for their lives. Literal slavery is what they are escaping. Some in Mer coming from Mauritania who ha can show you their shackle marks on their wrists and their ankles. Um, and these are the people that we are turning away. So we don't have a migrant crisis. We have a crisis of leadership. And it's a crisis of leadership at every single level of government in this country. And it continues to perpetuate itself unless it is a white immigrant. And that's where we have seen the US step up in amazing ways to do what we ask very quickly to ensure that they are delivering for this vulnerable population. Um, I think I'm supposed to talk about the work we do, but I probably don't have enough time. We're an advocacy and policy organization that does coordinated services. We work with NILAG a lot and African communities together. They're both our members um, and they're amazing. But we, we bring together our membership of over 200 organizations across the state of New York to actually convene and talk about what are our top issues? What are we gonna fight for together? And immigration legal services has been the top issue for, I've been here for a decade, it, and not in this role, but at the organization for a decade, and it's always been the number one issue. And we went from having almost no funding for immigration legal services to having 100 million at the city level, which has not been because of this administration, it's from previous administrations. And then we nearly quadrupled immigration legal services this, this past budget in the state um, which has been incredibly helpful, but it's still not enough. So when we're talking about the issues that we're also facing on the ground, um, in addition to the shelter, in addition to people having access to care and health care and every as everything you would need if you're setting up a new life in a new place, um, those are incredibly important. But another important piece is the immigration legal services piece, which we have been trying to coordinate um, across the state and really working with all of our members to deliver in the best way we can as ethically and no, not as ethically, ethically, but also ensuring as creatively as possible. Um, because we know that we don't have enough immigration attorneys in the state or in this country. We also don't have the infrastructure that we've been fighting for because it's not been funded and we're going to continue to fight for it to be funded. And this has been I think people see this moment as like, uh, it's been crazy for us right now. It's been crazy for us for eight years. And it was crazier even before the eight years, but the eight years that I'm referring back to is when Trump ran for office, right? And him spewing the hate that he did against our communities. Him winning was a crisis of democracy, to be honest with you. Him being in office and the attacks our communities faced, that was another crisis. And then COVID was a crisis. And this moment, again, is not a migrant crisis. It is a crisis of leadership. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Moran. Um, you know, it's an honor for me to be sitting, you know, close to, you know, Moran especially because, like he said, we are a member of, you know, his um, organization. And you know, we do our best to, you know, partner and also legal aid society, and I call them all the time. <laughs> and uh, and um, it's really, really, um, they say it all. So what I'm gonna say again, so my name is Sophie Bakuyate, and my work at African Communities Together, it's working with African migrants, I will say especially, but we are, have hospitality, so we open our door to everybody, no matter where you're from. So yes, we're helping more our people because nobody is here in the city helping them. They don't see us. And I have to say us because I'm part of them. Of them. And uh, so I'm myself immigrants. I'm from Guinea-Conakry. Um, and um, the problem that we have here as African immigrants is when the, we talk about immigrants or migrants or you know like the who's coming to from you know to the US from the border they think about you know Latino, Latinos who came you know through the southern border they're surprised to see that yes african people come through the southern border and it's true that a few years ago we were coming we were more are traveling by plane because Africa is very far from here. I don't know if you see the, <laughs> it's pretty far. So, you know, like, you know, it's more easier, easy to come, you know, from, you know, uh, uh, um, Latin con countries than to come to Africa. But you have a lot of people who do that now, right? Um, 
But I will say that what we try to do at African Communities Together, and I think is we're doing not too bad, is to see our brother, sister, uncle, whatever you want to say, as human. Because the thing is, people forget that we're talking about human beings. They're talking about numbers. They, Murad know numbers way more better than me. When, you know, my supervisor, my director asked me for my data, I'm like, okay. So I put everything on my computer, of course, I'm a good student. But I can't tell you how many people I see, I cannot tell you. I know that I can, you know, I can give you approximately a number of 50, 60 people per day, which is a lot. But I'm looking at my people as human beings. So when they talk about us, I'm like, can you stop being like, oh, we need a numbers, we need this and we need that. I say, can you think about our feeling? Can you think about our mental health? Can you think about, you know, what we want? Can we listen to them? When they're coming to us, they're coming to a family. They're coming to just, of course, to find resources. You know, we don't have, a, it's a lack of resources in the city. So when they knock at our door, sometimes we don't have even the resources that they need. But what we have, it's we have a here to listen, and we have arms to open, and we have a heart. When they leave the office, they say, oh my gosh, that's a family. We try to create a community inside the community. And I think that people forget about that. I was myself undocumented not too long ago for 15 years. So what I tell them all the time is just looking at me. I can give you hope, you know, and because here, where I am today, but what we want you to do is to fight for yourselves too. Because you know, in Africa, we, that's how we were raised. It's don't say, you know, too much, you know, like we have to be very humble. We cannot talk too much, you know, like you need to be respectful. I say that to my dad all the time. I say, oh my gosh, you know, the way you raise me is tiring me because I have, you know, you can talk too much, you can say this too much, you can, uh, uh, you have to be respectful. Uh, uh. Yes, of course. But at, at a point, you have to say what you have to say, you know, because if you don't talk for you, who's going to do it? Nobody. So our organization are here for also educate our people, because when you come into a foreign country, you don't know how it works. You don't know the system. So we're here to explain the system, but what we want too is New Yorkers to know us. That's what we want too. And that's why, at, you know, in my organization, we talk a lot with press. It's not because we like it, I hate it. First of all, my accents, you know, my English, I'm like, oh my God. But I have to do it because I'm the voice of, you know, Africa now, here in New York. So I have to do it. And I, go, I have to go further and I have to, don't think about me, but think about my people, you know? And, and again, what I said all the time is, hey, we here, yes, we come from the southern border too, but we are like you, human being. And we're here to work. We're not here to, we don't need no assistance. That's true, yesterday we did a, a protest for housing because we need to start somewhere, right? When you, Fred for another country, and Murat said it very clearly. You don't live, it's not because we don't like our countries. We love our countries, you know? But it's because something happened, like some of us were in danger and we have to come to the US. And we want to go back home. We want that. I have three kids and I push them to go back home, to make the difference. Because this thing start over there, you know, and Murad say it, it start there. Like, why are we coming here? So the new generation, the new African can fight, you know, for this cause. But for us who are here for decades, two, two decades for me, and um, um, I'm like, <sighs> I need to change something for my people. 
why are we coming to, they call that a crisis, it's not a crisis, but can you just understand us? Can you just listen to us? Why are they taking decision without having us on the table? Why you, 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 choo you, know, you choose something for us, you decide something for us, and you don't listen to us? You know, I think really what we need to do here is to come together because the solution is not one person who's going to find the solution. And we, we know that since long time ago, since we work on policy and, and you know, oh, my time is up. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I said I was a good student. I'm sorry. My time is up. So just, I'm just going to say that the solution is all of us. It's, just, it's not one person, it's just one organization. Um, and why I see new that you know, we need to be like all together to do something, but it's also you. you know, look at you know, like right and left and talk to each other and you know, learn about each other. And that's what New York is made, right? Immigrants. So. Okay, this is better. I'm Natalie Rubio Torre. I'm so sorry that I was late. I guess I didn't estimate the traffic. Um, I am from Voces Latinas. We are in Jackson Heights, Queens, often known as the epicenter for immigrant Latino settlement. I myself came when I was three years old to Elmhurst, Queens. And, um, but I am, a re I am a product of my father coming and experiencing very similar things that we are seeing now with our recent migrants. And it's kind of full circle because I ended up working and, and building my career and building this agency in Jackson Heights. I'm also a graduate of the Columbia School of Social Work, and that's how I even started the agency through an internship at, at, at uh, the school, the social intervention group, by the way. Um, but I just want to say, I, mean, I, I don't, I, I'm going to just hop in. I'm, you know, we started as an HIV prevention and violence prevention agency because we saw, and as a woman, Latinas for Latinas agency, because we saw that immigrant Latinas living with HIV were connected to care, but they were living in their secret. They were living alone with the secret and they weren't connected to cultural services. And so although people offered the services in Spanish, they still didn't get, feel connected. And that's all we did. We just provided a space. And that's, it's unbelievable how when you pro provide a safe space, and I agree, I, I share a lot of what you just said, uh, it, it, it opens people up, it opens so many other possibilities. Voces is on the ground. Um, we are familiar with all the agencies here, and we probably have some connection. I just took this, uh, your training. <laughs> 40-hour training, um, and uh, and and so and we would and we referred a lot of people to your legal services, African services. So um, we are very much. We've been doing this for 20 years. So everything that was said that this is not new. This, we've been doing this work for 20 years. Our people are coming every day to Corona, Jackson Heights, Elmhurst. You could see in their faces who just arrived, who needs to eat, who's hungry. And a little different from our, our agency is like boots on the ground. We're trying to just get people where they're at. And even if it's a gift card, even if it's a meal, even if it's a warm coat, but just try to offer something to keep them make them a little bit more comfortable that day. Our people are walking around with a lot of trauma. I don't know if we talked about mental health here yet, but trauma is soaring. And if you hear the stories, and that's something that we don't hear about on the news. We hear about the shelter, we hear about housing and the mayor and all that, but we don't hear the realities of the day-to-day -day that our people are encountering and are living. And these are the things that we're hearing. So how many times a week do we run to Target and buy a stroller, just a stroller? because women are carrying babies on the subway, just trying to navigate the city. How many times do we just feed people? Kids are coming in coughing up a storm. TB is on the rise. TB has been identified as, uh, with our recent migrants. So we're trying to connect to healthcare because they don't know that there's free healthcare here. So we're, just, we're trying to keep up with the pace of what, what the people are coming in with those needs, those immediate needs. I could talk about all the legal, and we are now offering legal services. We're trying to get that program started. But there's, a, you know, when somebody's in front of you and they're hungry or they're tired or they look sick, you, how, you know, we can't start thinking about the data and the, the checking off and putting people into our, our funding boxes. We have to feed them and we have to clothe them and we have to say, you know, 
little, the little kid could sleep here if he wants, you know? I have to call my contacts on the phone, my pediatri pediatrician. Can you talk to this mom just to see what something's going on? This is the way we're working now. It's not like business as usual. It's like now. It's not making appointments at clinics and, okay, you can come in like a month from now. No, it's coming now. And it's, it requires walk-in hours too because people don't have our schedules. People are in hotels, in shelters. They don't have a regular schedule. So this is something that we're doing. And as a... As a, as a COVID really changed the way we work because after COVID, it's just been back to back uh, situations. And I know we aren't saying crisis, but there are crises in our community and it affects the undocumented because the undocumented are not able to, or they're more fearful. They try to stay out of the radar and they don't apply and they don't know their rights and people take advantage of them. And then the last thing I'll say is that our avenue is now the red light district. Have you heard this? Our avenue on Roosevelt Avenue is now considered the red light district because what's what Manhattan is that was cleaned up is now coming over to our, right under my window, we have migrants doing sex work. We have migrants uh, getting exploited. We have migrants, uh, we've always been work, working with the women in the bars that do dancing and do waitressing and do sex favors just for, to make more money. But now it's at another level where it's in our faces. I don't know who, who's been on Roosevelt Avenue lately. You see it. You don't even have to look for it. You see it. Massage parlors, corners, Latinas, Asian women, uh, every woman, they're all migrants or immigrants. And so why? Why are we letting this happen? And our city council, I'm not even going to get into that, but check out your, just do a little research on what our city council wants to do. Unbelievable what we have to accept. And it's all survival, survival. But we could help and we could, we could influence a little bit and we could try to help and have them, our people survive in other ways. And then the last thing I want to say, because I don't know how much, but if you leave, if anything, if you leave here is cultural humility. Because if you don't practice with cultural humility, in which I think our city is failing, is we're, we're not getting anywhere. If you're, look, I don't know, we're doing workshops and all on cultural humility. Look up cultural humility and look up what that means. Being culturally humble at this time is vital. Because if you are encountering somebody that is needing so many services and they're not feeling safe opening up with you, you're doing really nothing. They're not going to come back. They're going to keep going. They're going to keep going on the subways. They're going to be begging. They're going to be continuing to sell candy, putting their kids in danger. All these things. So we need to be culturally humble. We need to learn. We need to open up our hearts. We need to be kinder. We need to step in their shoes for a second and imagine what is it that they are going through and what is it that they might need. That is very simple, but it's also very difficult because we, you know, we're lost too in what we, we're data driven. We're constantly being pushed for data. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about us. I'm a social worker. I, like I said, I'm a social worker. I, um, this is what we do every day. Um, we are the five pillars at Voces Latinas are our sexual health and wellness, which is our HIV prevention, our domestic violence and, and intimate partner violence, our uh, promotora trainings, which are community healthcare workers attached with the workforce development, which we're doing a lot more right now with our migrants, our mental health, and um, we are now uh, developing our legal services so that we are all across the board, across all programs, learning how to do uh, work permits, work permit applications. That's everybody's job now at Voces Latinas is learning how to do those permits because we need it. So thank you very much. I don't know about this. Well, thank you so much for your amazing presentations. Um, following with that and, and trying to build upon what you already told us, and thinking about some of the concepts that you already brought to the table, uh, for example, the, the character of the migration process, the immigration process, and uh, as a process and not, and not as a crisis, uh, we would like to ask you uh, today, uh, from your experience in, in, in your practice, what challenges do newly arrived immigrants face in accessing both formal and informal support and care systems in New York City? Could you tell us more about that? I can, I can start. Um, I think the challenge is for African migrants or any immigrant, 
it's the language access, but especially for African migrants because they don't speak, obviously, English. They try. But they don't speak Spanish. And you don't have... I'm, like, sometimes very surprised to see that in this city where you, ha you know, have so many migrants or immigrants, that you can find someone who speaks you know, the African dialect that we have, Mandingo, Pula, Wolof, like, oh, really? Like, I just have, one day we went to a shelter, but of course they don't let, uh, let you go inside. You try to, right? Mm -hmm. But we stay outside, you know, and we wait for them. And then when we insist a little bit, someone come up, can I help you? Yes, I would like to talk to a manager or someone who help with the languages. And when I ask, do you have someone who speaks Arabic? No. Do you have someone who speaks uh, Wolof, whatever, different, you know, like languages that we have in Africa? They don't. For me, it's a problem. And you're not going to tell me that you cannot find in the city someone documented who can, you know, fulfill this job. You're not going to make me believe that. It's impossible. And they don't even have the French. Not even the French. It's, so... I'm not going to be too long, but that's the number one. Uh, oh, and the lack of resources. Not enough. Again, the number one thing that's, and what builds our, our organization, African communities together, it's the legal assistance. Because when we come to this country, the first thing we want to do is work, right? But how can we work if we don't apply for a working authorization? So we need lawyers to apply because we don't understand the language and the forms are in English and Spanish, right? Yes, and, and also USCIS only, USCIS only accepts forms in English, English, but that our clients can't possibly understand. Right, but at least you have the form in Spanish so you can understand and then, you know, you can, at, at least you can understand the form but you don't have that in any other language. So, yeah. I will add also, I think that for this most recent group of immigrants that's come since March of 2022, as, as much as all of the usual barriers that new immigrants to the city face, which is language access, which is resources, I think that, you know, and it's not that I think this, there's been a real effort to dissuade people from coming. Before March of 2022, New York City was calling itself a sanctuary city. And now our mayor is actively handing out flyers telling people not to come here. So I think that in some ways the city is making it, you know, purposely more difficult to access uh, the resources that actually are available to our clients like, and I'm sorry, I have to talk about public benefits, but public assistance, you know, it, when people are, are paroled into the country, they're eligible for public assistance in New York State, but so many people don't know that because the government doesn't want us to know that. And I think that, you know, part of trying to keep people out of New York, part of the, the plan has been to, to limit access to, to this type of information. Uh, there's a lot to say on this, but I do think that the, there's this misconception that we didn't have the infrastructure to handle this, and that's wrong. I think we have the infrastructure we have been building in our communities for over, the NYC has been building for the past 37 years. Um, so we, our organizations, our community-based organizations, our legal service organizations that are doing the work have been doing the work. But the way in which the city and the state and the federal government operate is in like 12 month intervals as opposed to thinking about the long term. Um, and all city resources for the most part and state are not multi-year. So when you're a legal services organization, you're hiring someone to come on board, rarely do you get a multi-year contract. It's like, hey, there's this Ukrainian issue. Here's, you know, some money, hire a lawyer for this Ukrainian community. Um, instead of thinking about the long term, how are we setting up lasting infrastructure to actually meet every moment that we face? And, you know, it's not as simple as just submitting someone's asylum application or their TPS application, or if they're paroled in, just their EAD application. They're going to need legal services 
to continue on their immigration journey here, right? Like if specifically for folks who are being, uh, who are submitting for asylum must have like a lawyer throughout the process. And I think that the city's perspective on this is like, we just wanna get everyone's application in. We wanna get everyone to submit so that their 180, 150 day clock starts so that we're able to get them work authorization. And I think that the city has miscalculated every single move that they've made. And they've done it on uh, real like horrible grounds, right? So even the way in which that they have been providing care for uh, the folks seeking shelter, right? I think there's, it's important to also share some data on like who's actually staying in the system and who's not, because there's this perception that we had 140,000 people currently who have come to New York or in the city shelter system. That's not true. Um, we have about, I think, 65,000 people in the city shelter system right now, and not that are newcomers, um, and about, 20,000 families, and the 20,000 families equate to the vast majority of the 65,000 people. So these are families. These are people with children. These are people who actually have enrolled their kids in school and are looking for supports to get to their, to get for their kids so they can actually have a thriving educational environment here and be able to survive in this city. Um, <clears throat> The other piece is that adults are actually leaving rather quickly from the shelter system. They're not staying similarly to historically unhoused um, adults. They're actually staying for 30 to 45 days, and this is the city's data. So this is not Murad making up this number. The city has historically said this and has said this just as recent as this week that, you know, but that doesn't mean that just because people are leaving doesn't mean everyone's gonna leave in 30 to 45 days. People still need care. So the hurdles and the bureaucracy that they're putting in place of like, oh, you gotta reintake yourself. And then at the reintake, it's not a reintake. Here's a ticket to wherever you wanna go, get out of the city. That is not how you operate in a, in a city that has been built by this community. Um, it also pushes people into the street. And one of the first things the mayor did as mayor was create this, I'm not even giving my comments on it, but he launched this program to get people off the streets and into shelter. And he used the NYPD to do that, right? And was cleaning our subways of unhoused individuals. It was like the most preposterous effing idea. And now what he's doing is like, we're gonna offer people tents to sleep in the street. That is his next solution, by the way. So the action we did yesterday in front of his home at Gracie Mansion with African Communities Together and other members of ours was we did a sleep in in front of Gracie Mansion with over 150 asylum seekers and migrants and immigrants and they were not very happy with us. And I honestly don't give a, about people's feelings in this moment when we continuously treat our newcomers and our historical communities like shit. Um, so the issue here is also the city did not invest real resources in the infrastructure. So if we want to talk about infrastructure building or infrastructure uh, nurturing, the city has not done that. What they've done is they farmed this out to private companies to deal with the tents, to deal with the food, to deal with all these different things, um, which are incredibly costly. And we have provided the city with solutions that are incredibly cheap like instead of paying $394 uh, per household a night, um, they can give people 50 to $70 housing vouchers. And then everyone's gonna be like, there's no housing. There is housing, it's being hoarded. Um, let's bring everyone to the table to actually get these solutions moving forward. And that means working with people we don't like working with, like the developers and everyone else who's holding on to these apartments, trying to you know wait for a day that they can unregulate their apartments. But this is the thing, these are some of the things that we're, we're trying to illustrate here is that no one is really, I think the shelter, being able to have a bed is great, but that is literally the floor. It is literally beyond, under the floor. It's not even like, even the Herx and the respite centers have less safety standards and health standards. We can, we're gonna, we can, it's very enraging to think that this is the conversation that we're having these days, to be honest with you, and to see that this administration continues to go to court trying to undermine the right to shelter and gut it. And actually, they 
publicly say it's just for newcomers, but if you read what they're submitting, it's actually everyone. Yeah, and just on the bed note, um, most of the adults that are in the HERCs and respite systems don't have beds as much as camping cots with no mattresses. Um, I, I think I feel like I'm getting away from the original question now, but I wanted to like build on what many of you were talking about, just to point out that, um, well, I mean, th what this demonstrates is a simple lack of humanity, right? It's kind of what, what Sophie was speaking of is speaking of think if these mi uh, immigrants, migrants, human beings have been treated as political pawns by multiple politicians um, at multiple levels, and it. it it requires a much more humane approach to, to, but it's hard to get, I mean, my, my wager is that Adams, I think Adams is going to try to get more money by making the crisis more visible, kind of like what he did in the Roosevelt Hotel, such that it puts pressure on Biden so that you, coming up in the next 2024, there's a, the, the liberal city of New York has people sleeping in tents on the street and that might, get money flowing from Washington to solve a campaign problem. That's my sort of strategy guess. Um, but again, these folks are being used as pawns, right? The governor of Texas, Mayor Adams, Joe Biden, they're not being treated as humans. And I think that, that keeping that humanity at the forefront is, is critical. But unfortunately, our policy is not doing that. because I, I see that um, the onus is kind of being put on the actual people in the hotels. Uh, they, when they arrive to our offices, they don't know who their worker, they don't even know that there's anyone assigned to them. They, don't, they haven't talked to anyone in the hotel. They don't know any, it took them two hours, three hours to, to find us because they heard about an organization that speaks Spanish, you know, in Queens, they got like get lost in it. It seems like it, everything is kind of put on them. Uh, and they're out seeking help. They're just trying to figure it out. I've been invited to so many meetings with the city to find out what our experience has been, what we're doing, what we feel is needed, and, but I still don't see anything different being done. And uh, I've suggested over and over again, even directly to the uh, mayor's uh, deputy, is why don't we look at some of these culturally specific centers, community-based agencies in all the neighborhoods where the hotels are and, kind of, and reach out to us. Reach out to us and invite us in. Invite us, let us come in. Because I don't know what it is, why they won't let us in. It's, it's, it's what we could, I've offered healthcare, we've offered health screenings, we've offered um, our NYC, care, our insurance enrollments for them to get healthcare, free healthcare. And they just don't take us up on it. So um, I think they've just limited kind of their resource page. And I, I just don't know how they're working. It just doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. I just want to add something that uh, you said and is so true. The city has a problem with community-based organization. We, try to, we tried many times to help, to partner with the city for, to serve better the community. Right, but the problem is that they always they don't see the problem. I think that the 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 problem <laughs> they don't see the problem when we come to them and we ask them to the only um, shelter you can go in, but hotel we try. What I said is something that myself and my team we went inside hotel because shelter you cannot come in, and we just ask you know can we you know. How do you do to help, you know, the immigrants? Uh, or what services do you have? When you talk to them, they have everything. They have health insurance. They say they have, you know, a, 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 a list of legal resources, whatever, whatever. So when we want to have access to this, they say, oh, but the manager is not here. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, oh, but they always have a problem. And, and we're here to work together. But obviously, they don't want that. I know we're going to probably move on, but I just want to jump on this. I, I agree um, that community-based organizations should be able to partner with shelters and providers, but I also think that it's incredibly dangerous if we just allow anyone in, just being, it's a sensitive location. Yeah. So what we have offered the city is for them to actually do their own vetting to make sure that they're letting in people who, you know, they trust, who have, uh, you know, 
competent staff. There have been instances where nefarious actors have targeted some of these shelters. So I see the apprehension and don't think it's the worst thing. Like if I'm getting blocked, but everyone else is getting blocked, I'm okay with that. But if I'm getting blocked and not everyone else, then that's an issue, right? So I just want to point out, like there's a way that we could, that the city can engage with community-based partners to provide care and services um, that they choose not to do, which is the wrong thing. But on the instance of not letting people in, that's okay. Until they have a system that allows people who are, you know, competent in their in their roles to be there. Um, is this working? Um, thank you all for all of you know, your responses to the last question. I think actually this ties in well with our next question, more particularly um, Murad, you were saying about how we have a lot of houses, but they're just being hoarded. And then on the city's response, not listening to community organizations and all that. Um, so we wanted to ask, in what ways does New York City's socioeconomic and political infrastructures either facilitate or create obstacles for informal labor systems and care networks? I can, I can just very quickly, with my work with street vendors, you can't become a legal street vendor in the city um, because this, the city, you can't become a legal street vendor in the city because the city has a permit of 853. Um, limit that's been in place since 1979 to be a vendor of merchandise. And uh, they just lifted a cap, uh, which was good in 2021, uh, that had been in place unchanged for food vending since 1983. Um, and that cap, there's a long waiting list. So it's very hard to get into the food vending business legally uh, if you don't have a permit. So um, simply making it legal for people. I mean, that, again, we're talking about bare minimum stuff, right? We're not talking about giving people a yacht and you know sending them off in the Mediterranean. We're talking about giving them a permit to sell things so that they can support themselves without the risk of, of harassment from police. Um, so just from my own work, I mean, that's the first thing, is more and more barriers put up to basic livelihood things. Yeah, I would just jump in and say that the there's always this thing about cost that comes up and the funny part is, is that we this country has always money for war regardless like we will throw billions of dollars you know we were going to shut down the government recently because the supplemental 100 billion dollars for Ukraine and Israel supplemental war monies um, to support more lives being lost and to support you know the atrocities that we're seeing every day very quickly we will do that we will send more money to ship out american-made bombs to kill people um but actually helping people we don't do um and that's a bigger problem here because when it comes down to the the response at every level it ends up being like well who's going to pay for it and it's like the spider-man meme where three spider-mans are pointing at each other um, and it's like, well, this is a shared responsibility. Every level of government needs to step up. Um, and we also need to think about solutions and the way in which our solutions are always cheaper than whatever government does, by the way. So like the, the, um, the immigrant and refugee community in the state of New York across the entire state contributes $60 billion in tax revenue. We do not receive $60 billion in uh, you know, services or care or anything. So when people are talking about, well, this is a, this is a drain on our, on our city or it's a drain, it's not. This community has and will continue to support and underwrite an enormous amount of services that they don't, they, they don't even access to and will not. Um, so I think for this, the specific things, like even the housing voucher idea, right? That is the, like, the, it makes no sense why they're not doing it. Like every time we talk to them about it, it's always, there's a reason why. And it's like, you're looking for a no instead of looking for how we get there. And that's across the board. So the street vendor stuff, even the people who have the 800 and whatever licenses, they're not even in New York anymore. These are people who are living in Florida, renting them out to people here in New York. So the city's not even getting that income back, right? So even when the, the way in which they think about things, right? Instead of saying, okay, well, this license shouldn't be 
held by someone who lives in Florida and is renting it out to New Yorkers. It should be for a New Yorker who's living here and going to be contributing back into society, even the way in which that they're spending. When we, we keep talking about like cost and like care and un, no care, the city does not care about the city. We could have invested $4 billion that they've allegedly spent on reinvesting those resources in New York City and in New York State to actually hire people to do the work that needs to get done. But that seems too much of a stretch for this administration to think a tiny bit creatively. I also want to note that it is much cheaper for the city to provide and the state to provide rental subsidies, which we call vouchers, housing vouchers, than it is to pay the cost to house people in shelter. It's significantly more expensive to pay the cost to house people in shelter. But for whatever reason, the money, the city seems to prefer to pay more money. Thank you so much. And, and thinking about that, we wanted to ask you about the challenges that community organizations and newly arrived immigrants face uh, when interacting with government, and you have been talking a little bit about it, so maybe you can uh, explain more about that. But before going into that, we wanted to ask you, how can communities, academia, and non-profit organizations collaborate to shift the current crisis-focused narrative into a debate on fortifying existing support networks for newly arrived immigrants? Okay, um, I think the first thing they should do is bring organization to the table, right? Should listen to us a little bit more, you agree, right? Okay. <laughs> and we definitely have to find, and Morad say it, like long-term solution. They love to call everything crisis, so we have to find a solution right away for, you know, one situation, but can they think about like long-term solution and not temporary, you know, solution? I think is something they should think about. And definitely, you know, I said that at the beginning and I I'm agree with, you know, my colleague here and Murad, when I saw Sophia, no, they, we need data, yeah, because we work on the ground, so we don't, we have to give you know, we have to work on data because obviously if we want more funds, we need to explain why and have those data. Um, so they need to allocate more, more funds for, you know, for, for this situation. That's, you know, how can we, you know, do if we don't have more our lawyer? How, how can we do if we don't have more social worker? If we don't have, you know, enough organizers, so we need, they, they need to allocate more funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that a couple of things that, so we that on the ground need to partner with those bigger, more, you know, influencer, influential organizations, like for example, we're partners and members of Hispanic Federation, and that's a huge national agency that support and is doing an amazing job of getting, I think their goal was 3,000, Per applications for work that was completed, and they asked volunteers, they asked uh, CBOs, they asked just to just to get trained. Like I think it was like a two-hour training, and then um, they had they not just for the applications, but also people who, who could get coffee, who could get copies, who could like this was a massive effort, and and we were part of that. And I think that we have to be able to partner with those much bigger agencies or institutions that are doing the, the bigger, I guess, the macro work, and, the, and we're doing the, the, the groundwork. Um, so I think those are, those are really important. And that led us to change our day-to-day, our -day is making sure that everyone in our agency knows how to do and complete those applications. That is what got us to, we were like, this is, this is not hard, we could do this. And that's making a difference. So um, that, that's, those are the, I think we just need those critical partnerships. The other thing I want to say is that I think our funders, like we've had government multi-year funders that haven't changed anything on our budgets since this situation, knowing that we're seeing this 
this this traffic of migrants coming in our door day to day, knowing that we're in our HIV positive in our HIV contracts, many are coming living with HIV, but just not connected to treatment or medication. So we're doing that. I think 70% of our clients in our um, undetectables program are the recent migrants, but yet nothing's changed in our contract is in our conscious in terms of our budgeting and allocating funds. So I think that funders also have to look at the, this, it's, New York City's different now. Like we're on the ground, we need to have a little bit more flexibility or maybe a little bit added more funding because things are changed, things are not the same. Um, I'll say too, I mean, you asked like what we can do is, uh, um, and I wanna kind of speak to the, the, I know there's lots of master students in planning uh, in the room here and thinking about the role that one can play as, as a planner, as a professional, um, whether in specifically inside city government. Because one thing that I found, I mean, I did a lot of work over the summer at Corona Plaza and, and understanding what was happening there in that space, and um, which is an informal vendor market that grew up around uh, a, a small plaza in, in uh, Corona, Queens. Um, and what was really fascinating in the story of how that space was built and ultimately it's been dismantled um, by the mayor and, and Moya, um, the local council person, um, is that it was really critical within, there were moments within the bureaucracy where there were individuals who were willing to be flexible about how they managed that space, about every person that I spoke to with the vendors and vendor advocates, they would mention the same few names within the Department of Transportation or within small business services who were forces for the, for the amplification of, and, uh, of, of forces for justice willing to work at the edge of rules, right? Work and be creative. And I think a lot of what we've, what we've heard here today from folks who are working outside of the city as advocates is how much of a bureaucratic brick wall it can feel like sometimes dealing with the city. Um, and that often is the case. But what's inspiring to me is those moments where you find people and individuals who are willing to think creatively and flexibly about that, about certain situations. And that's a very micro level suggestion. I mean, we're really talking again, not at the big level of more funding, which is absolutely necessary, but what can individuals do? Um, and I think there is a role as, as planners, as, as public administrators to, to have that ethic of being willing to work creatively and flexibly um, on the behalf of social justice aims for communities that have a hard time advocating themselves for themselves in a formal way. Yeah, I would add um, that poverty is a policy choice. And you heard that right. So like people being in poverty and people continuing to be in poverty is a policy choice. And in whatever role you end up taking, because I know a lot of planners, some who work at our organization who are not doing any planning. Um, but if you are going into planning or if you are going into any official role <clears throat> within government, um, always thinking about how are you actually trying to address root cause issues. Um, and I think that's a piece that's missing in general in this moment. And I think for students taking action whenever you can, um, being able to not add to the course, but actually be part of the solution. Like, don't just make noise to make noise sometimes. Like, what are the solutions you're pushing for? How are you able to center those who are most impacted so that you're leading from a place that they are the ones who are giving you direction and what they need to survive and thrive? Um, and being able to think differently about the moments that we live in. Um, there's probably, I probably, when I took this job as executive director, it was about three years ago. Um, and for me, it was more so like I came in with my own plan of like things I wanted to do to help change the organization. Um, and I got to work on it, right? And for a year, I was on track and then things just went in a completely other direction. Um, and we're doing things that I thought we would never be doing um, in this moment. And um, that's also okay, because sometimes we have to be flexible enough and agile enough to shift as individuals, but also as institutions. Um, and always try to find, try to make sure you're always on the right side of history. Like you don't wanna look back and be like, damn, I fucked up there. Um, but you know, we're, we're living through some really hard times right now. 
And, you know, here abroad, like, there's just a lot of challenges. And the way in which you raise your voice really matters in this moment. So uh, just make sure you're always on the side of the, those who are um, being oppressed and helping uplift their pain and their suffering because sometimes it's really horrible that we have to prove to people that other communities are human and that they deserve humanity. Um, and don't let your voices get shut down because you know it's not the cool thing to do in the moment. Um, because the way in which in US history, student movements have really led the way for a lot of change that we've seen. So I'll stop there. Okay, well, thank you so much for answering to those questions that we had prepared. Um, in the interest of time, we would like to open now the, the floor for questions from the audience. So, Hello, oh, my name is Jean. Thanks again for your time, y'all are amazing. Um, so I, this seems like we're all kind of frustrated and we have this like cognitive dissonance with the people that should be representing us and, and we're advocating very clearly and vocally make these changes, we need funding, we need some action, we, these people need housing today, and also some long-term solutions. Um, but these people that, I don't know, have power, I guess, to not fund you or, or to do certain things, I guess what are the most, for even people who are not academics or academics, um, what are some actionable steps that we can take today for both short-term and long-term solutions? Is, it, is the best thing to participate in these student-led um, activist movements to make change and just having the conversation? Is there any other suggestions you may have for like um, being able to like push for, for positive change? That's a great question and I'll try to take a stab at it and probably not do it the justice it deserves but there's a number of different ways that you all in your individual capacity, in your student capacity, in every capacity that you show up in the world to take action, right? Um, while we were complaining most of the time, we did win some shit last year and this year. So I do think that even through the challenging times that we've been living through, we've been able to secure over $800 million from the federal level to support receiving communities. We've been able to deliver a billion dollars from the state to support New York City and their mismanagement of money. Um, and that was a joke, but it's true. We did deliver the billion dollars. Um, you know, we did quadruple legal service funding. We did uh, fight back austerity measures at the city level and get an investment in undocumented uh, childcare. So we are doing things, we are winning. So I wouldn't say don't, this isn't doom and gloom. Um, you just gotta be strategic, right? And know who your targets are. Um, and in every fight that you're doing, legislative, policy, organizing, you always have to do a political analysis, right? And you have to know where can you, where is the impact you can make be impactful in the, in the larger piece. So you can organize among students, you can organize with community organizations. We're always looking for volunteers to support the work we're doing. I think every organization up here is. Um, there is ways that you can, you know, we also try to sh send volunteers to our members. So like if you live in Washington Heights, Washington Heights has a ton of amazing organizations that I would want to volunteer for if I lived in Washington Heights who are doing amazing work on the ground and organizing. Um, but it does, it's frustrating. And organizing has always been uh, a long game, not a short one. Um, and number one rule in organizing is you have no permanent enemies or permanent allies. Um, and that's an important thing to remember, especially when you're doing work like this, because someone who is championing our community to win an election turned out to be a mini Trump in office. So I think you always have to keep that at the top of mind because elected officials, people infantilize them. It's like weird. Um, and it's like, no, they are there to serve our best interests. Um, so you can organize at the community level, the political level, organize people out of office as well. That's another option. Uh, there's a bunch of political organizations that you can join that you feel most aligned with. Um, but you have the power. And at the end of the day, I think that, I don't know how old anyone is in here, and I'm not trying to be ageist, but I think this is the, the generation that's gonna be the generation that changes the course of this country's history. So y'all have the power. So start taking it up now to do it. 
Hi, my name is Lily Mirsapasi, um, and I'm here from the School of International and Public Affairs, hoping to work in public policy for immigration, specifically refugee and asylum seekers. You mentioned earlier that um, that poverty is a policy issue, and I'm wondering, as hopefully someone that works in policy, what kind of policy reform do you think would best help those that need it most? Well, I would just say, no, I mean, she was asking you the question, but I also want to say that the, the amount of public assistance, the public assistance levels and the SSI, the disability levels are so low that no one can ever get out of po poverty. There's no money to save. And that is a conscious choice. And that is on purpose. And it is a punishment. And if public assistance was not viewed as punishment, but actually viewed as help or universal basic income, then it doesn't need to be the case, and that would be, I think, the first step. But. The other is making sure that there's no exclusions, right? So the reason why uh, most community members don't have access to some of these benefits is because they're excluded. And the exclusion can be uh, they're not poor enough, or they don't have status, or you know they happen to live in not a zip code that should be getting it. So I think when we're talking about benefits, we're talking about, like even to your example, the city's not even processing applicate. I think it's 39% of uh, cash assistance and 40 whatever percent on time. That's insane. Right before this administration came in, it was being processed not quick enough, but quick in comparison um, at like a 90% rate. So when we're talking about policy choices, every single thing that, every piece of legislation that gets passed has a financial or fiscal impact down the road. So how is that actually impacting people who need the help most? So if we take care of our most vulnerable and marginalized, then everyone else lifts up with them. So that is the, the, the choices that we're making. So instead of trying to figure out who's excluded, and instead of throwing wrenches into systems that need more support to actually function better, um, making sure that if you're in those positions that you're actually pushing forward um, the most expansive as opposed to the most limited, which is the purview the government currently takes. Also, the child tax credit is a good example of like reducing child poverty by 50% and then not having the courage to get it back is crazy. Apologize for if I missed this, but um, we're looking at a migrant crisis. Um, all of us are thinking the re recent arrivals but the migrant crisis started years ago, and there's over five, there's over 500,000 um, families who have citizen spouses or wives who still cannot get documents. How are we dealing with that? What is our, what is our, what, what are we doing? You don't have to answer. I can answer real quick, but I feel like really guilty of answering all these questions, um, and I'm taking up too much space. So please ask questions of my amazing panelists here. There's, you know this, Robbie, better than anyone else. We've been fighting for immigration reform for over 30 years and coming up short. And again, this goes back to one of the first things I said in this space. The root cause of a lot of our issues is white supremacy. And I'm going to keep saying that because I think people get uncomfortable when you say it, but we have to sit in that uncomfortableness. Um, the only reason why we've had different iterations of immigration into this country is because of workforce needs. That is it. In 1986 and 87, when amnesty happened under Reagan, yes, President Reagan, where about two million people were able to legalize in this country, um, it was done out of a necessity for workforce. It was not family values, it was not to help people. Um, we need an, an entire overhaul of our immigration system. Right now, the closer, the, your closeness to whiteness actually gets you into this country quicker. And that has historically been the case. We have the Chinese Exclusionary Act, right? Like this, these are not far-fetched things. Just a couple of years ago, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, was trying to ban Muslims from coming in and ended up being successful in that, despite however many systems in place we have in, uh, to block discriminatory policy. Um, 
So what we need is a complete overhaul of the system, actually making it a fair, equitable, and just system. And not just for folks coming into the country, but for the people who have been undocumented in this country for decades. Um, and we've had over 11 million people who've been in, undocumented in the US. And that number is going to continue to increase if we don't have solutions. So the, the, the issue you're talking about is actually fighting with the Biden administration right now on removing that, that exclusion so that we can get that done. Um, and allegedly there's a policy change rule that's gonna be coming out soon, so get ready to give a comment. But hopefully that that's something that can get done uh, because that will help, I think, three to four million people actually get status in, uh, in this country. Um, do we want to collect maybe like two or three questions at once and then maybe try to answer them at once? Hi, um, amazing group of folks doing amazing work. Thank you so much. Um, my question is around the uh, community-based for-profit immigration businesses that you see all over the Bronx, Washington Heights, Queens, Brooklyn. Um, they usually function as multi-services of all kinds, offering, for example, like tax preparation services, divorces, but um, a huge portion of these organizations' income is actually, uh, you know, like based on immigration services. And I'm wondering how you all see um, the role of these organizations um, or businesses, if we, can, if we can call them that. Are they, and of course they largely deal with uh, quote unquote legal um, immigration services where they're processing applications, et cetera. But I'm wondering, um, given that you guys work in providing infrastructure to organizations, et cetera, I'm just wondering if there's a way, given like these folks coverage, right? Like in the outer boroughs, et cetera, is there a role for these folks to play? Like, are they playing a role? Um, again, I just want to emphasize the impact that these folks have in like their local organization in their, their local um, geographic areas. Okay, I'm gonna try to answer this question because I work for many years as a tax preparer to a, a, in a business, it's not an organization, a small business, a small business. And they were helping African immigrants to fill out application, um, you know, like um, for, you know, the immigration, you know, process. We need to be very careful with that. We need to be very, very, very careful with that, even with the tax preparation. And I'm talking again not about, the, about organization. I'm talking about small businesses who try to play a role of um, a lawyer, because they call themselves lawyer and they're not lawyer. They're not even paralegal. They just know and know how to read and write English and speak those different languages that we have in Africa. So they're taking advantage of our people. So when they're coming to us, we say to our people, don't go there. <laughs> you have, you know, organization who knows what they're doing. You have lawyer, you have paralegal, and that's where you have to go because that's very dangerous. And they can mess up all application. They can even tax preparation. You know, why I came through tax preparation is because someone messed up my application, my, my taxes, and I have to pay for many, many years just because they didn't know what they're doing. So they don't have no role to play, just continue to make copies and to find maybe resources for the community or to have a certificate, go back to school to be able to, you know, to help people. 
So we need to be careful when we talk about small businesses and organization. Yeah. I, I do think, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, you go. no, I just wanted to add to exactly, because I think in, in the Latino culture, el notario, you know, el notario, like the notary, it means something very different in, in our countries than it does here. I mean, I was just in a notario in Iquitos, Peru, last week, and I was like interviewing them because it's amazing how our different the role is. But in our countries, it's a, it's it's legal representation. They're lawyers, you know, and so when they come to Queens and or whatever, the notaries here, they think it's the same thing, and people like prey on that, and it's so sad. And people have been charged thousands that they don't have. For the for just to get some legal services that they could get somewhere else from someone that is not even a legal representative. So I we do the same thing. We tell them very carefully, and they have, that's part of knowing their rights too and knowing where to go. I think this just gets to the broader issue of again, well, just to speak of the fact that there, there are so many challenges that that immigrants migrants face. Um, and it it speaks to the role of organizations that are not businesses, right? To 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 get more funding so that they can be those spaces where newcomers can feel that they are their needs are being met because of a of of, of a goal of of meeting those needs rather than profit. And I mean, I you know, working with vendors, you see a lot of same thing where there are there are. I mean, it's a it's a it's like a video game where there's different things you have to avoid, you know, on every step, right? There are people on every step and every every step of the way that from the from the people getting you across the border to um, to folks in Queens uh, who might um, sell you a vending license or even the the, the people who are selling their their app. Um, you know, there's plenty of stories of people who have bought uh, someone's like seamless app thing so they can be a delivery person, and then all the money goes to the person who, who, who was renting this their profile to that person. So, you know, having structures in place so that people don't have to rely on entities that are just there to take advantage of them is is important. Um, <clears throat> Thank you so much for um, sharing. Um, some of your really amazing insights. Um, I have noticed that the topic of like law enforcement has like come up um, frequently, like in this panel. And I know that the um, that the NYC like government invests a lot into NYPD and forms of surveillance. Um, recently, um, Mayor Adams um, really like announced like publicly just like announced like um, his strong like alliance with like Zionism. So I guess I'm wondering, first of all, what do your current experiences look like with law enforcement? Because they're, it's a really strong presence within the city. And then uh, second of all, I know there have been renewed surges of like divestment from like law enforcement led by like prison abolitionist movements throughout the city. Um, and I feel like that's like surging up again recently as well. So I was wondering what my divestment from that look like um, for like all these organizations and communities you're working with. Um, yeah. I can speak to my clients' experiences with law enforcement, which are obviously not positive. And I work with a lot of people who sleep outside, recent immigrants who sleep outside, and, and they are very afraid of the police, and they have every reason to be. Um, as opposed, and I think that, you know, we were talking about what is their money for. There's plenty of money for the police to harass our clients. But divestment, when you say divestment, do you mean like organizations monetarily? I really don't want to talk, but um, the one good thing about this budget modification that the city just issued is that they're cutting the NYPD budget, um, not very hugely, but slightly. Um, and I think that sometimes when every administration has had a chance of actually rejiggering our priorities and investing in our care as opposed to like carceral systems across the board, that's not happened, right? So even if we talk about the city level, the city just renegotiated uh, the labor contract with the PBA, 
which represents all the uniformed police officers. Well, not all of them, but the ones who are like the lowest rank ones. Um, and they got one of the largest labor contracts negotiated in support of them. So they got like 35, 40% raises over the next iteration of their, but with the cuts that he just announced while we're fighting against them, we're gonna continue fighting against them. I don't think anyone wants to fight for that one. Um, to come back, they're canceling NYPD classes. This is the first time the NYPD's police force is gonna be under 30,000 uh, individuals. He's using it as another wedge to divide our communities and saying, oh, you're not safe because you know we haven't been safe. And because of this crisis, you know, we're cutting NYPD too. So he's literally, I'm not even gonna keep talking shit about him because he's just shit. But um, every level of government has its own responsibility. Even when we're talking about the state, we've been fighting for the state to stop collaborating with ICE and uh, Border Patrol because there's no need for that, right? Like why is the state utilizing state resources and putting our community's lives on the line? Um, to call ICE and CBP to be their translators in other parts of the city, uh, other parts of the state. At the federal level, we continue to see more militarization of our southern border, and this is where, like, internationally, like, what we're what we're experimenting with and what our foreign aid and military aid goes to is being experimented elsewhere to have down here, right? So all these fights for justice are all interlinked. And when we talk about them, it kind of seems like really insane that we were, that this president and this Congress and this Senate were willing to gut asylum, willing to gut asylum just two, three days ago so that we can send $100 billion for more war in the CR. So like we're talking about, I know it sounds like a stretch for people who are just hearing this and they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. A lot of stuff does not make sense. Um, and that's the point is that we, if we're aware and if we stay ready, we don't have to get ready when we have to fight back. And there's every day there's moments where you guys can take action and it's simple as like calling your electeds and letting them know. Like this is one moment where I don't think any elected has ever thought that they would get the amount of engagement from their constituents in history that they're shocked. So keep it up and keep calling whoever you need to call to push back against these policies and the divestments you're looking for. Hi, I have a question. Um, I'm sure this has been a great panel, but I'm sure all of you are frustrated with the news coverage about the situation going on with migrants. I find that a lot of the news has been about a community is pushing back to having migrant shelters in them, you know, like in the Hudson Valley or in Staten Island. But I'm wondering if you could tell us about examples where uh, longer term New Yorkers are meeting new migrants and actually getting to know them, because it seems like a lot of the coverage is about them. There's not a lot of coverage about people actually getting to know their new neighbors and meeting them um, as a person to person way. I mean, I one of the places that I intake clients is at a church that's a new immigrant welcome center, and it's entirely a volunteer run effort. And you have people coming in every day who are working tirelessly, cooking with people and helping them fill out applications for benefits and helping them appeal their denials and looking for immigration attorneys for them. And I do think that the people who come in there and meet the clients and sort of like work with the impacted communities are really changed. And you know, when we're talking about how are we gonna change the narrative, it, I think it's great, a call to action is amazing and I think we should do that, but I think working with the impacted communities, like going there, like not necessarily a political action, but an action in making soup or making relationships is what we really need. There are many, many people that are providing aid to, to new immigrants and to people who need aid generally and that's not in the news. But that is what's happening, and I think that that is, in some ways, how people are able to get by because of the people helping them. So, and Jackson Heights has a lot of people welcoming people that are that are welcoming our migrants. We have um, we've partnered with just residents that are retired lawyers, immigration lawyers that are holding free legal clinics in like basements of houses, and then we're going in and volunteering and learning from them. And we're going in also providing our workforce development training. So these are just people that are retired but want to help, want to help their community. So we do have like those pockets, which is, I think that's what also makes, it helps me to just continue 
and continue to love what I do because we know, I know we're not alone in this with so many other horrible things going on in the city, but there are so many good people. Yeah, definitely. And we have also, um, you know, like um, uh, people who help, like uh, they said, um, just helping, you know, feeding them. We have one example, I don't know if you remember, guys, about the Bushwick um, commercial center, commercial, commercial building. They call that a shelter, but it was no bathroom, no shower, no nothing inside. And you had the community who had a cooperative, you know, a, a farm just across the street. And they start, you know, getting together and they did the work that the city is supposed to do. Uh, you know, help them, you know, at least to shower, help them. So they had a, a, a pool not too far and they negotiate with the with them to see if they can go and take shower, you know, over there. They were cooking for them. Like, it's incredible. You have people who help them. We have people every day who's coming uh, with, you know, someone they just meet at the street because they were you know, are looking inside the garbage and they say, oh, I tried to talk to him but we don't, because we don't speak the same language and, oh, I just Google and I see your name, you know, and how can I help? How can we help? You have volunteers who from Europe, you know, from different countries who are here and, you know, help, you know, the, 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 the uh, immigrants. So we have that, but we don't talk about them on the news. News prefers to get people, and it's very frustrating because there's so much good happening. Yeah, and from the onset of this, it's like ordinary New Yorkers who stepped up to support people from the busing situation, to helping people navigate, to helping direct people to intake facilities to make sure that they're getting to where they need to go. And historically, New York State as a whole has been a welcoming state, right? Um, the, the refugee resettlement program that was launched back when actually is what brought back upstate cities and communities. Um, Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, uh, Ithaca, the capital region, Albany, Schenectady, like these have become welcoming areas. And if you look at this, when Mayor Adams decided to be um, Governor Abbott and randomly bus people to other parts, he kind of got the reaction I think he was looking for, right? And it's like, I can't do this on my own. I'm single-handedly dealing with this. I need to make it everyone else's problem. Um, but what he was doing was actually incredibly horrible for the movement that was being built in upstate New York. So welcoming communities are still welcoming folks. It's, it's still harder now in certain parts of the state. Um, there are over 30 executive orders or um, pieces of legislation that were put in place to ban um, emergency shelter for non-residents of their counties. Um, those have since expired. But uh, I think there are a ton of stories of what you're asking about happening every single day. Um, and, you know, the media is just the media and they want what's sensational and they want what's hot and sexy for the second that they're dealing with things. And... If I can add, if, if we can stop bringing problem all the time, like talking about something, it's always a problem, you know, we need to stop that. Can we, if we think about, like, okay, we're talking about human being, you're talking about someone who's you, like, look like you, you they have, you know, blood in their vein, they're you, then you're going to start helping people. But the thing is, we always think about a problem. So we need to have to solve a problem at this moment, but they don't think about, you know, the long-term solution. And, and it's not all the time a problem, you know? Like, we have neighbor, I don't know, I live in Harlem on 116, and I, in my building, I have someone from Russia, I have someone from Senegal, I have someone from Italy. I have, like, come on, this is New York City, right? So it's not, nothing new, but it's just because... They see us as a problem because uh, they, they make us a problem. And um, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. So I would like a round of applause for our very informative. <laughs> Hello, 
everyone. Thank you for being here today. This panel today is going to be on the housing question and the right to shelter. Um, we're going to have a very similar setup to the previous panels, um, where we'll just start with introductions, um, and then we'll allow our panelists to talk a little bit more about their work. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Christian Siener. I'm a term assistant professor of urban studies um, in the Barnard Columbia Urban Studies program. Um, I'm a geographer, and my research is in political economy and the carceral state with a focus on um, the history and political geographies of New York City's homeless shelter system. Hi, I'm, I'm Josh Goldfein. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society's Homeless Rights Project. I use uh, he, him pronouns. I am, um, I've been in that uh, office since uh, 1998. Uh, we are counsel to Coalition for the Homeless who are the plaintiffs in the right to shelter cases. So um, when people talk about the right to shelter, um, those that derives from lawsuits in which we are the lawyers. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you today? Um, my name is Amir Kafaji. I'm a reporter with Document in New York. We focus on immigrant communities in New York City, and we've been covering extensively the so-called migrant crisis. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Sara. Tengo 18 años. Soy inmigrante y activista y vivo en un shelter. Her name is Sara. She is Venezuelan. She's 18 years old. She's an immigrant, and she currently lives in a shelter. <laughs> thank you all. So, thank you all so much. I would like to start with the first question. What is the landscape? Yeah, so thank you for those introductions. Um, we're just going to get into it. Um, each of the panelists will have about 10 minutes to um, talk about their work, um, and then we'll follow up with Q&A. Oh, so sorry. You have the mic there. Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you to all the organizers, um, Hiba, Hugo. Um, all the student organizers for having us, all the panelists for today, um, especially those taking out um, time from their really busy schedules doing work on the ground um, to be here during a stressful time. I've really enjoyed listening to all the panels. Um, thank you to my co-panelists. I'm really looking forward to our discussion um, today. Given our theme, the housing question and the right to shelter, I wanted to give a few thoughts on this crucial moment, the overlapping of the right to shelter with asylum seekers entering New York City, and then relate these ideas um, back to the right to the city, which is um, in the title of today's event. Um, these ideas build on a collaboration I'm doing with a colleague at Montclair State University, sociologist Stephen Ruschik, who specializes in immigration with a focus on undocumented youth in New York City and Paris. Each resident shall receive a bed of a minimum of 30 inches in width, substantially constructed, in good repair, and equipped with clean springs. Each bed shall be equipped with a clean, comfortable, well-constructed mattress, standard in size for the bed, and a clean, comfortable pillow of average size. In single occupancy sleeping rooms, a minimum of 80 square feet per resident shall be provided. In sleeping rooms for two or more residents, a minimum of 60 square feet per resident shall be provided. A minimum of three feet, which is included in the per resident minima, shall be maintained between beds and for aisles. These are a few of the specifications that constitute the right in New York City's right to shelter. They are inscribed in the Callahan Consent Decree of 1981, an applicable quote to each homeless man who by reason to physical, mental, or social dysfunction is in need of temporary shelter, end quote. They reduce problems of human relationships to material conditions, and they turn shelter into an instrument. They hardly account for the home that should be the corrective to homeless. Over the past 40 years since the decree codified these stipulations, 
the homeless shelter has become a pivotal tool in New York City's arsenal of urban governance. Managing the shortcomings of a private housing market by containing people in minimal shelter. The homeless shelter has become a flexible institution that names and manages myriad overlapping social problems. It does material work, keeping people off the street, as well as ideological work. Rescaling structural problems to the individual. These aspects of sheltering demonstrate that the homeless shelter system is the local scale of the carceral state which geographer and abolitionist Ruth Wilson Gilmore defines as, quote, an anti-state state built on prison foundations. And I was very struck by um, Cynthia Santos Briones' presentation earlier today in which she showed children's art um, and, and how much um, detention centers were a part of those youth experiences. And I think it makes sense to, think about the current moment in terms of, um, as a part of that continuum. With respect to housing, this doesn't, with respect to the anti-state state in terms of housing, this doesn't mean that the state is absent from the structuring of housing markets, but that its purported involvement is minimal. In fact, almost all housing in the United States receives some sort of public subsidy. Still, at all scales, the state has retracted from the provision of housing and relied solely on transitory supply-side market incentives to instigate construction by underwriting a profit-making motive. Unfortunately, most housing plans being discussed widely now fall into this logic and will reproduce the same unequal housing conditions. Intersecting layers of housing crisis are evident following decades of disinvestment and beyond the thousands of homeless individuals, both in shelter and who reject shelter. Unaffordable rents across the board, historic numbers of New York City public school students doubled up or in temporary housing, gentrification caused displacement, increasing numbers of evictions, unstable housing for our elderly, and most recently, asylum seekers who are learning the limits of the right to shelter. These crises become intractable in a political environment where any resources dedicated to long-term housing stability are necessarily seen as a draw on emergency resources put toward immediate needs. Indeed, the right to shelter was supposed to support temporary accommodation. It does the reverse. It has become the permanent solution to ongoing displacement. It illustrates that housing policy is separate from ho homeless policy, under the presumption that the two issues, housing and homelessness, are unrelated. This disconnect is what makes it so difficult for people to move out of temporary housing once they are in it. Moreover, in the context of a right to shelter, the response of New York City officials to asylum seekers is contradictory. If there was ever a justified time for emergency shelter, wouldn't it be now? Why has this emergency called into question emergency shelter? Why hasn't prolonged gentrification and displacement done the same? Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams' attempt to weaken the right to shelter is only the latest by New York administrations to undo the stipulation that anyone who asks for it can get a cot with a roof over it. The difference is that this time, it's gaining traction. They have represented the right to shelter as an obstacle that complicates both a reasonably functioning shelter system as well as their ability to help asylum seekers. The mayor is continually marshaled opposition to asylum seekers through austerity and yesterday unveiled plans to cut all agency budgets to pay the cost of emergency sh shelter. Similarly, news stories depict people living long-term in shelters as victims of the asylum seeker influx. Their narrative is that New York's homeless have been marginalized to make space for others who are groundlessly overtaxing a dedicated resource. But we must not lose sight of the fact that the right to shelter is limiting and not what anyone would propose for fellow human beings. In short, the shelter system has run into its own contradictions as broken immigration policy and broken housing policy collide. 
This is the context for asylum seekers seeking, uh, asylum seekers entering New York City right now, which is why it appears that the homeless shelter has finally met its match. We believe that with the legitimacy of the homeless shelter in question, we have an opportunity to think beyond it to imagine a more just and equitable housing system. We join a growing consensus that declaring a right to housing is the most sensible step toward a more just housing system. Now is the time to push for a universal right to housing, as upheld by organizers and activists in cities around the world and theorized by scholars such as Peter Marcuse, David Madden, Chester Hartman, and many others. As a guiding principle, a right to housing nourishes multiple housing models and tenures, enshrines democratic governance of housing, and recognizes work that organizers and housing movements do on the ground. A right to housing provides for developing concrete means to achieve the right to the city. It is a foundation on which future housing policy, finance, and construction should be built. These models should include decommodifying housing, protecting public housing and rent control, inventing new financing mechanisms, promoting democratic control of policy and management, and building solidarities across borders. Housing movements in New York have played a leading role in enacting tenant protections, building public housing, creating cooperatives, and securing stabilized rents. We can also play a key role in taking the next step, implementing and supporting concrete plans that activate the right to housing. Clearly, the right to shelter is not robust enough to address the entrenched shortcomings and inequalities of housing today. It is an insufficient right because it seamlessly gels with profit making, it supports housing as a mode of exchange, and it has been manipulated toward containment. A right to housing more effectively articulates a value of housing that prioritizes its use and works toward its socialization. <clears throat> While not a silver bullet, it attempts to substantiate universal access to one of our most central needs, housing, not just for material survival, but as a means of collectively living together, gathering our creative, cooperative energy, and providing for one another. Universal housing is not a resource issue, but a political one. It protects against the caprices of an unequal and unreliable real estate market, and as Madden and Marcuse note, quote, necessarily implies fundamental challenges to the existing system. We need to expand access and promote solidarities around housing rather than use housing policy to create divisions. We have an opening to transform housing inequality in New York. However, we must prioritize people's freedom to make homes rather than housing's ability to make profits. Proposals for a path forward must center the practice of a right to housing. Thank you. That's a, that's a really excellent way to start this program because certainly the right to housing would solve so many of the problems that we're talking about. Um, I'm just a lawyer, so I just have the tools available to me. I will say that we almost had a right to housing uh, uh, effectively um, in the uh, past, uh, ready to pass through Congress, and, and one person said no, and that was Joe Manchin. So that's, um, that's, that is uh, unfortunately how our government works. So, um, but wh why do we have a right to shelter? Uh, the reason that in New York City we have a right to shelter um, is because of a court case. It's because uh, in 1979, um, a young lawyer named Bob Hayes uh, brought a case on behalf of a group of men um, who lived on the streets around uh, his apartment uh, on the Bowery um, and who he met at a local soup kitchen where he volunteered. And he brought that case uh, claiming that under the New York State Constitution, that the state was required to provide them with shelter and not leave them out in the streets exposed to the elements um, you know, at risk of injury or death. And the reason that the, uh, the language that he cited in bringing that case was, in, in the, was put in the New York State Constitution in 1938. And it says that the state is required to provide aid and care to the needy. And in 1938, that was a very specific reference to the fact that there were tens of thousands of people living on the streets because of the depression. Uh, New York had just experienced that. There were people living in Central Park. Um, there, were, uh, there was mass homelessness in a way that had not been seen in a long time. And the legislators were very conscious of that. And they had a constitutional convention. And they included this language in the, in the, in the state constitution. And so uh, Bob said, you know, th this is what it means. It means that people should not be sleeping on the street. And he brought that case. 
And a judge, um, uh, the city immediately and the state said, you know, this is ridiculous. We shouldn't even have to, to, um, to litigate this case. And the court said, you know, no, I'm not going to say that this case should just be dismissed outright. We should actually have a trial on this case. So facing a trial, the city then agreed that there would be a right to shelter. They would create, they, they agreed that in perpetuity they were obligated to provide shelter to people. And that was a, a not very long document uh, that was negotiated between the parties. Um, it was signed by the city and the state and the plaintiffs, um, including the Coalition for the Homeless, uh, is, uh, who is our client. Um, and you heard some language from that uh, decree, which uh, you know refers specifically to you know what the beds are supposed to look like and how far apart they are and that kind of thing. Uh, but really, the heart of the decree it says that people are entitled to shelter if they don't have a place to go. That really, to us, is what the right to shelter means. There's a lot of other. Um, uh, there are state regulations now. There are local laws that were passed by the New York City Council. We have other settlements and other cases that that talk about what is required. Uh, what is the city required to provide to people? But most importantly is that in that Callahan consent decree, it says uh, that anyone who needs a bed is entitled to get a bed. And that has endured since 1981 when that agreement was signed. Um, it is what is the reason that New York does not look like other large cities. Um, if you've been to other cities in, in the United States, if you've been to Portland, if you've been to San Francisco, Los Angeles, Sacramento, Denver, Chicago, uh, other places, even Boston now, um, places that you go, you will see lots of people sleeping outside in tents. Um, and we don't have that in the same way in New York because we have the shelter system that shelters tens of thousands of people every night. And we uh, assumed always that the city would have to operate that in a way that provided people access to permanent housing because otherwise the shelter system would just continue to grow um, if you can't move people out. And if you don't invest also in keeping people in their homes so that they don't have to come into the shelter system in the first place. And the city does make efforts to do that. Um, we think they're inadequate. Um, and uh, at one point during the Bloomberg administration, they even experimented with, well, maybe people are coming to shelter in order to get access to those housing options. So what if we stop giving people access to housing from shelter? what would happen? Maybe, will they stop coming? And the answer, of course, was no, and they doubled the size of the shelter system. And since then, uh, the, the, the two mayors since then have not been willing to try to reduce the size of the shelter system. They've been trying to basically keep it even. They have about 50,000 people who are uh, longer-term New Yorkers who are in shelter um, and not trying to bring it back down. Um, uh, and just to the to the point that, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, distinction between um, housing policy and homeless policy. Uh, we have been advocating uh, through the last three mayors that you know, essentially one person should have responsibility for both of those questions. That's the way that you would have accountability there and you would solve it. But each of these mayors has insisted on having a separate deputy mayor to deal with housing and a different deputy mayor deal with homelessness as if they are two different problems. And as a result, the housing policy does not address homelessness. And that is why we continue to have tens of thousands of longer term New Yorkers in shelter. So we have these court orders and they require that anyone who needs a bed should get a bed. And as part of our obligations to, on behalf of the class to enforce this court order, we meet with the city regularly and review what's their plan. How many beds do they have? How many people do they expect to come in over the next few months? Will they have enough space for them? Will that space be adequate to meet those people's needs based on their disabilities and other kinds of needs that they have? And uh, about 18 months ago, we noticed that the shelter census, uh, the vacancy rate was approaching zero. They did not have enough um, leeway in case lots of more people came in. And we met with them and said, what is going on? And they said, well, lots of people are coming from the southern border. And this was the first we heard of this. Um, at the time, they did not, they weren't expecting this to happen, and they had not planned for it, and they uh, we're just having people go into the regular shelter system and treating them like everybody else. But very quickly they decided they wanted to build a completely new shelter system just for this population, which they define as, it's very specific, anyone who entered the United States after, on or after March 15th of 2022 uh, and says that they are afraid to return to their country. That is, uh, they refer to that group as asylum seekers. We prefer the term new arrival because um, 
we're trying to steer people away from thinking about this as, an, as, as people who are going to apply for asylum because um, most people are not going to be able to get adequate counsel to do that and their cases are probably going to be denied. Um, so we uh, uh, think of them as uh, new arrivals. Um, and they have built a completely separate shelter system to address um, the needs of this population. And so since then, for the last 18 months, we have been negotiating with the city about what their obligations are. And uh, for the first year or so of this conversation, we were talking about things like, as in the Callahan consent decree, as you heard earlier, there are very specific rules about like how many beds there are and how far apart they are, how many bathrooms, and they wanted some flexibility from that. But now, more recently, as you may have heard, they have gone to court and asked the judge to say, let's just not have a right to shelter anymore. We think people are coming, you know, just as they had believed in the Bloomberg administration that people were coming into shelter to get housing subsidies, now they say people are coming to New York because they know we have a right to shelter. And that's why they're coming to New York. And if we could do away with the right to shelter and make a big announcement, there's no more right to shelter, people would stop coming to New York. Now, you've heard, those of you who've been here for the prior panels, have heard about the history of immigration to New York, seems unlikely that global migration trends would turn because a judge said there's no more right to shelter, but that is the city's current position. That is what they are asking for in court. Um, we uh, have a judge who is, um, as many judges do, trying to resolve the case. So we are in what's called a mediation process now where we go, we were just yesterday with the city and the state, the lawyers for the, you know, the governor and the mayor, um, trying to find a path out of this that does not involve them asking the court to be relieved of all their obligations to everyone. I mean, what they're asking for is that they don't have to shelter anyone who doesn't meet a very specific definition of who can receive public assistance. Um, it would mean, if they're successful, that not just the new arrivals, but everybody would be uh, now potentially barred from shelter unless they receive cash public assistance benefits. So that means people who, are on, who do not have a, an immigration status, people who are working, um, even in low-wage jobs, um, people who receive federal disability benefits, all these people would be excluded from shelter, whether they're new arrivals or not, or longer-term New Yorkers, if the city were to prevail. So that is what we are currently fighting against. And my time is up, so I'm going to pass it to the next person. Hello? Can you hear me? The mic? Got, yeah, good. Hi, everybody. Um, so we have the academic, we have the lawyer, now you have the reporter. Um, I'm on the ground since the so-called crisis, and I call it a so-called crisis because this is really a manufactured crisis, right? Um, since it started maybe like, what, 18 months ago, you said? Um, and one thing that's interesting is, you know, I, I saw the city open up their arms for the new arrivals, and I think that's a good term rather than asylum seekers. Um, they would greet them. At, Port Authority bus terminal with open arms, come, welcome. And then the mood soured over that 18 months to the point where the mayor of this city is going to Colombia and telling people don't come, go somewhere else. He's going on radio in Ecuador telling people not to come. And the thing is, a lot of them are being bused here from Texas. So it's not like they've made a conscious effort to come to New York City. They're going to America and then getting a one-way ticket to New York. Um, and Chicago and some other cities. So it's not like this conscious effort of people hearing about this and, oh, New York has a free-for-all um, with their right to shelter. That's not necessarily true. Um, so what I noticed, so there's a difference between my reporting and then my opinions. And I form my opinions based on what I'm seeing on the ground. Um, and what I'm seeing is this, this real negative, nasty, xenophobic attitude in terms of pitting New Yorkers against the new, the new arrivals in this city and saying that they're draining resources from this city, that they're taking away your tax dollars, right? And that's not necessarily true. What, what I've seen is it's really, it, what it seems to me is that this idea of a right to shelter was this great progressive idea that formed in New York, but it was really a band-aid to an overall problem with the lack of affordable housing in the city. But it was a good band-aid, right? If you needed somewhere to stay, you had it. Now we're seeing a complete attack on this idea of a right to shelter, right? But we don't have to, we don't really ask ourselves, why is there a shortage of affordable housing in New York City? Why don't we have a right to housing in New York City? So I'm noticing, and every month the numbers go up. There's like, the city has said that they spent almost $5 billion on housing the new arrivals in New York. And there's been maybe 
100,000 new arrivals that enter New York, give or take. And they spend $5 billion on, that, uh, on those people. And I just think to myself, what could you do with $5 billion? There's some countries with a GDP where it's not even a $5 billion GDP. So how is it that we're spending $5 billion on 100,000 people? Couldn't you just give the people the money and then they, they could have got their own apartment and it would have been much cheaper than $5 billion? It just doesn't make any sense to me. But then I was looking back and the city, and you probably know this better than me, the city has spent, before the whole asylum seeker uh, new arrival issue was, was an issue, the city was spending already billions of dollars on, on the homeless issue, right? And the Department of Homeless got a budget of like 1.3 or $2 billion. And there was like 75,000 people in shelters at that time. Couldn't you just give the people the money and they could have got their own apartment? Like, I don't understand this, yes. right? <laughs> so that, so I start thinking, I'm saying, this is crazy. What's going on here? Then I think, I think Brad Lander, maybe last year or this year, did a, a, a study where it showed that the idea of housing, the Housing First program, I don't know if anybody's familiar, familiar with Housing First, but the idea of just giving people homes and, um, and without any kind of strings attached, and that would help, you know, that would eliminate homelessness. And Brad Landis' study found that it was cheaper to give people permanent housing than to just warehouse them in shelters. But the city doesn't have this attitude. The city rather spent billions of dollars in homeless shelters where they charge the city $300 for toilet paper, $250 for toothpaste. You know, all these crazy amount, uh, these crazy charges in that they build the city, the city for. So it, I think we have to start thinking about the idea of kind of combating um, the, what I call the shelter industrial complex. There seems to be a lot of vested interest in keeping the shelter system alive and just maintaining a, a system that, I'll buy, it's okay, right? It's good to have a place than not a place, but it doesn't solve the problem. The city just throwing away billions of dollars rather than giving people housing. But then it gets me thinking, you know, I think a lot. <laughs> it gets me thinking, oh, they don't want to give people housing because, of course, we live in a capitalist society and we live in New York City. They're the mother of all capitalist cities in the world. And the, the idea, so housing's commodified. So if housing's commodified, you can't give people housing because it'll devalue the idea of what housing is, right? Well, we can't charge, if we're charging people $3,000 a month on rent, we can't, there's no way we can just give people housing because then the whole idea of housing as a, as a, uh, as a value, as a commodity, completely collapses. It's almost like having a reserve army of labor, right? Having a reserve army of homeless people. And if you have a reserve army, army of homeless people, then you could charge whatever you want for, for um, for uh, housing because people are willing to pay if they can. So these are just some thoughts and ideas. I'm not going to give the whole 10 minutes. We could talk a little more after this, but it just, these are some things that I'm seeing, and as a reporter, it's driving me nuts. Buenas tardes. Bueno, yo les voy a hablar sobre cómo llegué aquí a Nueva York y pude entrar a un shelter. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to speak to you about how I came here um, and how I ended up in a shelter. Okay. Bueno, mi historia un poquito, este, les voy a contar un resumen algo rápido. Mi historia comenzó a los 12 años como inmigrante. My story, my, my story begins at the age of 12. Um, I'll try to make this brief. Primero viajé a Colombia. First ahí I traveled to Colombia. estuve un mes. De ahí en Ecuador estuve dos semanas. I was y in Colombia for en Perú a month. llegué y estuve seis años. En Colombia for two months. En in Ecuador for... Ecuador dos semanas. And in Ecuador for two months, for two weeks. Y en Perú seis años. And in Peru for six years. En Perú nació mi hija. Y de Perú, este, la cosa no estuvo tan bien. Mi pareja se quedó sin trabajo. Nos vimos, pues, obligado a salir de ahí porque cada vez las cosas aumentaban y se ponían peor cada día. 
este, pues con el apoyo de la familia de el papá de mi hija y mi familia, porque ya mi mamá estaba en este país, entonces nos lograron apoyar y hicimos todo el recorrido de cruzar los siete países. Uno de ellos es la selva del Dairén. Um, so, my daughter was born in Peru, um, and unfortunately, my husband lost his job. And from there, we decided that things were too unstable, so we uh, quickly had to come up with a plan to transition uh, to another place. Um, uh, thankfully, we had the support of my husband's family, um, and uh, that's when we decided to make the uh, uh, traverse through the Darien um, Gap across the seven countries. Bueno, este, cuando por fin logramos cruzar todos esos países, que no es fácil, uno tiene que venir de bus en bus, a veces te toca caminar porque los buses no te quieren llevar porque eres inmigrante, porque no tienes papeles, te, la gente te humilla en todos esos países, te trata mal, este, uno pasa hambre porque... A veces uno no lleva dinero, se le acaba el dinero o te roban. Entonces, pues durmiendo de buses en buses, todo eso es algo traumático, tanto como para los niños como para uno el adulto. Uh, so we primarily traveled from bus to bus experiencing all sorts of hardships, including hunger uh, and um, theft and uh, all sorts of other um, traumas not just for myself, but also for uh, my daughter. Um, we experienced a lot of um, different uh, transgressions uh, based on like my migratory status from all of the distinct countries. Cuando por fin llegué a México, que pude cruzar la frontera, bueno, ahí me agarraron los militares, que son los que te reciben cuando tú cruzas. Ahí me, de ahí hice un proceso, me llevaron a migración. Este, no me pudieron poner junto con el papá de mi hijo porque yo era menor de edad y él tenía cierta edad. Bueno, y me llevaron a un centro de detención de menores donde pasé casi un mes. Um, so, once I arrived in Mexico, I was captured by the military. And um, from there, I wasn't able to be put together with my husband because, unfortunately, like, I was a minor and um, he was not a minor. Um, and uh, from there, I was housed with my, uh, with my daughter. Right? Um, sí. uh, and I spent a month in detention. Bueno, en ese mes estuve todo el tiempo con mi hija. Este, cuando yo llegué aquí a Nueva York, fue en un avión que me pagó el gobierno. Eh, me entregaron a mi mamá y de ahí ella me llevó a, a la 151 del Bronx, que es la oficina como la oficina de donde uno hace el proceso para agar, que te den un, un shelter. So from Mexico, I sorry from Texas, I was able to take a plane that was paid for by the government, um, and my mom received me here in New York. Uh, While, when we arrived in New York, um, I went to 151st Street in the Bronx, where uh, the Migration Processing um, Center is. Eh, bueno, ahí estuve, me fui como a las 7 de la mañana y estuve como hasta las 2 a.m. del día siguiente. De ahí me llevaron a un hotel a pasar como el poco de horas para descansar. A las seis de la mañana me llevaron otra vez a la oficina y de ahí estuve como hasta las diez de la noche y ahí fue donde me pusieron en el shelter donde estoy viviendo actualmente. Uh, so from the Migration Processing Center, I went, um, I was taken to uh, a hotel uh, at 2 a.m. of the next day. Um, and there I was able to get some rest, um, and then from the hotel, uh, we were then processed into a shelter, which is where I've remained since. Cuando llegué al hotel, me, este, me hicieron todo el papeleo, me pusieron una habitación, y la habitación este, tiene una cama, te dan una cuna para el, para el bebé, 
eh, tiene un baño y, o sea, también depende de la cantidad de personas que sea la familia, ¿no? Porque donde estoy viviendo es un shelter de familias. Um, so there, that's where my papers were processed. Um, there's a bed, uh, and I was also given a crib for my baby. Um, and uh, it, because the way that the shelter is designed, um, it depends on like the size of your uh, of your family. Um, so we were lucky to have uh, a crib for the baby. Por lo menos, si la familia es de cuatro personas, por lo menos una mamá y tres niños, este, te ponen en un cuarto con dos camas. Si la familia es más grande, te ponen, eh, tienes dos habitaciones pegadas. So depending on the size of your family, for example, uh, a mother and three children, you would get two beds apart. Or if you're in a bigger family, they'll give you uh, two beds together, two rooms together, a suite. Eh, bueno, todo este tiempo que he vivido ahí no, no ha sido como el mejor, pero bueno, le doy gracias a Nueva York por darme un alojo, ¿no? por no dejarme dormir en la calle, eh, porque las personas, los trabajadores que están ahí todos los días no es que nos tratan bien, sino que ahí nos tratan como si nosotros somos menos que ellos. Uh, so, uh, it's not that the conditions in which I'm living in are the worst. Uh, I thank New York for giving me a place to, uh, so that I'm not, I don't have to sleep on the street. Um, however, the employees that work there treat us as if we are less than. Los trabajadores pues te tratan como ellos le da la gana, ellos se creen superior a todos los inmigrantes, sabiendo que sus padres son inmigrantes o vinieron de inmigrantes y pues tuvieron sus hijos aquí. Ellos, yo sé que no son inmigrantes, ellos son nacidos aquí. Pero no por ese hecho nos tienen que tratar así tan mal, ¿verdad? Entonces... Eh, so. Uh, the employees, they treat us as if we're less than, um, and they treat us however they want, depend from, from, from time to time. Uh, and it's not so much, it, it's unjust for them to treat us that way if uh, they too come from immigrants. Um, bueno, la, el otro tema es la alimentación que nos dan ahí en ese hotel donde estamos, donde estoy viviendo. No es una de las mejores alimentaciones, ¿verdad? Como para la capacidad de personas y familias que están viviendo ahí, porque es un shelter de familia, un hotel de familia. Uh, so another point is the uh, the point on nutrition and like nourishment. Um, we don't get the best food, um, and uh, it's not. It's not enough. No suficiente. Uh, it's not enough food for uh, the size of the. Uh, given that we're in a family shelter, we don't get enough food for the family. Donde yo estoy, lo normal deberían es de dar el desayuno, almuerzo y cena y snack para los niños, porque es un shelter familiar. Ahí solamente donde yo estoy en la mañana, a las 11 de la mañana te dan un pan. Y de ahí tienes que esperarte como hasta las seis y media de la noche o hasta las siete para que te puedan dar la cena. Uh, so, right now, the way that we're fed is uh, we get a piece of bread um, at 11 a.m. and then we get dinner at 6 p.m. Um, so, there's no, there's no snacks for the kids, even though you're supposed to get uh, three meals plus snacks since it is a family shelter. Eh, a veces la comida viene descompuesta, a veces no está bien, la comida está descompuesta, los niños pues se tienen que quedar sin comida porque hay personas recién llegadas que no tienen dinero y no tienen ni para qué comer. So a lot of times the food is rotten um, and a lot of times when people arrive they just remain hungry because uh, the food just decays. 
El activismo que yo hago en, mi, en el hotel donde yo vivo es a través de WhatsApp. Cuando yo trabajo pues con una... No es, es como una ayuda mutua de unas personas que ellos me entregan ropa. Yo la clasifico por hombre, mujer, niño, niña y bebé. So the type of activism that I do is based out of WhatsApp. Um, essentially, I work with an organization uh, that dis distributes um, clothing, and I do the work of categorizing it between gender and age. Um, bueno, después de que la clasifico, este, en el hotel, pues todas las personas tenemos un grupo y ahí vamos metiendo las personas recién llegadas que nosotros veamos que están recién llegados, las metemos en ese grupo y a través de ahí, este, pues notifica, bueno, yo notifico que tengo ropa de hombre o ropa de mujer, ropa de niño, la gente viene a mi habitación, cogen lo que ellos necesitan y pues ese es el activismo que yo hago en mi hotel. Um, so once the clothing is uh, classified, what I do is I reach out to um, everybody else and we also do like a collective job of integrating other people into the WhatsApp group. Um, and then I essentially uh, uh, notify everybody in the WhatsApp group that there are clothing um, available for uh, recent arrivals. Uh, and they come to my room and they pick up whatever they need. Um, and that's essentially, that essentially composes most of the work that I've been doing. Otra cosa que les quería decir también es que si, si yo estoy en ese hotel y ese hotel dice que ser de cuatro estrellas, ¿cómo se supone que los trabajadores van a tratar tan mal a los inmigrantes? ¿Cómo va a haber comida en descomposición para darnos a nosotros y a los niños? Y, o sea, no, no entiendo dónde quedan las cuatro estrellas que dicen que tiene el hotel. So another thing that I wanted to bring up is the question of uh, these hotels supposedly being four stars. Um, our food is rotten. Um, we don't have enough to eat. So I would like to know, like, where, is the, where are the supposed four stars? Um, and she also mentioned uh, the manner in which uh, the, uh, the people that are there are treating her and other migrants. Bueno, cuando yo llegué ahí al hotel, el hotel no tenía microondas. La comida te la dan fría. Eh, no hay cocina. Entonces solamente te dan el desayuno y la cena. Entonces hay un solo microondas para 1331 cuartos que tiene el hotel. There are 1,331 rooms in the, in the hotel, uh, and there is one microwave for everybody there. Um, and you, again, you have to, you're only fed twice a day, once in the morning with the bread, and then um, at 6 p.m. Um, at night with dinner. And there, is, there are no kitchens in the, in the rooms. No hay neveras. Las neveras que ellos tienen en algunos cuartos donde almacenan las cosas, la utilizan son los trabajadores del hotel. No nos dejan utilizar esas neveras. Entonces, we're not allowed to use refrigerators um, and we don't we don't have the refrigerators that are there. Uh, the workers actually use them for themselves and they don't allow us to, to access the refrigerators. Bueno, eh, una de las organizaciones que me ha apoyado más a mí y aparte a del hotel, a personas que bueno, han estado ahí, es, se llama La Morada. Es un restaurante que queda en el Bronx. Eh, pues de ellos hemos recibido mucha ayuda. Ellos a veces cuando yo les digo pues que si por favor pueden cocinar y traernos comida, ellos lo hacen. Eh, cada vez que ellos pueden hacer un evento, invito a toda la gente de muchos hoteles que conozco. Este, y pues de ellos he recibido más ayuda que de otras organizaciones. The organization that's provided the most support for me has been um, a restaurant based out of the Bronx called La Morada. Um, so if I call them and reach out and tell them that I need food to eat, 
uh, they'll cook and like uh, bring us uh, bring us food. Uh, whenever they host events, I go uh, and I bring as many other people as I can um, to participate. Eh, bueno, el, mi opinión sobre el límite de los 60 días es, es algo como traumático, diría yo, para los niños. Porque como las personas vienen recién llegando y, o sea, solamente vas a estar dos meses, dos meses que eh, tus papeles no te llegan dos meses los niños no van a estudiar solamente dos meses, entonces estar cambiando de shelter en shelter y de escuela en escuela, yo siento que eso es como un poco traumático para los niños. The question of the 60 day limit on shelters is uh, quite traumatic. Um, your papers don't arrive in 60 days. Uh, you, are, you also don't receive your papers in, in 60 days. Uh, kids don't go to school for 60 days. Um, Ah, so I think it's, it's really traumatic. Bueno, este, mi opinión y mi experiencia, eh, le doy muchas gracias a New York, de verdad, por abrirnos la puerta, este, al presidente que también hizo que pudiéramos venir a este país. Eh, con la cosa de la vivienda, sí sé que es un poco fuerte, este, también el para conseguir trabajo. Aquí en Nueva York el trabajo está muy difícil. O sea, si consigues trabajo, no es un trabajo fijo. Si a veces no se consigue, entonces, bueno, yo opino sobre mí, es que yo y mi familia en realidad queremos es trabajar poder salirnos del shelter, poder salir de ser una carga para el gobierno, porque, bueno, yo vine a eso, vine a estudiar, a terminar mis estudios, a trabajar, a poder sacar a mi hija adelante. Eh, y pues, para mantener un hogar, o sea, una renta, que te vale semanal 800 o 900, uno tiene que tener un trabajo fijo. Um, so I thank the president again for making it easy for us to uh, uh, to to um, come here. Uh, again, I want to thank New York for uh, opening its arms and allowing us to to be here. Um, we didn't. I didn't personally for me and my family. I came to start to finish my studies and to um, uh, provide my child with an education. Um, what I would like to do is to find a permanent job. Um, and eventually transition out of the shelter system. And also that it's really hard to uh, access housing since, for example, the rentals are uh, 800 a week. So uh, how can you access, how can you even pay those prices when you don't have a stable job? Bueno, lo que yo también le diría, pues, al presidente y al alcalde sería pues que nos dé un trabajo seguro con un sueldo honrado eh, y pues que nos ayude con con viviendas pues con un hogar seguro como para no depender del gobierno sino que algo que ya nosotros podamos pagar podamos ya tener un trabajo y poder pagar el arriendo y y estar bien porque eso fue lo que vinimos a este país. What I would like to ask the mayor and the president would be to provide uh, the ability for us uh, to live in permanent housing and work uh, permanently so that we're able to uh, uh, be independent and not be a weight to the to the state. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. so much to all of our panelists. Um, yeah, another round of applause for everybody. That was really great. Um.
um, really appreciate you guys being here and sharing your insights and your knowledge and, and sharing your stories and building on um, just the important conversations that have been taking place today across panels. Um, so at this time, we're going to transition into some prepared questions, um, and then we're going to open the floor for engagement with the audience. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. The first question is, what does the landscape of housing for migrants and asylum seekers look like in, the New, York, in New York City? How many people are in city-provided shelters versus private housing? And how many people are in hotels versus congregate settings? And adding on to that, in a much broader context, based on all of your experiences and work, I was reminded about something that the late George Carlin said, where he always spoke about the idea of homelessness in, in, in the US as something that is happening because there is not a way for someone to make profit out of it. And the moment that someone can do that, suddenly it will start, like the problem will start going away in a, in a much faster manner. In speaking to that, I was wondering what, what are the political and economic systems around this idea of the homeless shelter in the city? Because from what Amir also has spoken about, they, it's, it's a lot of money that is being invested in these systems, and it's important to understand how these systems operate and what they are. Thank you. Just to directly address the number question first, um, the, there are, as I said before, there were about 50,000 people in the New York City shelter system a year and a half ago. Um, now there are, uh, let's say, 120,000. Uh, so, and, and the number of uh, longer-term New Yorkers has stayed about the same. So we've added, let's say, 70,000 new arrivals to the system. Um, most of those people are families with children. Um, the, and those are, uh, up until last week, all of those families with children were basically in hotels or places that are like hotels. Within the last week, the city has started to use uh, a new kind of shelter uh, that have, we haven't seen in decades in New York for families with children. Um, they call it semi-congregate. Uh, there's a, a huge tent out at Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn where um, they uh, created, um, you know, the, the, the state regulation says that a family with children has to have a room with a locking door. So they said, okay, we will make, we'll give them a locking door to a cubicle. So it doesn't have a ceiling. Um, inside this tent, they have set up these giant cubicles with about 10 foot walls and a locking door. And now, of course, someone could jump over the wall into your room. Um, so I think that people are not sleeping very well in this place because they are, well, for a number of reasons, but one reason is because they're worried about the safety of their children. Um, but um, that is a, a new model uh, that they are um, testing, I guess. Uh, they are gonna have a couple, maybe 2,000 people there. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that the purpose of this is to discourage people from coming to New York. Already, we've gotten emails, uh, for instance, from people who were in Nassau County who saw this and said, if I come to New York, is this what uh, will greet me? Um, so uh, to the extent that they're trying to get the message out there, uh, that this is bad and this is what you will get, uh, I think that is successful. Um, as to the, the deeper question of, you know, why is all of this happening? Um, uh, you know, I think some of the previous panels, this, you know, people had much more eloquent answers than I would have. Um, I will just say for my part very quickly that, uh, you know, we have, um, uh, you know, this, this is a question of investing in resources and who who is worth um, uh, spending money on. I mentioned before that we were this close to having in Congress uh, Section 8 for everybody, which would have amounted to, uh, you know, housing, uh, affordable housing for everybody. Um, and one person said no, and that was it. Um, you know, with every, every budget is a choice, and uh, uh, all of these problems are resolvable. The federal government could solve this problem by letting people work. Um, the uh, city could solve this and the state could solve this problem as could the federal government by investing in affordable permanent housing for people uh, and then we wouldn't have this problem and they have chosen not to do that uh, and I think uh, we've had much better uh, 
uh, explanations of why that is today, then, then I could give you now. Uh, maybe another aspect of the kind of, you asked about the kind of political um, aspects of it. And another thing that I might mention is like um, some, I've seen some folks talk about housing in like a punitive sense where there are like strings attached to it, right? So like, well, if housing is just simply accessible to all, um, right, they're not going to want to work or, um, right, it's going to be, or they're not going to take care of the housing, right? So there's um, certain kind of condescensions around um, that type of perspective on housing coming from, right, like officials and former officials that I've read um, in the newspaper. Um, so I think it's that type of kind of perspective around housing that limits the vision of resources that could be dedicated or, or what could be achieved around housing um, because of this kind of, kind of limited, uh, narrow perspective on like what housing means and, um, and how we can build it and, and how people, what people's kind of claim to it is. Um, has anybody ever been to Floyd Benefield? It might as well be in Siberia. You know, it's, it's like collective punishment sending everybody over there. That, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, a, some, a thought that came to my mind was, does the city own Floyd Benefield? Or that, from my understanding, it's a national park. So is there some legal maneuvering that we can look into? That maybe that's illegal, they're not supposed to go in there? I wonder, I'm just curious if... if involved in a lawsuit about this very question really? right now. Yeah. Okay, you see, great minds think alike. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, like these, back to what you were saying earlier about like profit, who makes money and how it kind of works. You know, there's all these nonprofits that have city contracts to, to shelter people. And um, a lot of their CEOs or, or the people who are the executive directors of these nonprofits, like former... Um, city council person Christina Quinn, they make hundreds of thousands of dollars as, as spokespeople to, for the homeless and, and advocating on behalf of shelters. But it's this complete um, industrial complex in which they, there's no movement. They, they work within a logic that housing is not a human right, that housing is not, part, is not uh, a right that everyone deserves, that, that, Shel that the most you can do is hope to shelter them. And they'll make a lot of money sheltering. You know, they'll, they'll, I know these hotels, a lot of these hotels are making huge amounts of money just uh, sheltering the homeless. So it, it's, we're working within a logic that is focused on the idea that housing is not a right. Like you said, there's all these strings attached. You have to be deserving of housing. We can't just give you a home. That doesn't make any sense. Um, when in reality, we should be shifting our idea. You know, if as 100,000 people are in shelters, you know, that's not a, it's too many. If one person's in a shelter, that's too many. But 100,000 people is a manageable amount of people that we can, and families that we can really get into affordable housing. Um, but we're moving in a direction in which we're even privatizing public housing. So it's really, a, a, we have to make a paradigm shift. And this so-called crisis could actually be an opportunity to address the realities of the housing situation in New York and trying to change the conversation and change the way New York runs in which people could live in the city, people could afford to live in the city, but yet our mayor and the powers that be are, are uh, you know, against that. And, you know, and we're with a mayor that believes God made him the mayor. So I don't know what we're doing here. Um. That's great. I'll build on that a little bit too. Um, I think that right now, kind of um, the what I was trying to get at in some of my comments is that um, housing is developed only through kind of like these um, kind of private markets, right? And um, over the past um, 50 years or so, um, kind of um, public public options have been disparaged and. Um, um, Dis, disinvested, and so um, there's various plans out there, right? There's people doing work around this um, to have um, kind of concrete um, 
achievable plans for developing more public options. Homeless shelters are a sort of degraded form of public housing, right? Um, if we think about it in that way, it opens up our eyes, I think, as um, Amir is saying, to other options, devoting other resources um, towards um, this issue, community um, kind of financing programs, um, um, uh, commu community f banks, um, things like that, um, instead of privatizing um, something like public housing. Similarly, um, right, what I was hearing from a lot of the other panelists um, earlier in the day was um, not just, right, city scale investment, but kind of there's other resources available at kind of the national, national scale, right? So um, many of these, think of how much human energy and creativity is tied up in all of those detention centers along the way, right? Think of how much kind of, not just like, like capital, like investment capital, but like, think about the human relationships that are formed through those interactions. All of that energy, right, could be turned toward collectively um, investing in these kind of creative um, ideas about housing. Not just to have one primary way of developing housing, right, a monopoly through private markets at this point, but letting all different alternatives informed by the creative energies of housing movement. Drawing on all that creativity and energy and activating right this right to housing as um, a practice, right? Not something that we can kind of pull out of a hat that's magical, but letting them develop and um, and take shape, um, informed by the good work that many people are already doing right now. Thank you for those responses. The next question. Uh, in, in a manner ties to this only, given the given New York City's right to shelter mandate, how is the current infrastructure responding to the needs of the migrants and where is it falling short? What steps can the city take to ensure that it can sustainably fund the right shelter program? And adding on to this, what do you think is the fundamental difference between how the city is responding now versus how it responded in the 30s after the depression when the law was actually written about this? Actually, on the, on the first part about how is it, um, what are the problems in the shelter system now? I want to turn back to Sarah, if that's okay, to ask you to say some more about what's wrong with the, with the system. Or how it could be better. Bueno, este... Podría mejorar si nos dan como vivienda estable. Uh, they could give us more stable housing. Ya que pues no todas las personas son destructivas ni vamos a destruir los hogares que nos están brindando. Given that uh, not everybody is destructive and that we'll, we won't be destroying the housing that is being provided for us. Ah, bueno, en el shelter donde yo estoy, pues, y me imagino que en los otros también pasa, que no hay tanta seguridad, es muy inseguro. Eh, ya como dos veces han entrado dos personas armadas y no son policías. Uh, so another big thing is security. Um, in two different occasions, uh, two armed um, people came into uh, my mine and my daughter's room, um, and they were not police. Pues. 
les, les voy a mostrar eh, lo que nos dan en la cena a los niños y a los adultos. I want to show you the food that they give us, um, uh, like give us the children and the adults um, in the in the shelter for dinner. Disculpen los de atrás, yo sé que no van a poder ver, pero. Bueno. I'm sorry about the folks in the back that won't be able to see. Um, so what you see is uh, rice. Um, it's it's rice and uh, peas and a gray piece of meat. Um, I think that's chicken. Is it pollo? Eh? Yeah. See, sí. um, it, it's chicken. Um, esta es la comida, la cena que nos dan a nosotros después de todo el día teniéndonos con un pan nada más. So this is what they give us uh, at 6 p.m. after having only given us a piece of bread at 11 a.m. Ella quiere saber dónde está. ¿Viniste acá porque sabías que había derecho a la, al techado? Mm -hmm. Bueno, sí. Sí. Yes. I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, también por mi mamá, que ella vive en el shelter. And also because of my mom, who lives in a shelter. Here, so mm -hmm. Perdón, um, she lives here, her mom lives here, but not in a shelter. Pues me enteré porque mi tía vivió en un refugio de mujeres solteras. Eh, ella estaba embarazada y llegó aquí así, pues viviendo en un refugio. Y ella fue la que me dijo que vaya a la 151 en la oficina del Bronx y para que me puedan dar un refugio con mi familia. Uh, so my aunt, um, who was pregnant, uh, lived in a single woman's shelter. Um, and that's how I found out. So when I was making um, the the plans to like come here, uh, she asked me to go to the office in 150, uh, 151st Street. Um, so our next question is, um, when we talk about housing and the right to shelter, um, Inclusivity and integration come up quite often, um, and we've heard that in pr the previous panels today, where um, Sophie talked about how we're seeing migrants helping people, and even with the work that Sarah is doing and finding community. And so from a community organizing perspective, what strategies have proven effective in integrating new arrivals into neighborhoods and the housing systems, and how can these stra strategies be scaled and improved upon? In a lot of mutual aid groups on the ground, like a group called South Bronx, um, uh, what was it called? South Bronx United, I believe. Um, and they, they've been working real hard in, in really helping um, the, the new arrivals in New York. That restaurant she had mentioned is also has been a real um, kind of a safe space and place for a lot of the asylum seekers coming in. And, and they were, uh, what was the name of the restaurant she had mentioned? Yeah, they've been doing amazing work, and it, it's been words have been spread all the way to Texas that you know this restaurant is there and it's helping people. Um, so there's a lot of grassroots efforts on the ground um, of people organizing and really working um, with the new asylum seeker, uh, the new arrivals. Um, and what's also very fascinating to me is how the new arrivals themselves are actually giving back and organizing and getting involved. So I, I, think that, I think that's not getting as reported as much, right? But what I also feel like the city can do is integrate them into the planning and conversation, but the city has this attitude where they don't want them there here. So they, don't, they treat them as they, in a way that tries to discourage them from even staying here. When you give people food like that, what message are you sending? That you're not welcome, that we don't want you. Because people are not going to stay and live in these conditions and live in Floyd Benefield and eat this 
peas, rice, and gray meat. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so with the city, well, it makes sense because the city don't want them. But what the city should really be doing is creating some sort of panel or, or try to find a way to integrate the new arrivals into the planning of finding way, solutions to how we can integrate them in the city long term and really welcome them rather than discouraging them. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great answer. Um, there was a um, kind of informal service center that uh, came together at the Port Authority bus terminal um, in the early stages of this because that's where um, people were arriving. A lot of people were arriving. Most people actually are arriving by air at this point, but um, the, the uh, mutual aid volunteers, activists who were kind of coordinating all of this um, welcoming uh, were um, found that th they were spending most of their time at the Port Authority and so people would come to see them there and so organizations like ours would go there because we knew there were a lot of people and we could that we could meet and assist um, and uh, the city had, had you know this is all volunteer driven the city doesn't want any part of it um, and then eventually they kicked us out of the Port Authority so now we uh, the, the, the uh, the uh, people who were working out of that site have now identified two other sites. Um, and someone asked in an earlier panel about are there places to connect, uh, to volunteer, or to assist. And I could tell you that there are two uh, locations. I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards who wants to hear more about it. But you know, one is in a church on 40th Street. One is in an office on 145th and Lenox. And there are people coming every day um, and asking for assistance, whether it's just to get clothing, whether they're looking for an immigration lawyer, they want help with benefits, um, they get their mail. Uh, you know, there's just there's a lot going on, and, and a lot of people coming. And so, uh, organizations like ours and NILAG, um, uh, who was here earlier on the previous panel, uh, go to these places and, and meet. We know because we know there's going to be people there we can meet with and assist. There's obviously uh, many many people that we could assist. Many more people then we have resources to assist, so this is a way to um, address the need. And uh, it is, uh, as I said, like entirely volunteer-driven, kind of ad hoc. Um, uh, the city wants no, had wanted no part of it, including in resettlement efforts. But just this week, on Monday, the mayor called a bunch of these folks in to City Hall, um, including uh, Murat, who was here earlier, um, and they all gave him a really hard time about this, you know, not taking the uh, assistance and advice of the people who actually know what they're doing um, and have the trust of the community. And he seemed to understand that maybe they should um, uh, change their approach to incorporate more of the organizations that have been and, and always have been and will continue to do this work rather than relying on city officials um, who have taken a, you know, a very um, scorched earth kind of approach to how to do this work. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, uh, I, at some point I have to always make this pitch, so I'll, I'll, I'll shoehorn it into this answer, which is that one of the big things that people need help with, uh, we are finding is, um, that they are being, everybody's working, right? You, whether or not they have work authorization, people are working. And so people who do not have work authorization are being exploited in their work because the people they are working for know that they, or believe that they will not complain. Um, one of the big ways that people are working is uh, d delivery apps. And initially, when people arrived, they could just sign up for a an account in their own name. The delivery apps came under a lot of pressure for this, so now they require people to prove that they have work authorization, which means that what's happening is that people are renting an account. So someone will, who is able to set up an account will do it, and then they will rent that account to people who have just arrived here. Um, they'll rent the account, and they'll rent the bike, because uh, those bikes cost like $3,000. And they will um, then, uh, they're totally reliant on the person who has that account. So um, they, if the person then just ghosts them, basically, like if they have a good week and the person who owns the account sees a whole bunch of money came in, they can just disappear and keep all the money. And the person, the actual delivery worker, then is totally out all their wages. But of course, they still owe for the bike rental. Um, so you know, we have, uh, our employment lawyers are now starting to get involved in, in, in these kinds of issues. And the reason I like to shoehorn the story into these appearances is to tell everyone, because I know everybody uses these apps now, please tip in cash.
Eh, ¿Cómo pueden mejorar las estrategias sobre integrar a los inmigrantes en vecindarios y sistemas de vivienda? Eh, yo siento que pues dándonos una vivienda segura y ya que estamos desocupando el espacio que estamos en el shelter o en el hotel donde estamos, pues para las personas que están recién llegando que ocupen ese espacio, ¿sí? Para que no haya todo ese caos de las personas durmiendo en la calle con niños. Uh, I think that a way to improve the Uh, integration in neighborhoods and also the housing system is to uh, have a safe um, access to safe housings because we're gonna give that space that we're occupying in shelters to other people that are coming and that wants the space and probably need more the space so we are um, allowing providing them shelter and to so they avoid sleeping on the streets right now with kids, which is a problem. Hablando sobre el tema de las motos, eh, pues sí pediría al alcalde que le ayude a las personas a tener un permiso para poder tener esas motos, porque así como ellos se sacrifican para comprarse esa moto y trabajar de esa manera, Debería de haber una opción para que le den un permiso para que puedan trabajar legalmente. Uh, talking about the issue with the delivery apps, eh, I think I asked the mayor that eh, we have to provide those workers with work authorizations because they are already using their savings to buy, like, bikes or motorbikes or anything so they're already investing in that and uh, since they are already like sacrificing themselves uh, at the least the government can do is giving work giving them work authorization también siento que deberían de darle un permiso a las personas que son vendedores de ambulante que tienen su carrito y venden fruta o venden cosas y no estar multándolas porque una multa eh, arruina tu caso de asilo. Eso ya está marcado ahí. Also that they should give work authorizations to street vendors instead of giving them fines, especially because if you get a fine, that's going to be on your record and probably like eh, jeopardize your Um, if you are applying for any type of paperwork or become a regular. Pues siento que así de mejorarían las cosas y no estaríamos como en un caos y también de que yo digo que en todos los inmigrantes que estamos aquí en el país yo no siento que en realidad se hayan gastado en nosotros 5 billones de dólares. En realidad no, no sé por qué dicen eso si no se ve los resultados de esos 5 billones de dólares. Uh, I think that that would improve things and also like I don't understand what, why they're saying like they're spending that amount of money like five billion dollars in immigrants because I don't see it <laughs> and uh, it doesn't look like there's a lot of money invested in uh, immigrants as uh, media says. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to open the floor for questions now. So just raise your hand and we'll have someone bring the mic over. Uh, hi, I'm Meghnath. I'm at the Columbia Journalism School. Um, and I'm working on an investigative report uh, regarding Uh, DocGo, one of the for-profit contractors. Uh, I just want to ask you, what is your understanding of why the city administration provided a contract, a no-bid contract, uh, running into hundreds of millions of dollars to a medical services provider to run a migrant housing, a sort of like a series of migrant housing 
uh, programs. Uh, what's, what's the logic in, in your work? Have you come across one? And second, if you're awarding these contracts to for-profit contractors, aren't they naturally incentivized to give you the cheapest food, the worst facilities, so that they can make the biggest margins because they're operating for profit? Can I just oh, Doc, go. Doc, go. Can I just say for anybody who wants it, um, I filed a foil with the city of New York at the end of May to get the full contract between the Department of I've already got it for you. I'll send it to you. So if anybody wants the full contract, I have it. I just got it yesterday from the city. So it works to file the foils, people. I'll, I'll just say also that you heard, uh, again, at the beginning, the, some of the, the rules that exist uh, about beds and how far apart they are, and uh, they wanted to get away from all that, so they created a, a separate uh, structure, uh, that, and their theory was, well, now it won't be governed by any rules, and we can do whatever we want. Uh, yeah, thank you again for, for all this. this. is great. I have a question that's probably very directed at uh, Amir, and this is around, I guess, uh, new journalism and kind of the way that journalism is moving, and it has to do with um, just thinking through all of the panels today about what's happening here, but also what's happening in a lot of the West Coast cities that's almost identical, especially around, you know, Eric Adams and people voted for Eric Adams, and uh, in Vancouver, where I'm from, they voted for someone who's almost identical to him, and putting out similar policies that, uh, that are quite awful for people who are unhoused. And a lot of it is because they run on platforms that sensationalize crime. And thinking about the way that the cycles of elections, especially municipal elections, happen, there's a compassion fatigue, I think, that happens throughout that cycle where people have an understanding that people need housing and then as the years pass by, they lose interest and it's a lot easier for people to have fear of crime in their neighborhoods than to be um, welcoming of people who need housing. Is there, what are your thoughts on how we could combat that um, just in populations that will end up voting for people in office who then put a lot of this in motion? Uh, is there a way to like keep people interested in a lot of the the matters that that they should be? Well, I think are you asking my opinion about like, as a journalist or just as a citizen in New York? Oh, both or whatever you'd like. Yeah. Uh, well, most people didn't vote for Adams. Most people didn't vote in general, right? You're, now, if you saw the options we had, there was nobody worth voting for to begin with. And Adams. But um, if no one voted for, we, like for Adams, right, when he came into this idea, we had someone named de Blasio, and de Blasio was supposed to be progressive, right? But he didn't give a damn about being mayor. So he, was, he had no interest. I mean, he was just wanted to run for president and wanted to run for Congress, and he didn't care about being mayor. I can tell you one New York City mayor that I think was good for this city. I think every New York City mayor is terrible. But in general, like, there's, with the absence of Um, so, 
we, there has to be a movement in this city where we push constantly progressive policies and, and, and constantly push and not just worry about these election cycles, right? So when you have someone like de Blasio came and he was supposed to be this, uh, he was going to be a progressive mayor and then he had a lack of interest or a, he didn't have any strong ideas and he was so um, absent from being the mayor and it didn't inspire people, didn't give a damn really, was constantly looking for the next opportunity to, to uh, highlight his career. Um, people kind of, there was that backlash. And I think that's where Adams came in through that vacuum, right? Of him, of de Blasio weakening a progressive movement in the city and allowing this snake named Adams to come in and who believes God put him here. And he said this multiple times um, to, to become mayor. And look what he's doing now in the city. So I think we have to keep pushing a progressive agenda and we have to have a strong progressive um, movement in the city that constantly says we're not going to, that, that constantly put uh, that fights against this constant right wing trend here. We get someone who's progressive. They, they're kind of weak. They don't do much. And then you get this right wing turn. We had that with um, Dinkins and then Giuliani. We had this with de Blasio you know, Adams. It, it's, it has to stop somewhere. And I think it just constantly, and I think we're seeing it now. People are, 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 are kind of, <laughs> the, the vultures are circling around Adams with his ties to Turkey and all these kind of corruption things that he's working on and we've been investigating. So, um, yeah, I don't want to ramble on. I, I just don't like Adams. And, <laughs> and I think um, we, we, have to, we have to move into a more progressive uh, direction. Hi, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of someone who's actually not here, who's writing, wrote their question in earlier. Um, and that is, um, as, as you all know, uh, many people who are in the shelters right now are receiving um, notifications that are um, misleading or perhaps incomplete or even false, um, telling them they have 60 days and then they need to leave. And there's, you know, a lot of panic happening and lots of people who are um, packing their bags and wondering where to go. Um, and I'm wondering what advice you, and not, I mean, actually not even just advice, but like information um, you could share with, um, with those folks and whether it would be possible to um, offer Know Your Rights um, workshops to people about whether they can in fact be kicked out after 60 days, uh, what their rights are in the shelter, et cetera, or maybe it's not uh, workshops, it's materials that are distributed, I don't know. Um. Thank you for that uh, question. We have those materials on our website, um, so I can um, provide a, a link to that. If you go to the Legal Aid Society's website, uh, there is a, a pay, uh, uh, under the get. There's a section that says Get Help, and you can find uh, the home. Our my team, the Homeless Rights Project, there, and uh, we have uh, materials there for people that that explain uh, exactly how this is supposed to work and what their rights are. Um, the we. We still have a right to shelter. The city has gone to court to ask that there not be a right to shelter, but there still is a right to shelter, and that means that they, uh, it, you know, if a person does not have a place to go, they have to be offered a bed. And so we have seen with the single adults, you know, the, they've started giving out these notices to families with children that say you have 60 days. The first of those notices were served in October, so it's December 29th is the first day that someone will have reached the 60th day. And then we will see, uh, they still haven't quite worked out exactly what's gonna happen um, when those notices come due. I think it's pretty clear at this point that we will still have a right to shelter in New York City on December 29th and uh, for the foreseeable future. So um, they're gonna have to offer people something if they don't have any place to go at the end of that time. However, they very much want to encourage people to move on. So they are telling them, you only have 60 days to stay here. And what they're not saying is, but if you don't have anywhere to go at the end of that time, we will still give you another placement. And so that, this is why people are panicking and they believe, you know, because it doesn't say in the notice that you get that you can get another placement, um, they're kind of counting on people to, to be terrified by that. Um, I think we have seen that uh, people are pretty networked on WhatsApp um, and, and through other social media. Um, they form other communities, even if they didn't know anybody here before they arrived. Um, they are meeting those people. Um, for the single adults, 
when they come in to reapply now, they send them to a, you know, if, if you get to the end of your time and, and you say, I still don't, you know, have anywhere to go, they send you to a place they call the reticketing center. And the idea there is that, you know, they're gonna say, okay, where would you like to go? We'll buy you a ticket, anywhere. Tell us where you wanna go. And then the person says, I, I don't have anywhere else to go. And they say, okay, fine. Now we'll give you a shelter placement. But, you know, they, they carry it as far as to, you, in order to get that placement, you have to go to a place that's called the reticketing center. They're, they're trying to um, uh, reinforce uh, as, as frequently as possible that their goal, the city's goal is for you to leave New York and get out of a shelter and go somewhere else. Um, so I think they built this system with the aspiration that they, the court would relieve them of the obligation to offer somebody a new placement, but they have not yet won that. They still have to offer people a new placement at the end of that time. Um, and so they are, they are trying to push the envelope as far as they possibly can um, without affirmatively saying to people, we don't offer you shelter anymore. They did actually try that and, and they were forced to stop. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they are not willing to go so far as to say, and P.S., at the end of your time, you can get a new placement. Um, for the single adults, you know, it's a hardship. It's, a, you know, they have to pack everything up at this arbitrary date when who knows where they are in the process of trying to find another place to go. This may actually slow people down, right? They may have gotten connected to resources in the community, and now all that's disrupted because of some arbitrary deadline. What we've said is you would be, you would be much... It would work much better if they had a real case management model where, you know, somebody met with the person and said to them, what do you need to move on? What do you need um, to be independent? Do you need, you know, a lot of people just want an ID, you know, a New York City ID. Some people just want a driver's license. Some people are in OSHA training class and they think from that they're going to get real work. So um, if they would meet with people individually and have those kinds of conversations, that would be a much better way to do this. But instead, they're saying, you know, 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, come in here and talk to us and tell us what your plan is. But also, pack up all your stuff. You're leaving wherever you've been, and at the end of that conversation, if you don't have another place to go, we'll give you another place to go. Um, but they're not, that last part they're not saying, but they still have to do it. So that, that is the current state of things. Hi, uh, thank you all for speaking to us today. Um, I'm also a student from Columbia Journal School. I'm a reporting fellow at the NYC Housing Lab now, um, focusing on the immigrant housing. So uh, my question is, what impacts are those uh, new uh, migrants bringing to the old immigrants' communities uh, of the city now? And if there are some bad effects, what the city should do to minimize those um, kind of thing. I'm not aware personally. I got a loud voice anyway. Um, I'm not aware personally of any situations in which there's any uh, conflict between old immigrant communities in New York, or established rather, established immigrant communities in New York, and the new arrivals coming in. Um, if anything, a lot of the immigrant communities in New York have risen to, to, to the challenge and really have come out and helped and supported um, the new arrivals. And they've, especially places like at Jackson Heights and in the Bronx, they've welcomed them with open arms and have some, some of them even welcomed them into their homes. So there seems to be a nice um, uh, relationship with a lot of these new arrivals coming into the city. And that's not really getting reported as much of how that how the new immigrant, the old immigrant communities or established immigrant communities are really coming together and welcoming them. And I think that that's something that should be focused on more. Bueno, les quiero decir antes de que termine todo que pues si ustedes desean donar ropa para las personas recién llegadas, lo que más necesitan ahora pues es abrigo, 
zapatos porque en realidad uno cuando te sueltan de migración te quitan, te botan todo, te dan, son como unas chancletas que, que prácticamente estás caminando en el suelo. Eh, eh, guantes, eh, como que más, y abrigos y gorros. Um, I want to invite uh, everyone to donate because that's one of the things that we most need at the moment. Um, we actually need like coats, clothes, or um, uh, especially for the winter. And because basically when um, we leave the detention center, we leave the detention center without anything, just with a pair of sleepers, almost like walking barefoot. So if you have any kind of shoes or any type of outwear for winter, it's very welcome. And Does she feel that um, the immigrant communities in New York, like in the Bronx, have they been very welcoming and helping her in, in terms of uh, outreach or support? Sientes que la comunidad de Bronx ha sido como muy, te ha dado la bienvenida, sobre todo cuando te dices enamorado. Bueno, en realidad sí. Sí siento que ellos han sido como más, más atentos a todo lo que necesitamos los inmigrantes porque ellos no es solamente que me conocen a mí y solamente me dan para, el, para mi shelter, ¿no? Ellos, van, ellos apenas se enteran que abren un shelter o una carpa, ellos van allá, así se peleen con los policías, así discutan, pero ellos van y ayudan a todas las personas de todos los shelters, sea de mujer, hombre o familia. I feel like yes, the community in the Bronx, especially La Morada, has helped us a lot. Um, and it's not only helping me or my shelter, but it's also helping uh, any other shelter in the city, city or even camps. Um, even if they get in trouble with police, uh, they go and try to make make connections with the new immigrants, and um, they are always like trying to help. So yeah. I, I just wanted to circle back to the question about um, the two centers that you mentioned. Are you able to share the the names or? The just so everyone knows. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just uh, say that there's a, a Metro Baptist Church on 40th Street. There are people there most days. And then there's another um, program called Africana, which is at 145th and, and Lenox, um, that is open every day. Um, I would just, uh, uh, maybe in making the connection, I, it's helpful to know if you uh, speak any other languages, uh, they're serving slightly different clientele at each place. Um, and I am happy to make the connection. They don't really, these are all volunteer efforts, so it's not like there's a volunteer coordinator I can direct you to, but um, I'm happy to stay for a few minutes after if people want to connect that way and, and uh, I can help you um, uh, reach out to them. I know that there are, particularly at the Africana office on, on 145th Street, uh, there are a lot of Columbia students who are coming there every day, whether that's been organized by anyone or it's just kind of spontaneously happening through word of mouth, I don't know, um, but, um, uh, happy to facilitate that if anyone wants to get involved. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Amazing. Uh, I have a question maybe to Christian and to, to others. But So we established that there's a lot of money to be done from homelessness, from houselessness, from shelters, etc. But how is it exactly that happens that there's this like, okay, now we're going to make build shelters and then now we're going to rent hotels and put people in hotels. Now we're going to put tents with open cubicles, like how does these policies get designed? Who decides on what's happening? Okay, there's money to be made, but how, like how is it suddenly that hotels are like single uh, SROs and how is it now that they're building tents? And the, the other question that is related to that is that what is the future that with attacking the right to shelter, they're imagining that people will stop coming, but we know, and they know, that the people are still gonna come. So what is the future post right I mean, it's already people, uh, people are, uh, there's a lot of unhoused people on the streets. So what is that future of the post uh, policy of the uh, right to shelter mandate that is imagined? You know, like more people on the streets or what is it? Yeah, one of the 
panelists from from the previous session was so insightful about kind of complicating this notion of crisis and um, right this crisis mentality of right okay well now it's it's like all in the moment of like now now it's tense now it's right hotels um, whatever's available um, so I guess right it seems very maybe you can confirm <laughs> ad hoc right um, and so uh, long I don't know if there's a long term like post right to shelter vision <laughs> right um, like there. I don't know, there probably is not. Um, but if we kind of think about, <clears throat> um, right, this, um, in, think about the kind of, um, about, right, like providing ways for folks to move into more stable housing conditions than I think, right, I mean, that's clearly, I think, what we're all in agreement on on this panel, right, that, um, that from our angle is um, the most sensible thing to do. Um, without that, I don't see another kind of, right, yeah, like. Okay, so of course, five of them that have zero stars basically, right? right. Become the destination. Right. Like And it's like the like the COVID plan too, right? Like the hotels aren't being used, like put people in hotels, right? I feel like it's very like in the moment ad hoc. Is that your kind of feeling of things too? Every, yeah, everybody I mean, else? we've been negotiating this for a year and a half now and, and they just keep making it up as they go along. I think they, they the, the story that they're telling is that uh, they're using whatever space they can find and they're constantly scrambling to find new space and they take what they can get. Um, but, uh, you know, what we have said to the city over and over again is suppose you win, you know, that doesn't solve your problem. Now you have lots of people living on the street. That's, that's not, a, the, that doesn't mean the problem is solved. That means that the situation is worse. So what, why would you be asking to undo the right to shelter, which guarantees you at least a system to place people somewhere other than the street? Um, and, you know, if you prevail, then, you know, you're going to have the same number of people, but now they're going to be in the parks and on the trains and um, in, in terrible situations uh, and being uh, injured or dying because of uh, the weather. And there's no clear answer to that. Yeah. No. <laughs> just because it's related, right, I just wanted to know if you guys believe that there's a relationship between the current state of hotels as shelters now and the history of New York City with SROs, like if you believe they've played some type of precedent um, into how hotels are being transformed now, um, even though they're somewhat of a failed um, system in New York City, it's a unique feature, I think, of the city. So, I mean, I'll say just historically that the reason that there are so many people in hotels is that we do have a right to shelter and the city uh, could not, did not create enough um, purpose-built places that were um, going to serve people in better ways. And one reason for that is just a political will and a lack of interest in doing it. But also, uh, every time they try to open a shelter now, there is a NIMBY response in whatever community they try to do that. And a group forms and files a bogus lawsuit. And um, in the end, the city wins all those cases, but it definitely takes a toll. It slows them down. It takes them years to build a new site from the ground up that, that is a, a, a purpose-built shelter. I mean, obviously, it would be better if they were building housing in that way and, and putting people in permanent housing, but they also have to have some safety net. Um, and uh, the NIMBY efforts are not limited to litigation. They will go and intimidate you know, whoever it was that was going to provide that space to the city um, and get them to back out of the deal, or they will call the mayor. And the mayor has, um, they had a couple of sites that were ready to go, and elected officials in those communities called the mayor and he said, okay, we won't open that shelter. So um, they've, they've certainly, uh, uh, a number of factors have put them in this place where, you know, at the end of the day when they have to have beds and they're running out of space, there's only one 
real solution for them, which is to rent more hotel rooms. Um, that's the only way they can immediately get enough units to actually physically house people as they're coming in if they're not going to devote enough resources to moving people out, right? This is part of the problem. If they would move people out of the shelter system and into permanent housing, then they would have a lot more units. They would have all the spaces that continue to warehouse people because they don't uh, successfully move people out of shelter and into permanent housing. If we didn't have 50,000 people who, you know, were already in shelter when this started, you know, those people could all be in permanent housing. You would have 50,000 new shelter units and you would have zero, uh, uh, you know, homelessness among people who uh, were already here before the new arrivals start to come. Uh, okay. Um, I have a question about, I guess, the 50,000 people who are in some other form of housing. I think you introduced 70,000 people in shelter, right, but 120,000 migrants. So could anyone sort of speak to what is the housing situation of those other 50,000? No doubt precarious also. Um, but yeah, and are people moving out of shelters into equally precarious, maybe even worse situations in the private market or 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 better situations, yeah, what's that other 50,000 look like? Okay, let me just clarify the numbers because it sounds like I said something wrong. Um, so there were, there are, the shelter system before new arrivals started to come a year and a half ago had about 50,000 people in it. Those people were all in New York City shelters. Um, and that's roughly where we are today with people who, you know, did not, do not meet this definition of came here on or after March 15th, 2022. Um, people who may have lived here their whole life and got evicted or whatever. Um, those 50,000 people are in New York City Department of Homeless Services shelters. There are a couple other agencies that operate shelter systems, but let's say it's about 50,000 people. Those people could all move tomorrow um, into permanent housing um, if we were running the system properly, if we were creating enough supply of affordable permanent housing and providing them with the tools to move in. Now, they do move... Uh, a lot of people out of shelter and into permanent housing every year. So it's not like it, it, we're, we, are, we are past the point where the, you know, the number is sort of flat. It remains flat. We would have preferred that they drove the, the number down. But um, what happened was, as I mentioned before, in the Bloomberg administration, they cut off access to permanent housing. The number of people grew to 50,000. And then de Blasio restored those tools. And so it stayed at 50,000. But they didn't want to invest extra and drive it back down. So we, we stay at around 50,000. Then there are 70,000 new arrival uh, individuals who are currently being sheltered by the city of New York in this wide range of different settings um, that range from bad to horrible um, uh, for the most part. Um, and, uh, uh, but in terms of people moving out, you know, we continue to push for um, uh, better programs both to keep people in their homes so they don't have to come into the shelter system in the first place, or if they have ended up in the shelter system, let's move them out. And they, um, you know, there is a wide range of programs that is available to, that the city has. They have a lot of tools for this. They could be using those tools better. They could be improving them. We've give, provided um, very detailed recommendations on how they might do that. But the goal is to get people into permanent housing. Now, to answer the question of what is the housing supply in New York, I mean, that's a, that's a bigger question, um, but um, and maybe I'm not the best person to answer that. Um, but um, you know, if there if the tools were there to move people out, more people would be moving out. The number of the shelter census of people who you know are we need a new term for this: people who are not new arrivals, right? Longer term New Yorkers could be driven down significantly if those programs work better. And we think there are a lot of ways to make them work better. Of housing? Um, was there a shortage of um, shelters prior to, to the recent arrivals coming in? Because when I was doing, I was doing a lot of reporting on people who were losing their homes to fires and flooding, they were already being housed in, in hotels. And it seemed like that was kind of like the beginning of what we were, how the city was going to end up depending on the hotels. Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to address that. Again, like they could prevent people from having to come into shelter in the first place and move people out who are in shelter, or they could keep adding space. So uh, that's the equation they have to manage. It seems to us the best solution is to invest in getting people into real permanent housing and need fewer shelter units. But um, at the end of the day, it's their obligation to provide the shelter. So if they don't do that, then they just have to keep kind of expanding the system and, and being stuck with these hotels.
thank you to all our panelists for spending their time here and having such a wonderful conversation about this topic. I would like to pass over to Hippa to give closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, panelists. Thank you.